Section 18 of The First Voyage of James Cook, Volume 1 by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 1, Chapter 17, Part 1. A particular description of the island, its produce and inhabitants, their dress, habitations, food, domestic life, and amusements. We found the longitude of Port Royal Bay in this island, as settled by Captain Wallace, who discovered it on the 9th of June, 1767, to be within half a degree of the truth. We found Point Venus, the northern extremity of the island, and the eastern point of the bay, to lie in the longitude of 149 degrees 13 minutes, this being the mean result of a great number of observations made upon the spot. The island is surrounded by a reef of coral rock, which forms several excellent bays and harbours, some of which have been particularly described, where there is room and depth of water for any number of the largest ships. Port Royal Bay, called by the natives Matavai, which is not inferior to any in Otaheite, may easily be known by a very high mountain in the middle of the island, which bears due south from Point Venus. To sail into it, either keep the west point of the reef that lies before Point Venus close on board, or give it a berth of near half a mile in order to avoid a small shoal of coral rocks, on which there is but two fathom and a half of water. The best anchoring is on the eastern side of the bay, where there is sixteen and fourteen fathom upon an oozy bottom. The shore of the bay is a fine sandy beach, behind which runs a river of fresh water, so that any number of ships may water here without incommoding each other. But the only wood for firing upon the whole island is that of fruit trees, which must be purchased of the natives, or all hope of living upon good terms with them given up. There are some harbours to the westward of this bay, which have not been mentioned, but as they are contiguous to it and laid down in the plan, a description of them is unnecessary. The face of the country, except that part of it which borders upon the sea, is very uneven. It rises in ridges that run up into the middle of the island, and therefore mountains, which may be seen at the distance of sixty miles. Between the foot of these ridges and the sea is a border of low land surrounding the whole island except in a few places where the ridges rise directly from the sea. The border of lowland is in different parts of different breadths, but nowhere more than a mile and a half. The soil, except upon the very tops of the ridges, is extremely rich and fertile, watered by a great number of rivulets of excellent water, and covered with fruit trees of various kinds some of which are of a stately growth and thick foliage, so as to form one continued wood. And even the tops of the ridges, though in general they are bare and burnt up by the sun, are, in some parts, not without their produce. The low land that lies between the foot of the ridges and the sea, and some of the valleys, are the only parts of the island that are inhabited and here it is populous. The houses do not form villages or towns, but are ranged along the whole border at the distance of about fifty yards from each other, with little plantations of plantains, the tree which furnishes them with cloth. The whole island, according to Tapia's account, who certainly knew, could furnish 6,780 fighting men, from which the number of inhabitants may easily be computed. The produce of this island is breadfruit, coconuts, bananas of thirteen sorts, the best we had ever eaten, plantains, 
a fruit not unlike an apple, which, when ripe, is very pleasant, sweet potatoes, yams, cocos, a kind of arum, a fruit known here by the name of jambu, and reckoned most delicious, sugar cane, which the inhabitants eat raw, a root of the salop kind, called by the inhabitants pea, a plant called ethi, of which the root only is eaten, a fruit that grows in a pod like that of a large kidney bean, which, when it is roasted, eats very much like a chestnut, by the natives called ahi, a tree called wara, called in the East Indies pandanes, which produces fruit, something like the pineapple, a shrub called no-no, the morinda, which also produces fruit, a species of fern of which the root is eaten, and sometimes the leaves, and a plant called theve, of which the root also is eaten. But the fruits of the no-no, the fern, and the theve are eaten only by the inferior people, and in times of scarcity. All these which serve the inhabitants for food, the earth produces spontaneously, or with so little culture, that they seem to be exempted from the first general curse that man should eat his bread in the sweat of his brow. They have also the Chinese paper mulberry, Morus papyrifera, which they call Ayuta, a tree resembling the wild fig tree of the West Indies, another species of fig which they call mate, the Cordia sebestina orientalis, which they call etu, a kind of cyperus grass, which they call mu, a species of tunifortia, which they call tahe inu, another of the convolvulus polluque, which they call ure, the solanum kentifolium, which they call ebua, the calophyllum morphyllum, which they call tamanu, the hibiscus telaceus, called poeru, a frutescent nettle, the urtica argentia, called eroa, with many other plants which cannot here be particularly mentioned. Those that have been named already will be referred to in the subsequent part of this work. They have no European fruit, garden stuff, pulse, or legumes, nor grain of any kind. Of tame animals they have only hogs, dogs, and poultry. Neither is there a wild animal in the island, except ducks, pigeons, parakeets, with a few other birds and rats, there being no other quadruped nor any serpent. But the sea supplies them with great variety of most excellent fish, to eat which is their chief luxury, and to catch it their principal labour. As to the people, they are of the largest size of Europeans. The men are tall, strong, well-limbed, and finely shaped. The tallest that we saw was a man upon a neighbouring island called Huahene, who measured six feet three inches and a half. The women of the superior rank are also in general above our middle stature, but those of the inferior class are rather below it, and some of them are very small. This defect in size probably proceeds from their early commerce with men, the only thing in which they differ from their superiors that could possibly affect their growth. Their natural complexion is that kind of clear olive or brunette, which many people in Europe prefer to the finest white and red. In those that are exposed to the wind and sun, it is considerably deepened, but in others that live under shelter, especially the superior class of women, it continues of its native hue, and the skin is most delicately smooth and soft. They have no tint in their cheeks, which we distinguish by the name of colour. The shape of the face is comely, the cheekbones are not high, neither are the eyes hollow, 
nor the brow prominent. The only feature that does not correspond with our ideas of beauty is the nose, which, in general, is somewhat flat. But their eyes, especially those of the women, are full of expression, sometimes sparkling with fire, and sometimes melting with softness. Their teeth also are, almost without exception, most beautifully even and white, and their breath perfectly without taint. The hair is almost universally black and rather coarse. The men have beards, which they wear in many fashions, always, however, plucking out great part of them and keeping the rest perfectly clean and neat. Both sexes also eradicate every hair from under their arms and accused us of great uncleanliness for not doing the same. In their motions there is at once vigour and ease. Their walk is graceful, their deportment liberal, and their behaviour to strangers and to each other affable and courteous. In their dispositions also they seem to be brave, open and candid, without either suspicion or treachery, cruelty or revenge, so that we place the same confidence in them as in our best friends, many of us, particularly Mr. Banks, sleeping frequently in their houses in the woods, without a companion, and consequently wholly in their power. They were, however, all thieves, and when that is allowed, they need not much fear a competition with the people of any other nation upon earth. During our stay in this island, we saw about five or six persons, like one that was met by Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander on the 24th of April, in their walk to the eastward, whose skins were of a dead white, like the nose of a white horse, with white hair, beard, brows, and eyelashes, red, tender eyes, a short sight, and scurfy skins, covered with a kind of white down. But we found that no two of these belonged to the same family, and therefore concluded that they were not a species, but unhappy individuals rendered anomalous by disease. It is a custom in most countries where the inhabitants have long hair for the men to cut it short and the women to pride themselves in its length. Here, however, the contrary custom prevails. The women always cut it short round their ears and the men, except the fishers, who are almost continually in the water, suffer it to flow in large waves over their shoulders or tie it up in a bunch on the top of their heads. They have a custom also of anointing their heads with what they call monoe, an oil expressed from the coconut, in which some sweet herbs or flowers have been infused. As the oil is generally rancid, the smell is at first very disagreeable to a European, and as they live in a hot country, and have no such thing as a comb, they are not able to keep their heads free from lice, which the children and common people sometimes pick out and eat. A hateful custom, wholly different from their manners in every other particular, for they are delicate and cleanly, almost without example, and those to whom we distributed combs, soon delivered themselves from vermin, with a diligence that showed that they were not more odious to us than to them. They have a custom of staining their bodies nearly in the same manner as is practised in many other parts of the world, which they call tattooing. They prick the skin so as just not to fetch blood with a small instrument, something in the form of a hoe, that part which answers to the blade is made of a bone or shell, scraped very thin, and is from a quarter of an inch to an inch and a half wide. The edge is cut into sharp teeth or points, from the number of three to twenty according to its size. When this is to be used, 
they dipped the teeth into a mixture of a kind of lamp black formed of the smoke that rises from an oily nut which they burn instead of candles and water the teeth thus prepared are placed upon the skin and the handle to which they are fastened being struck by quick smart blows with a stick fitted to the purpose they pierce it and at the same time carry into the puncture the black composition which leaves an indelible stain the operation is painful and it is some days before the wounds are healed it is performed upon the youth of both sexes when they are about twelve or fourteen years of age on several parts of the body and in various figures according to the fancy of the parent or perhaps the rank of the party the women are generally marked with this stain in the form of a z on every joint of their fingers and toes and frequently round the outside of their feet the men are also marked with the same figure and both men and women have squares circles crescents and ill-designed representations of men birds or dogs and various other devices impressed upon their legs and arms some of which we were told had significations though we could never learn what they were but the part on which these ornaments are lavished with the greatest profusion is the breech this in both sexes is covered with a deep black above which arches are drawn one over another as high as the short ribs they are often a quarter of an inch broad and the edges are not straight lines but indented these arches are their pride and are shown both by men and women with a mixture of ostentation and pleasure whether as an ornament or a proof of their fortitude and resolution in bearing pain we could not determine the face in general is left unmarked for we saw but one instance to the contrary some old men had the greatest part of their bodies covered with large patches of black deeply indented at the edges like a rude imitation of flame but we were told that they came from a low island called nu ora and were not natives of otaheite mr banks saw the operation of tattooing performed upon the backside of a girl about thirteen years old the instrument used upon this occasion had thirty teeth and every stroke of which at least a hundred were made in a minute drew an ico or serum a little tinged with blood the girl bore it with most stoical resolution for about a quarter of an hour but the pain of so many hundred punctures as she had received in that time then became intolerable she first complained in murmurs then wept and at last burst into loud lamentations earnestly imploring the operator to desist he was however inexorable and when she began to struggle she was held down by two women who sometimes soothed and sometimes chid her and now and then when she was most unruly gave her a smart blow mr banks stayed in a neighbouring house an hour and the operation was not over when he went away yet it was performed but upon one side the other having been done some time before and the arches upon the loins in which they most pride themselves and which give more pain than all the rest were still to be done it is strange that these people should value themselves upon what is no distinction for i never saw a native of this island either man or woman in a state of maturity in whom these marks were wanting possibly they may have their rise in superstition especially as they produce no visible advantage and are not made without great pain but though we inquired of many hundreds we could never get any account of the matter their clothing consists of cloth or matting of different kinds which will be described among their other manufactures 
the cloth which will not bear wetting they wear in dry weather and the matting when it rains they are put on in many different ways just as their fancy leads them for in their garments nothing is cut into shape nor are any two pieces sewn together the dress of the better sort of women consists of three or four pieces one piece about two yards wide and eleven yards long they wrap several times round their waist so as to hang down like a petticoat as low as the middle of the leg and this they call paru two or three other pieces about two yards and a half long and one wide each having a hole cut in the middle they place one upon another and then putting their head through the holes they bring the lung ends down before and behind the others remain open at the sides and give liberty to the arms this which they call the tabuta is gathered round the waist and confined with a girdle or sash of thinner cloth which is long enough to go many times round them and exactly resembles the garment worn by the inhabitants of peru and chile which the spaniards call poncho the dress of the men is the same except that instead of suffering the cloth that is wound about the hips to hang down like a petticoat they bring it between their legs so as to have some resemblance to breeches and it is then called marrow this is the dress of all ranks of people and being universally the same as to form the gentlemen and ladies distinguish themselves from the lower people by the quantity some of them will wrap round them several pieces of cloth eight or ten yards long and two or three broad and some throw a large piece loosely over their shoulders in the manner of a cloak or perhaps two pieces if they are very great personages and are desirous to appear in state the inferior sort who have only a small allowance of cloth from the tribes or families to which they belong are obliged to be more thinly clad in the heat of the day they appear almost naked the women having only a scanty petticoat and the men nothing but the sash that is passed between their legs and fastened round the waist as finery is always troublesome and particularly in a hot country where it consists in putting one covering upon another the women of rank always uncover themselves as low as the waist in the evening throwing off all that they wear on the upper part of the body with the same negligence and ease as our ladies would lay by a cardinal or double handkerchief and the chiefs even when they visited us though they had as much cloth round their middle as would clothe a dozen people had frequently the rest of the body quite naked upon their legs and feet they wear no covering but they shade their faces from the sun with little bonnets either of matting or of coconut leaves which they make occasionally in a few minutes this however is not all their headdress the women sometimes wear little turbans and sometimes a dress which they value much more and which indeed is much more becoming called tomu the tomu consists of human hair plaited in threads scarcely thicker than sewing silk mr banks has pieces of it above a mile in length without a knot these they wind round the head in such a manner as produces a very pretty effect and in a very great quantity for i have seen five or six such pieces wound about the head of one woman among these threads they stick flowers of various kinds particularly the cape jessamine of which they have great plenty as it is always planted near their houses the men sometimes stick the tail feather of the tropic bird upright in their hair which as i have observed before is often tied in a bunch upon the top of their heads sometimes they wear a kind of whimsical garland 
made of flowers of various kinds, stuck into a piece of the rind of a plantain, or of scarlet peas stuck with gum upon a piece of wood, and sometimes they wear a kind of wig made of the hair of men or dogs, or perhaps of coconut strings woven upon one thread, which is tied under their hair, so that these artificial honours of their head may hang down behind. Their personal ornaments, beside flowers, are few. Both sexes wear earrings, but they are placed only upon one side. When we came, they consisted of small pieces of shell, stone, berries, red peas, or some small pearls, three in a string, but our beads very soon supplanted them all. The children go quite naked, the girls till they are three or four years old, and the boys till they are six or seven. The houses, or rather dwellings, of these people have been occasionally mentioned before. They are all built in the wood, between the sea and the mountains, and no more ground is cleared for each house than just sufficient to prevent the dropping of the branches from rotting the thatch with which they are covered. From the house, therefore, the inhabitant steps immediately under the shade, which is the most delightful that can be imagined. It consists of groves of breadfruit and coconuts, without underwood, which are intersected in all directions by the paths that lead from one house to the other. Nothing can be more grateful than this shade in so warm a climate, nor anything more beautiful than these walks. As there is no underwood, the shade cools without impeding the air, and the houses, having no walls, receive the gale from whatever point it blows. I shall now give a particular description of a house of a middling size from which, as the structure is universally the same, a perfect idea may be formed both of those that are bigger and those that are less. The ground which it covers is an oblong square, four and twenty feet long and eleven wide. Over this a roof is raised upon three rows of pillars or posts, parallel to each other, one on each side and the other in the middle. This roof consists of two flat sides inclining to each other and terminating in a ridge, exactly like the roofs of our thatched houses in England. The utmost height within is about nine feet, and the eaves on each side reach to within about three feet and a half of the ground. Below this and through the whole height, at each end it is open, no part of it being enclosed with a wall. The roof is thatched with palm leaves, and the floor is covered some inches deep with soft hay. Over this are laid mats, so that the whole is one cushion, upon which they sit in the day and sleep in the night. In some houses, however, there is one stool, which is wholly appropriated to the master of the family. Besides this, they have no furniture, except a few little blocks of wood, the upper side of which is hollowed into a curve, and which serves them for pillows. The house is indeed principally used as a dormitory. Four except it rains, they eat in the open air, under the shade of the next tree. The clothes that they wear in the day serve them for covering in the night. The floor is the common bed of the whole household, and is not divided by any partition. The master of the house and his wife sleep in the middle, next to them the married people, next to them the unmarried women, and next to them, at a little distance, the unmarried men. The servants, or tutus, as they are called, sleep in the open air, except it rains, and in that case they come just within the shade. There are, however, houses of another kind belonging to the chiefs, in which there is some degree of privacy. 
These are much smaller and so constructed as to be carried about in their canoes from place to place and set up occasionally like a tent. They are enclosed on the sides with coconut leaves, but not so close as to exclude the air, and the chief and his wife sleep in them alone. There are houses also of a much larger size, not built either for the accommodation of a single chief or a single family, but as common receptacles for all the people of a district. Some of them are 200 feet long, 30 broad, and, under the ridge, 20 feet high. These are built and maintained at the common expense of the district, for the accommodation of which they are intended, and have on one side of them a large area enclosed with low palisados. These houses, like those of separate families, have no walls. Privacy, indeed, is little wanted among people who have not even the idea of indecency, and who gratify every appetite and passion before witnesses, with no more sense of impropriety than we feel when we satisfy our hunger at a social board with our family or friends. Those who have no idea of indecency with respect to actions can have none with respect to words. It is, therefore, scarcely necessary to observe that in the conversation of these people, that which is the principal source of their pleasure is always the principal topic, and that everything is mentioned without any restraint or emotion, and in the most direct terms, by both sexes. End of section 18「Section 19 of the First Voyage of James Cook, Volume 1, by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 1, Chapter 17, Part 2. A Particular Description of the Island, Its Produce and Inhabitants, Their Dress, Habitations, food, domestic life, and amusements, continued. Of the food eaten here, the greater part is vegetable. Here are no tame animals except hogs, dogs, and poultry, as I have observed before, and these are by no means plenty. When a chief kills a hog, it is almost equally divided among his dependents, and, as they are very numerous, the share of each individual at these feasts, which are not frequent, must necessarily be small. Dogs and fowls fall somewhat more frequently to the share of the common people. I cannot much commend the flavour of their fowls, but we all agreed that a South Sea dog was little inferior to an English lamb. Their excellence is probably owing to their being kept up and fed wholly upon vegetables. The sea affords them a great variety of fish. The smaller fish, when they catch any, are generally eaten raw as we eat oysters, and nothing that the sea produces comes amiss to them. They are fond of lobsters, crabs, and other shellfish, which are found upon the coast and they will eat not only sea insects, but what the seamen call blubbers, though some of them are so tough that they are obliged to suffer them to become putrid before they can be chewed. Of the many vegetables that have been mentioned already as serving them for food, the principal is the breadfruit, to procure which costs them no trouble or labour but climbing a tree. The tree which produces it does not indeed shoot up spontaneously, but if a man plants ten of them in his lifetime, which he may do in about an hour, 
he will as completely fulfill his duty to his own and future generations as the natives of our less temperate climate can do by ploughing in the cold of winter and reaping in the summer's heat as often as these seasons return even if after he has procured bread for his present household he should convert a surplus into money and lay it up for his children it is true indeed that the breadfruit is not always in season but coconuts bananas plantains and a great variety of other fruits supply the deficiency it may well be supposed that cookery is but little studied by these people as an art and indeed they have but two ways of applying fire to dress their food broiling and baking the operation of broiling is so simple that it requires no description and their baking has been described already page 154 in the account of an entertainment prepared for us by Tupia. Hogs and large fish are extremely well dressed in the same manner, and, in our opinion, were more juicy and more equally done than by any art of cookery now practised in Europe. Breadfruit is also cooked in an oven of the same kind, which renders it soft and something like a boiled potato, not quite so farinaceous as a good one, but more so than those of the middling sort. Of the breadfruit they also make three dishes, by putting either water or the milk of the coconut to it, then beating it to a paste with a stone pestle, and afterwards mixing it with ripe plantains, bananas or the sour paste, which they call mahi. The mahi, which has been mentioned as a succedaneum for ripe breadfruit before the season for gathering a fresh crop comes on, is thus made. The fruit is gathered just before it is perfectly ripe, and, being laid in heaps, is closely covered with leaves. In this state it undergoes a fermentation and becomes disagreeably sweet. The core is then taken out entire, which is done by gently pulling the stalk, and the rest of the fruit is thrown into a hole which is dug for that purpose, generally in the houses and neatly lined in the bottom and sides with grass. The whole is then covered with leaves and heavy stones laid upon them. In this state it undergoes a second fermentation and becomes sour, after which it will suffer no change for many months. It is taken out of the whole as it is wanted for use, and being made into balls, it is wrapped up in leaves and baked. After it is dressed, it will keep five or six weeks. It is eaten both cold and hot, and the natives seldom make a meal without it, though to us the taste was as disagreeable as that of a pickled olive generally is the first time it is eaten. As the making of this mahi depends, like brewing, upon fermentation, so, like brewing, it sometimes fails without their being able to ascertain the cause. It is very natural, therefore, that the making of it should be connected with superstitious notions and ceremonies. It generally falls to the lot of the old women, who will suffer no creature to touch anything belonging to it, but those whom they employ as assistants, nor even to go into that part of the house where the operation is carrying on. Mr. Banks happened to spoil a large quantity of it only by inadvertently touching a leaf which lay upon it. The old woman who then presided over these mysteries told him that the process would fail and immediately uncovered the whole in a fit of vexation and despair. Mr. Banks regretted the mischief he had done but was somewhat consoled by the opportunity which it gave him of examining the preparation, which, perhaps, but for such an accident, would never have offered. Such is their food, to which salt water is the universal source, no meal being eaten without it. 
those who live near the sea have it fetched as it is wanted. Those who live at some distance keep it in large bamboos, which are set up in their houses for use. Salt water, however, is not their only source. They make another of the kernels of coconuts, which being fermented till they dissolve into a paste somewhat resembling butter, are beaten up with salt water. The flavour of this is very strong and was, when we first tasted it, exceedingly nauseous. A little use, however, reconciled some of our people to it so much that they preferred it to our own sauces, especially with fish. The natives seem to consider it as a dainty and do not use it at their common meals, possibly because they think it ill management to use coconuts so lavishly, or, perhaps, when we were at the island, they were scarcely ripe enough for the purpose. For drink, they have in general nothing but water or the juice of the coconut. The art of producing liquors that intoxicate by fermentation being happily unknown among them. Neither have they any narcotic which they chew, as the natives of some other countries do opium, betel root, and tobacco. Some of them drank freely of our liquors, and in a few instances became very drunk. But the persons to whom this happened were so far from desiring to repeat the debauch that they would never touch any of our liquors afterwards. We were, however, informed that they became drunk by drinking a juice that is expressed from the leaves of a plant which they call Ava Ava. This plant was not in season when we were there, so that we saw no instances of its effect, and as they considered drunkenness as a disgrace, they probably would have concealed from us any instances which might have happened during our stay. This vice is almost peculiar to the chiefs and considerable persons who vie with each other in drinking the greatest number of draughts, each draught being about a pint. They keep this intoxicating juice with great care from their women. Table they have none, but their apparatus for eating is set out with great neatness, though the articles are too simple and too few to allow anything for show, and they commonly eat alone, but when a stranger happens to visit them, he sometimes makes a second in their mess. Of the meal of one of their principal people, I shall give a particular description. He sits down under the shade of the next tree, or on the shady side of his house, and a large quantity of leaves, either of the breadfruit or banana, are neatly spread before him upon the ground as a tablecloth. A basket is then set by him that contains his provision, which, if fish or flesh, is ready dressed and wrapped up in leaves, and two coconut shells, one full of salt water and the other of fresh. His attendants, which are not few, seat themselves round him, and when all is ready, he begins by washing his hands and his mouth thoroughly with the fresh water and this he repeats almost continually throughout the whole meal. He then takes part of his provision out of the basket, which generally consists of a small fish or two, two or three breadfruits, fourteen or fifteen ripe bananas, or six or seven apples. He first takes half a breadfruit, peels off the rind, and takes out the core with his nails. Of this he puts as much into his mouth as it can hold, and while he chews it, takes the fish out of the leaves, and breaks one of them into the salt water, placing the other, and what remains of the breadfruit, upon the leaves that have been spread before him. When this is done, he takes up a small piece of the fish that has been broken into the salt water, with all the fingers of one hand, and sucks it into his mouth, so as to get with it as much of the salt water as possible. In the same manner he takes the rest by different morsels, 
and between each, at least very frequently, takes a small sip of the salt water, either out of the coconut shell or the palm of his hand. In the meantime, one of his attendants has prepared a young coconut by peeling off the outer rind with his teeth, an operation which to a European appears very surprising. But it depends so much upon slight that many of us were able to do it before we left the island, and some that could scarcely crack a filbert. The master, when he chooses to drink, takes the coconut thus prepared and boring a hole through the shell with his finger, or breaking it with a stone, he sucks out the liquor. When he has eaten his breadfruit and fish, he begins with his plantains, one of which makes but a mouthful, though it be as big as a black pudding. If, instead of plantains, he has apples, he never tastes them till they have been pared. To do this, a shell is picked up from the ground, where they are always in plenty, and tossed to him by an attendant. He immediately begins to cut or scrape off the rind, but so awkwardly that great part of the fruit is wasted. If, instead of fish, he has flesh, he must have some succadanium for a knife to divide it, and for this purpose a piece of bamboo is tossed to him of which he makes the necessary implement by splitting it transversely with his nail. While all this has been doing, some of his attendants have been employed in beating breadfruit with a stone pestle upon a block of wood. By being beaten in this manner, and sprinkled from time to time with water, it is reduced to the consistence of a soft paste, and is then put into a vessel somewhat like a butcher's tray and either made up alone, or mixed with banana or mahi, according to the taste of the master, by pouring water upon it by degrees, and squeezing it often through the hand. Under this operation it acquires the consistence of a thick custard, and a large coconut shell full of it being set before him, he sips it as we should do a jelly, if we had no spoon to take it from the glass. The meal is then finished by again washing his hands and his mouth, after which the coconut shells are clean, and everything that is left is replaced in the basket. The quantity of food which these people eat at a meal is prodigious. I have seen one man devour two or three fishes as big as a perch, three breadfruits, each bigger than two fists, fourteen or fifteen plantains or bananas, each of them six or seven inches long, and four or five round, and near a quart of the pounded breadfruit, which is as substantial as the thickest unbaked custard. This is so extraordinary that I scarcely expect to be believed, and I would not have related it upon my own single testimony, but Mr. Banks, Dr. Zollander, and most of the other gentlemen have had ocular demonstration of its truth, and know that I mention them upon the occasion. It is very wonderful that these people, who are remarkably fond of society, and particularly that of their women, should exclude its pleasures from the table, where, among all other nations, whether civil or savage, they have been principally enjoyed. How a meal, which everywhere else brings families and friends together, came to separate them here, we often inquired but could never learn. They eat alone, they said, because it was right. But why it was right to eat alone, they never attempted to tell us. Such, however, was the force of habit, that they expressed the strongest dislike, and even disgust, of our eating in society especially with our women, and of the same victuals. At first we thought this strange singularity arose from some superstitious opinion, but they constantly affirmed the contrary. We observed also some caprices in the custom, for which we could as little account as for the custom itself. 
We could never prevail with any of the women to partake of the victuals at our table when we were dining in company. Yet they would go, five or six together, into the servants' apartments, and there eat very heartily of whatever they could find, of which I have before given a particular instance. Nor were they in the least disconcerted if we came in while they were doing it. When any of us have been alone with a woman, she has sometimes eaten in our company, but then she has expressed the greatest unwillingness that it should be known, and always extorted the strongest promises of secrecy. Among themselves, even two brothers and two sisters have each their separate baskets, with provision and the apparatus of their meal. When they first visited us at our tents, each brought his basket with him, and when we sat down to table, they would go out, sit down upon the ground, at two or three yards distance from each other, and turning their faces different ways, take their repast without interchanging a single word. The women not only abstain from eating with the men, and of the same victuals, but even have their victuals separately prepared by boys kept for that purpose, who deposit it in a separate shed, and attend them with it at their meals. But though they would not eat with us or with each other, they have often asked us to eat with them, when we have visited those with whom we were particularly acquainted at their houses, and we have often upon such occasions eaten out of the same basket and drunk out of the same cup. The elder women, however, always appeared to be offended at this liberty, and if we happened to touch their victuals, or even the basket that contained it, would throw it away. After meals and in the heat of the day, the middle-aged people of the better sort generally sleep. They are indeed extremely indolent, and sleeping and eating is almost all that they do. Those that are older are less drowsy, and the boys and girls are kept awake by the natural activity and sprightliness of their age. Their amusements have occasionally been mentioned in my account of the incidents that happened during our residence in this island, particularly music, dancing, wrestling, and shooting with the bow. They also sometimes vie with each other in throwing a lance. As shooting is not at a mark, but for distance, throwing the lance is not for distance, but at a mark. The weapon is about nine feet long, the mark is the bowl of a plantain, and the distance about twenty yards. Their only musical instruments are flutes and drums. The flutes are made of a hollow bamboo about a foot long, and, as has been observed before, have only two stops, and consequently but four notes out of which they seem hitherto to have formed but one tune. To these stops they apply the forefinger of the left hand and the middle finger of the right. The drum is made of a hollow block of wood, of a cylindrical form, solid at one end, and covered at the other with shark skin. These they beat not with sticks but their hands and they know how to tune two drums of different notes into concord. They have also an expedient to bring the flutes that play together into unison, which is to roll up a leaf so as to slip over the end of the shortest, like our sliding tubes for telescopes, which they move up and down till the purpose is answered, of which they seem to judge by their ear with great nicety. To these instruments they sing, and, as I have observed before, their songs are often extempore. They call every two verses or couplet a song, pehe. They are generally, though not always, in rhyme, and when pronounced by the natives, we could discover that they were meter. Mr. Banks took great pains to write down some of them, which were made upon our arrival as nearly as he could express their sounds by combinations of our letters. But when we read them, 
not having their accent, we could scarcely make them either meter or rhyme. The reader will easily perceive that they are of a very different structure. Tede pahai ne parowa ha maru numina e paha teo malama taya no tabane tanatu wanomi ya eturai etu terara pate wenua toai ino omeo pratane wenueai no tote of these verses our knowledge of the language is too imperfect to attempt a translation they frequently amuse themselves by singing such couplets as these when they are alone or with their families especially after it is dark for though they need no fires they are not without the comfort of artificial light between sunset and bedtime their candles are made of the kernels of a kind of oily nut which they stick one over another upon a skewer that is thrust through the middle of them the upper one being lighted burns down to the second at the same time consuming that part of the skewer which goes through it the second taking fire burns in the same manner down to the third and so of the rest some of these candles will burn a considerable time and they give a very tolerable light they do not often sit up above an hour after it is dark but when they have strangers who sleep in the house they generally keep a light burning all night possibly as a check upon such of the women as they wish not to honour them with their favours of their itinerary concerts i need add nothing to what has been said already especially as i shall have occasion more particularly to mention them when i relate our adventures upon another island in other countries the girls and unmarried women are supposed to be wholly ignorant of what others upon some occasions may appear to know and their conduct and conversation are consequently restrained within narrower bounds and kept at a more remote distance from whatever relates to a connection with the other sex but here it is just contrary among other diversions there is a dance called timorody which is performed by young girls whenever eight or ten of them can be collected together consisting of motions and gestures beyond imagination wanton in the practice of which they are brought up from their earliest childhood accompanied by words which if it were possible would more explicitly convey the same ideas in these dances they keep time with an exactness which is scarcely excelled by the best performers upon the stages of europe but the practice which is allowed to the virgin is prohibited to the woman from the moment that she has put these hopeful lessons in practice and realized the symbols of the dance it cannot be supposed that among these people chastity is held in much estimation it might be expected that sisters and daughters would be offered to strangers either as a courtesy or for reward and that breaches of conjugal fidelity even in the wife should not be otherwise punished than by a few hard words or perhaps a slight beating as indeed is the case but there is a scale in dissolute sensuality which these people have ascended wholly unknown to every other nation whose manners have been recorded from the beginning of the world to the present hour and which no imagination could possibly conceive a very considerable number of the principal people of otaheite of both sexes have formed themselves into a society in which every woman is common to every man thus securing a perpetual variety as often as their inclination prompts them to seek it which is so frequent that the same man and woman seldom cohabit together more than two or three days these societies are distinguished by the name of areoi 
and the members have meetings at which no other is present, where the men amuse themselves by wrestling, and the women, notwithstanding their occasional connection with different men, dance the timorodi in all its latitude as an incitement to desires which is said are frequently gratified upon the spot. This, however, is comparatively nothing. If any of the women happen to be with child, which in this manner of life happens less frequently than if they were to cohabit only with one man, the poor infant is smothered the moment it is born, that it may be no encumbrance to the father, nor interrupt the mother in the pleasures of her diabolical prostitution. It sometimes indeed happens that the passion which prompts a woman to enter into this society is surmounted when she becomes a mother by that instinctive affection which nature has given to all creatures for the preservation of their offspring. But even in this case, she is not permitted to spare the life of her infant except she can find a man who will patronize it as his child if this can be done the murder is prevented but both the man and woman being deemed by this act to have appropriated each other are ejected from the community and forfeit all claim to the privileges and pleasures of the arayoi for the future the woman from that time being distinguished by the term wan now now bearer of children which is here a term of reproach though none can be more honourable in the estimation of wisdom and humanity of right reason and every passion that distinguishes the man from the brute it is not fit that a practice so horrid and so strange should be imputed to human beings upon slight evidence but i have such as abundantly justifies me in the account i have given the people themselves are so far from concealing their connection with such a society as a disgrace that they boast of it as a privilege and both myself and mr banks when particular persons have been pointed out to us as members of the Areoi, have questioned them about it, and received the account that has been here given from their own lips. They have acknowledged that they have long been of this accursed society, that they belonged to it at that time, and that several of their children had been put to death but i must not conclude my account of the domestic life of these people without mentioning their personal cleanliness if that which lessens the good of life and increases the evil is vice surely cleanliness is a virtue the want of it tends to destroy both beauty and health and mingles disgust with our best pleasures the natives of otaheite both men and women constantly wash their whole bodies in running water three times every day once as soon as they rise in the morning once at noon and again before they sleep at night whether the sea or river is near them or at a distance i have already observed that they wash not only the mouth but the hands at their meals almost between every morsel and their clothes as well as their persons are kept without spot or stain so that in a large company of these people nothing is suffered but heat which perhaps is more than can be said of the politest assembly in europe end of section nineteen Section 20 of The First Voyage of James Cook, Volume 1 by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 1, Chapter 18 of The Manufactures, Boats, and Navigation of Otaheite. If necessity is the mother of invention, it cannot be supposed to have been much exerted where the liberality of nature has rendered the diligence of art almost superfluous. 
Yet there are many instances both of ingenuity and labour among these people, which, considering the want of metal for tools, do honour to both. Their principal manufacture is their cloth, in the making and dyeing of which I think there are some particulars which may instruct even the artificers of Great Britain, and for that reason my description will be more minute. Their cloth is of three kinds, and is made of the bark of three different trees, the Chinese paper mulberry, the breadfruit tree, and the tree which resembles the wild fig tree of the West Indies. The finest and whitest is made of the paper mulberry, Ayuta. This is worn chiefly by the principal people, and when it is dyed red takes a better colour. A second sort, inferior in whiteness and softness, is made of the breadfruit tree, Uru, and worn chiefly by the inferior people. And a third of the tree that resembles the fig, which is coarse and harsh, and of the colour of the darkest brown paper. This, though it is less pleasing both to the eye and the touch, is the most valuable, because it resists water which the other two sorts will not. Of this, which is the most rare as well as the most useful, the greater part is perfumed and worn by the chiefs as a mourning dress. All these trees are propagated with great care, particularly the mulberry, which covers the largest part of the cultivated land and is not fit for use after two or three years' growth when it is about six or eight feet high, and somewhat thicker than a man's thumb. Its excellence is to be thin, straight, tall, and without branches. The lower leaves, therefore, are carefully plucked off, with their germs, as often as there is any appearance of their producing a branch. But though the cloth made of these three trees is different, it is all manufactured in the same manner. I shall, therefore, describe the process only in the fine sort that is made of the mulberry. When the trees are of a proper size, they are drawn up and stripped of their branches, after which the roots and tops are cut off, the bark of these rods being then slit up longitudinally is easily drawn off, and, when a proper quantity has been procured, it is carried down to some running water, in which it is deposited to soak, and secured from floating away by heavy stones. When it is supposed to be sufficiently softened, the women servants go down to the brook, and, stripping themselves, sit down in the water, to separate the inner bark from the green part on the outside. To do this they place the underside upon a flat, smooth board, and with the shell, which our dealers call tiger's tongue, Talina gargadia, scrape it very carefully, dipping it continually in the water, till nothing remains but the fine fibres of the inner coat. Being thus prepared in the afternoon, they are spread out upon plantain leaves in the evening, and in this part of the work there appears to be some difficulty as the mistress of the family always superintends the doing of it. They are placed in lengths of about eleven or twelve yards, one by the side of another, till they are about a foot broad, and two or three layers are also laid one upon the other. Care is taken that the cloth shall be in all parts of an equal thickness, so that if the bark happens to be thinner in any particular part of one layer than the rest, a piece that is somewhat thicker is picked out to be laid over it in the next. In this state it remains till the morning, when great part of the water which it contained when it was laid out is either drained off or evaporated, and the several fibres adhere together, so as that the whole may be raised from the ground in one piece. It is then taken away and laid upon the smooth side of a long piece of wood, prepared for the purpose, and beaten by the women servants, 
with instruments about a foot long and three inches thick, made of a hard wood which they call a toa. The shape of this instrument is not unlike a square razor strop, only that the handle is longer, and each of its four sides or faces is marked lengthways with small grooves, or furrows of different degrees of fineness those on one side being of a width and depth sufficient to receive a small pack thread and the others finer in a regular gradation so that the last are not more than equal to sewing silk they beat it first with the coarsest side of this mallet keeping time like our smiths it spreads very fast under the strokes chiefly however in the breadth and the grooves in the mallet mark it with the appearance of threads. It is successively beaten with the other sides, last with the finest, and is then fit for use. Sometimes, however, it is made still thinner by beating it with the finest side of the mallet after it has been several times doubled. It is then called hobu and is almost as thin as a muslin. It becomes very white by being bleached in the air, but is made still whiter and softer by being washed and beaten again after it has been worn. Of this cloth there are several sorts, of different degrees of fineness, in proportion as it is more or less beaten without being doubled. The other cloth also differs in proportion as it is beaten, but they differ from each other in consequence of the different materials of which they are made. The bark of the breadfruit is not taken till the trees are considerably longer and thicker than those of the fig. The process afterwards is the same. When cloth is to be washed after it has been worn, it is taken down to the brook and left to soak, being kept fast to the bottom as at first by a stone. It is then gently wrung or squeezed, and sometimes several pieces of it are laid one upon another and beaten together with the coarsest side of the mallet, and they are then equal in thickness to broad cloth and much more soft and agreeable to the touch after they have been a little while in use, though when they come immediately from the mallet, they feel as if they had been starched. This cloth sometimes breaks in the beating, but is easily repaired by pasting on a patch with a gluten that is prepared from the root of the pea, which is done so nicely that it cannot be discovered. The women also employ themselves in removing blemishes of every kind, as our ladies do in needlework or knotting. Sometimes when their work is intended to be very fine, they will paste an entire covering of hobu over the whole. The principal excellences of this cloth are its coolness and softness, and its imperfections, its being pervious to water like paper and almost as easily torn. The colours with which they dye this cloth are principally red and yellow. The red is exceedingly beautiful, and I may venture to say a brighter and more delicate colour than any we have in Europe. That which approaches nearest is our full scarlet, and the best imitation which Mr. Banks's natural history painter could produce was by a mixture of vermilion and carbon. The yellow is also a bright colour, but we have many as good. The red colour is produced by the mixture of the juices of two vegetables, neither of which separately has the least tendency to that hue. One is a species of fig called here mate, and the other the cordia sebestina, or etu. Of the fig the fruit is used, and of the cordia the leaves. The fruit of the fig is about as big as a runceval pea, or very small gooseberry, and each of them, upon breaking off the stalk very close, produces one drop of a milky liquor resembling the juice of our figs, 
of which the tree is indeed a species. This liquor the women collect into a small quantity of coconut water. To prepare a gill of coconut water will require between three and four quarts of these little figs. When a sufficient quantity is prepared, the leaves of the etu are well wetted in it and then laid upon a plantain leaf where they are turned about till they become more and more flaccid and then they are gently squeezed, gradually increasing the pressure, but so as not to break them. As the flaccidity increases and they become spongy, they are supplied with more of the liquor. In about five minutes, the colour begins to appear upon the veins of the leaves, and in about ten or a little more, they are perfectly saturated with it. They are then squeezed, with as much force as can be applied, and the liquor strained at the same time that it is expressed. For this purpose, the boys prepare a large quantity of the moo by drawing it between their teeth or two little sticks, till it is freed from the green bark and the branny substance that lies under it, and a thin web of the fibres only remains. In this the leaves of the etu are enveloped, and through these the juice which they contain is strained as it is forced out. As the leaves are not succulent, little more juice is pressed out of them than they have imbibed. When they have been once emptied, they are filled again and again pressed, till the quality which tinctures the liquor as it passes through them is exhausted. They are then thrown away, but the moo, being deeply stained with the colour, is preserved as a brush to lay the dye upon the cloth. The expressed liquor is always received into small cups made of the plantain leaf, whether from a notion that it has any quality favourable to the colour, or from the facility with which it is procured, and the convenience of small vessels to distribute it among the artificers, I do not know. Of the thin cloth they seldom dye more than the edges, but the thick cloth is coloured through the whole surface. The liquor is indeed used rather as a pigment than a dye, for a coat of it is laid upon one side only with the fibres of the moo. And though I have seen of the thin cloth that has appeared to have been soaked in the liquor, the colour has not had the same richness and lustre as when it has been applied in the other manner. Though the leaf of the etu is generally used in this process, and probably produces the finest colour, yet the juice of the figs will produce a red by a mixture with a species of tunifortia, which they call tahainu, the pohawk, the ura or convolvulus brasiliensis, and a species of solanum called ebua. From the use of these different plants, or from different proportions of the materials, many varieties are observable in the colours of their cloth, some of which are conspicuously superior to others. The beauty, however, of the best is not permanent but it is probable that some method might be found to fix it, if proper experiments were made, and perhaps to search for latent qualities, which may be brought out by a mixture of one vegetable juice with another, would not be an unprofitable employment. Our present most valuable dyes afford sufficient encouragement to the attempt, for by the mere inspection of indigo, woad, dyer's weed, and most of the leaves which are used for the like purposes, the colours which they yield could never be discovered. Of this Indian red I shall only add that the women who have been employed in preparing or using it carefully preserve the colour upon their fingers and nails, where it appears in its utmost beauty as a great ornament. The yellow is made of the bark of the root of the Morinda chytrifolia, called no-no, by scraping and infusing it in water. After standing some time, the water is strained and used as a dye, 
the cloth being dipped into it. The Morinda, of which this is a species, seems to be a good subject for examination with a view to dyeing. Brown, in his History of Jamaica, mentions three species of it, which he says are used to dye brown, and Rumphius says of the Bancuda augustifolia, which is nearly allied to our nono, that it is used by the inhabitants of the East Indian islands as a fixing drug for red colours, with which it particularly agrees. The inhabitants of this island also dye yellow with the fruit of the tamanu, but how the colour is extracted we had no opportunity to discover. They have also a preparation with which they dye brown and black, but these colours are so indifferent that the method of preparing them did not excite our curiosity. Another considerable manufacture is matting of various kinds, some of which is finer and better in every respect than any we have in Europe. The coarser sort serves them to sleep upon and the finer to wear in wet weather. With the fine of which there are also two sorts, much pains is taken, especially with that made of the bark of the poeru, the hibiscus tilicaeus of Linnaeus, some of which is as fine as a coarse cloth. The other sort, which is still more beautiful, they call vane. It is white, glossy, and shining, and is made of the leaves of their waru, a species of the pandanus, of which we had no opportunity to see either the flowers or fruit. They have other mats, or as they call them, moias, to sit or to sleep upon, which are formed of a great variety of rushes and grass, and which they make, as they do everything else that is plaited, with amazing facility and dispatch. They are also very dexterous in making basket and wicker work. Their baskets are of a thousand different patterns, many of them exceedingly neat, and the making them is an art that every one practices, both men and women. They make occasional baskets and panniers of the coconut leaf in a few minutes, and the women who visited us early in a morning used to send, as soon as the sun was high, for a few of the leaves, of which they made little bonnets to shade their faces, at so small an expense of time and trouble that, when the sun was again low in the evening, they used to throw them away. These bonnets, however, did not cover the head, but consisted only of a band that went round it, and a shade that projected from the forehead. Of the bark of the poeru, they make ropes and lines, from the thickness of an inch to the size of a small pack thread. With these they make nets for fishing, of the fibres of the coconut they make thread for fastening together the several parts of their canoes and belts, either round or flat, twisted or plaited. And of the bark of the aroa, a kind of nettle which grows in the mountains and is therefore rather scarce, they make the best fishing lines in the world. With these they hold the strongest and most active fish such as bonitas and albicores, which would snap our strongest silk lines in a minute, though they are twice as thick. They also make a kind of sen of a coarse broad grass, the blades of which are like flags. These they twist and tie together in a loose manner, till the net, which is about as wide as a large sack, is from sixty to eighty fathom long, this they haul in shoal smooth water, and its own weight keeps it so close to the ground that scarcely a single fish can escape. In every expedient, indeed, for taking fish, they are exceedingly ingenious. They make harpoons of cane and point them with hardwood, which in their hands strike fish more effectually than those which are headed with iron can do in ours setting aside the advantage of ours being fastened to a line, 
so that the fish is secured if the hook takes place, though it does not mortally wound him. Of fish hooks they have two sorts, admirably adapted in their construction as well to the purpose they are to answer as to the materials of which they are made. One of these, which they call witty witty, is used for towing. The shank is made of mother of pearl, the most glossy that can be got. The inside, which is naturally the brightest, is put behind. To these hooks a tuft of white dog's or hog's hair is fixed, so as somewhat to resemble the tail of a fish. These implements, therefore, are both hook and bait, and are used with a rod of bamboo and line of arowa. The fisher, to secure his success, watches the flight of the birds which constantly attend the bonitas when they swim in shoals, by which he directs his canoe, and when he has the advantage of these guides, he seldom returns without a prize. The other kind of hook is also made of mother of pearl or some other hard shell. They cannot make them bearded like our hooks, but to effect the same purpose, they make the point turn inwards. These are made of all sizes and used to catch various kinds of fish with great success. The manner of making them is very simple and every fisherman is his own artificer. The shell is first cut into square pieces by the edge of another shell and wrought into a form corresponding with the outline of the hook by pieces of coral, which are sufficiently rough to perform the office of a file. A hole is then bored in the middle, the drill being no other than the first stone they pick up that has a sharp corner. This they fix into the end of a piece of bamboo and turn it between the hands like a chocolate mill. When the shell is perforated and the hole sufficiently wide, a small file of coral is introduced, by the application of which the hook is in a short time completed, few costing the artificer more time than a quarter of an hour. Of their masonry, carving and architecture, the reader has already formed some idea from the account that has been given of the Marais, or repositories of the dead. The other most important article of building and carving is their boats, and perhaps to fabricate one of their principal vessels with their tools is as great a work as to build a British man of war with ours. They have an adze of stone, a chisel or gouge of bone, generally that of a man's arm between the wrist and elbow, a rasp of coral, and the skin of a stingray with coral sand as a file or polisher. This is a complete catalogue of their tools, and with these they build houses, construct canoes, hew stone, and fell, cleave, carve, and polish timber. The stone which makes the blade of their adzes is a kind of basalts of a blackish or grey colour, not very hard, but of considerable toughness. They are formed of different sizes. Some that are intended for felling weigh from six to eight pounds. Others that are used for carving not more than so many ounces but it is necessary to sharpen both almost every minute, for which purpose a stone and a coconut shell full of water are always at hand. Their greatest exploit, to which these tools are less equal than to any other, is felling a tree. This requires many hands and the constant labour of several days. When it is down, they split it, with the grain into planks from three to four inches thick, the whole length and breadth of the tree, many of which are eight feet in the girt and forty to the branches, and nearly of the same thickness throughout. The tree generally used is, in their language, called avi, the stem of which is tall and straight, 
though some of the smaller boats are made of the breadfruit tree, which is a light spongy wood and easily wrought. They smooth the plank very expeditiously and dexterously with their adzes, and can take off a thin coat from a whole plank without missing a stroke. As they have not the art of warping a plank, every part of the canoe, whether hollow or flat, is shaped by hand. The canoes or boats which are used by the inhabitants of this and the neighboring islands may be divided into two general classes, one of which they call Ivahas, the other Pahis. The Ivaha is used for short excursions to sea and is wall-sided and flat-bottomed. The Pahi for longer voyages and is bow-sided and sharp-bottomed. The Ivahas are all of the same figure, but of different sizes, and used for different purposes. Their length is from 72 feet to 10, but the breadth is by no means in proportion, for those of 10 feet are about a foot wide, and those of more than 70 are scarcely two. There is the fighting Ivaha, the fishing Ivaha, and the traveling Ivaha for some of these go from one island to another. The fighting Ivaha is by far the longest, and the head and stern are considerably raised above the body in a semicircular form, particularly the stern, which is sometimes 17 or 18 feet high, though the boat itself is scarcely three. These never go to sea single, but are fastened together, side by side, at the distance of about three feet, by strong poles of wood, which are laid across them and lashed to the gunwales. Upon these in the forepart, a stage or platform is raised, about ten or twelve feet long, and somewhat wider than the boats, which is supported by pillars about six feet high. Upon this stage stand the fighting men, whose missile weapons are slings and spears. For, among other singularities in the manners of these people, their bows and arrows are used only for diversion, as we throw quoits. Below these stages sit the rowers, who receive from them those that are wounded, and furnish fresh men to ascend in their room. Some of these have a platform of bamboos or other light wood, through their whole length, and considerably broader, by means of which they will carry a great number of men. But we saw only one fitted in this manner. The fishing Ivahas vary in length from about 40 feet to the smallest size, which is about 10. All that are of the length of 25 feet and upwards, of whatever sort, occasionally carry sail. The travelling Ivaha is always double, and furnished with a small neat house, about five or six feet broad, and six or seven feet long, which is fastened upon the forepart for the convenience of the principal people, who sit in them by day and sleep in them at night. The fishing Ivahas are sometimes joined together, and have a house on board, but this is not common. Those which are shorter than five and twenty feet seldom or never carry sail, and, though the stern rises about four or five feet, have a flat head and a board that projects forward about four feet. The pahi is also of different sizes, from sixty to thirty feet long, but like the ivaha, is very narrow. One that I measured was 51 feet long, and only one foot and a half wide at the top. In the widest part it was about three feet, and this is the general proportion. It does not, however, widen by a gradual swell, but the sides being straight and parallel, for a little way below the gunwale, it swells abruptly and draws to a ridge at the bottom, so that a transverse section of it has somewhat the appearance of the mark upon cards called a spade, 
the whole being much wider in proportion to its length. These, like the largest Ivahas, are used for fighting, but principally for long voyages. The fighting Pahi, which is the largest, is fitted with the stage or platform, which is proportionably larger than those of the Ivaha, as their form enables them to sustain a much greater weight. Those that are used for sailing are generally double, and the middle size are said to be the best sea boats. They are sometimes out a month together, going from island to island, and sometimes, as we were credibly informed, they are a fortnight or twenty days at sea, and could keep it longer if they had more stowage for provisions and conveniences to hold fresh water. When any of these boats carry sail single, they make use of a log of wood, which is fastened to the end of two poles that lie across the vessel and project from six to ten feet, according to the size of the vessel, beyond its side, somewhat like what is used by the flying proa of the Ladrone Islands, and called in the account of Lord Anson's voyage an outrigger. To this outrigger the shrouds are fastened, and it is essentially necessary in trimming the boat when it blows fresh. Some of them have one mast and some two. They are made of a single stick, and when the length of the canoe is thirty feet, that of the mast is somewhat less than five and twenty. It is fixed to a frame that is above the canoe, and receives a sail of matting about one-third longer than itself. The sail is pointed at the top, square at the bottom, and curved at the side, somewhat resembling what we call a shoulder of mutton sail, and used for boats belonging to men of war. It is placed in a frame of wood which surrounds it on every side, and has no contrivance either for reefing or furling, so that, if either should become necessary, it must be cut away, which, however, in these equal climates, can seldom happen. At the top of the mast are fastened ornaments of feathers, which are placed inclining obliquely forwards, the shape and position of which will be conceived at once from the figure in one of the cuts. The oars or paddles that are used with these boats have a long handle and a flat blade, not unlike a baker's peel. Of these, every person in the boat has one, except those that sit under the awning, and they push her forward with them at a good rate. These boats, however, admit so much water at the seams that one person at least is continually employed in throwing it out. The only thing in which they excel is landing and putting off from the shore in a surf. By their great length and high sterns they land dry, when our boats could scarcely land at all, and have the same advantages in putting off by the height of the head. The Ivaras are the only boats that are used by the inhabitants of Otaheite, but we saw several Pahis that came from other islands. Of one of these I shall give the exact dimensions from a careful admeasurement, and then particularly describe the manner in which they are built. Extreme length from stem to stern, not reckoning the bending up of either, 51 feet 0 inches. Breadth in the clear of the top forward, 1 foot 2 inches. Breadth in the midships, 1 foot 6 inches. Breadth aft, one foot three inches. In the bilge forward, two foot eight inches. In the midships, two feet eleven inches. Aft, two feet nine inches. Depth in the midships, three feet four inches. Height from the ground on which she stood, three feet six inches. Height of her head from the ground without the figure. 4 feet 4 inches, height of the figure, 11 inches, height of the stern from the ground, 8 feet 9 inches, 
height of the figure 2 feet 0 inches. To illustrate my description of the manner in which these vessels are built, it will be necessary to refer to the figure in which AA is the first seam, BB the second, and CC the third. The first stage, or keel, under AA is made of a tree hollowed out like a trough, for which the longest trees are chosen that can be got, so that there are never more than three in the whole length. The next stage, under BB, is formed of straight plank, about four feet long, 15 inches broad and 2 inches thick. The third stage under CC is, like the bottom, made of trunks hollowed into its bilging form. The last is also cut out of trunks, so that the moulding is of one piece with the upright. To form these parts separately, without saw, plane, chisel or any other iron tool, may well be thought no easy task but the great difficulty is to join them together. When all the parts are prepared, the keel is laid upon blocks, and the planks being supported by stanchions are sewed or clamped together with strong thongs of plaiting, which are passed several times through holes that are bored with a gouge or auger of bone that has been described already. And of the nicety with which this is done, may be inferred from their being sufficiently watertight for use without caulking. As the plaiting soon rots in the water, it is renewed at least once a year, in order to which the vessel is taken entirely to pieces. The head and stern are rude with respect to the design, but very neatly finished and polished to the highest degree. These pahis are kept with great care in a kind of house built on purpose for their reception. The houses are formed of poles set upright in the ground, the tops of which are drawn towards each other and fastened together with their strongest cord so as to form a kind of gothic arch, which is completely thatched quite to the ground, being open only at the ends. They are sometimes 50 or 60 paces long. As connected with the navigation of these people, I shall mention their wonderful sagacity in foretelling the weather, at least the quarter from which the wind shall blow at a future time. They have several ways of doing this, of which, however, I know but one. They say that the Milky Way is always curved laterally, but sometimes in one direction and sometimes in another, and that this curvature is the effect of its being already acted upon by the wind, and its hollow path therefore towards it, so that, if the same curvature continues a night, a corresponding wind certainly blows the next day. Of their rules I shall not pretend to judge, but I know that, by whatever means, they can predict the weather, at least the wind, with much greater certainty than we can. In their longer voyages, they steer by the sun in the day, and in the night by the stars, all of which they distinguish separately by names, and know in what part of the heavens they will appear in any of the months during which they are visible in their horizon. They also know the time of their annual appearing and disappearing with more precision than will easily be believed by a European astronomer. End of section 20section 21 of the first voyage of James Cook, volume 1 by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 1, Chapter 19, Part 1 Of the division of time in Otaheite, numeration, computation of distance, language, diseases, disposal of the dead, religion, war, weapons, and government.
with some general observations for the use of future navigators. We were not able to acquire a perfect idea of their method of dividing time, but observed that in speaking of it, either past or to come, they never used any term but malama, which signifies moon. Of these moons they count thirteen, and then begin again, which is a demonstration that they have a notion of the solar year. But how they compute their months, so that thirteen of them shall be commensurate with the year, we could not discover. For they say that each month has twenty-nine days, including one in which the moon is not visible. They have names for them separately, and have frequently told us the fruit that would be in season, and the weather that would prevail in each of them, and they have indeed a name for them collectively, though they use it only when they speak of the mysteries of their religion. Each day is subdivided into twelve parts, each of two hours, of which six belong to the day and six to the night. At these divisions they guess pretty nearly by the height of the sun while he is above the horizon, but there are few of them that can guess at them when he is below it by the stars. In numeration they proceed from one to ten, the number of fingers on both hands, and though they have for each number a different name, they generally take hold of their fingers one by one, shifting from one hand to the other till they come to the number they want to express. And in other instances we observed that, when they were conversing with each other, they joined signs to their words, which was so expressive that a stranger might easily apprehend their meaning. In counting from ten, they repeat the name of that number and add the word more. Ten and one more is eleven, ten and two more twelve, and so of the rest as we say one and twenty, two and twenty. When they come to ten and ten more, they have a new denomination, as we say a score, and by these scores they count till they get ten of them, when they have a denomination for two hundred. And we never could discover that they had any denomination to express a greater number. Neither, indeed, do they seem to want any, for ten of these amount to two thousand, a greater number than they can ever apply. In measuring distance they are much more deficient than in computing numbers, having but one term, which answers to fathom. When they speak of distances from place to place, they express it, like the Asiatics, by the time that is required to pass it. Their language is soft and melodious. It abounds with vowels, and we easily learn to pronounce it, but found it exceedingly difficult to teach them to pronounce a single word of ours, probably not only from its abounding in consonants, but from some peculiarity in its structure. For Spanish and Italian words, if ending in a vowel, they pronounced with great facility. Whether it is copious, we were not sufficiently acquainted with it to know, but it is certainly very imperfect, for it is almost totally without inflection, both of nouns and verbs. Few of the nouns have more than one case, and few of the verbs more than one tense. Yet we found no great difficulty in making ourselves mutually understood, however strange it may appear in speculation. They have, however, certain affixa, which, though but few in number, are very useful to them, and puzzled us extremely. One asks another, Hare here, where are you going? The other answers, Iva Hinera, to my wives upon which the first, repeating the answer interrogatively, to your wives, is answered, Ivahin eraira, yes, I am going to my wives. Here the suffixa ira and ira save several words to both parties. 
I have inserted a few of their words from which perhaps some idea may be formed of the language. Pupo, the head. Ahiwa, the nose. Ruaru, the hair. Autu, the mouth. Nihio, the teeth. Arero, the tongue. Mu-umi, the beard. Tiarabo, the throat. Tuamo, the shoulders. Tua, the back. O armor the breast, U the nipples, Obu the belly, Rima the arm, Vai while plantains, Oparima the hand, Manio the fingers, Miu the nails, Tuhi the buttocks, Huua the thighs, Avia the legs, Tapoa the feet, Bua, a hog. Moa, a fowl. Uri, a dog. Ura, ura, iron. Uru, breadfruit. Hiri, coconuts. Mia, bananas. Poa, beads. Poa, matawewe, pearl. Ahu, a garment. Avi, a fruit like apples. Ahi, another like chestnuts. Iwara, a house. Wenua, a high island. Motu, a low island. Toto, blood. Aiva, bone. Aeo, flesh. Me, fat. Tuia, lean. Huru, huru, hair. Erao, a tree. Ama, a branch. Tiala, a flower. Huero, fruit. Etumu, the stem. Ara, the root. Ihera, herbaceous plants. Uopa, a pigeon. Avinya, a parakeet. Aa, another species. Manu, a bird. Mora, a duck. Mato, a fish hook. Tura, a rope. Mo, a shark, mahi mahi, a dolphin, matera, a fishing rod, upia, a net, mahana, the sun, malama, the moon, wetu, a star, wetu ufe, a comet, erai, the sky, ita, a cloud, miti, good, ino, bad, ah, yes, ima, no, Pari, ugly. Parori, hungry. Pia, full. Timaha, heavy. Mama, light. Poto, short. Roa, tall. Ihena, sweet. Malamala, bitter. Wano, to go far. Hare, to go. Aria, to stay. Enoho, to remain. Roha, roha. To be tired, ma'a to eat, inu to drink, ete to understand, warido to steal, waride to be angry, teparahi to beat. Among people whose food is so simple and who in general are seldom drunk, it is scarcely necessary to say that there are but few diseases. We saw no critical disease during our stay upon the island, and but few instances of sickness, which were accidental fits of the colic. The natives, however, are afflicted with the erysipelas and cutaneous eruptions of the scaly kind, very nearly approaching to a leprosy. Those in whom this distemper was far advanced lived in a state of seclusion from all society, each in a small house built up on some unfrequented spot where they were supplied with provisions. But whether they had any hope of relief or languished out the remainder of their lives in solitude and despair, we could not learn. We observed also a few who had ulcers upon different parts of their bodies, some of which had a very virulent appearance. 
yet they seemed not much to be regarded by those who were afflicted with them for they were left entirely without application even to keep off the flies where intemperance produces no diseases there will be no physicians by profession yet where there is sufferance there will always be attempts to relieve and where the cause of the mischief and the remedy are alike unknown these will naturally be directed by superstition thus it happens that in this country and in all others which are not farther injured by luxury or improved by knowledge the management of the sick falls to the lot of the priest the method of cure that is practised by the priests of otaheite consists chiefly of prayers and ceremonies when he visits his patient he repeats certain sentences which appear to be set forms contrived for the occasion and at the same time plaits the leaves of the coconut into different figures very neatly some of these he fastens to the fingers and toes of the sick and often leaves behind him a few branches of the thespicia popolinea which they call imidho these ceremonies are repeated till the patient recovers or dies if he recovers they say the remedies cured him if he dies they say the disease was incurable in which perhaps they do not much differ from the custom of other countries if we had judged of their skill in surgery from the dreadful scars which he sometimes saw we should have supposed it to be much superior to the art not only of their physicians but of ours we saw one man whose face was almost entirely destroyed his nose including the bone was perfectly flat and one cheek and one eye were so beaten in that the hollow would almost receive a man's fist yet no ulcer remained and our companion tupia had been pierced quite through his body by a spear headed with the bone of a stingray the weapon having entered his back and come out just under his breast but except in reducing dislocations and fractures the best surgeon can contribute very little to the cure of a wound the blood itself is the best vulnerary balsam and when the juices of the body are pure and the patient is temperate nothing more is necessary as an aid to nature in the cure of the worst wound than the keeping it clean their commerce with the inhabitants of europe has however already entailed upon them that dreadful curse which avenged the inhumanities committed by the spaniards in america the venereal disease as it is certain that no european vessel besides our own except the dolphin and the two that were under the command of monsieur bougainville ever visited this island it must have been brought either by one of them or by us that it was not brought by the dolphin captain wallace has demonstrated in the account of her voyage volume one pages three twenty three and three twenty four and nothing is more certain than that when we arrived it had made most dreadful ravages in the island one of our people contracted it within five days after we went on shore and by the inquiries among the natives which this occasioned we learnt when we came to understand a little of their language that it had been brought by the vessels which had been there about fifteen months before us and had lain on the east side of the island they distinguished it by a name of the same import with rottenness but of a more extensive signification and described in the most pathetic terms the sufferings of the first victims to its rage and told us that it caused the hair and the nails to fall off and the flesh to rot from the bones that it spread a universal terror and consternation among them so that the sick were abandoned by their nearest relations lest the calamity should spread by contagion and left to perish alone in such misery as till then had never been known among them we had some reason however to hope that they had found out a specific to cure it 
during our stay upon the island we saw none in whom it had made a great progress and one who went from us infected returned after a short time in perfect health and by this it appeared either that the disease had cured itself or that they were not unacquainted with the virtues of simples nor implicit dupes to the superstitious follies of their priests we endeavoured to learn the medicinal qualities which they imputed to their plants but our knowledge of their language was too imperfect for us to succeed if we could have learnt their specific for the venereal disease if such they have it would have been of great advantage to us for when we left the island it had been contracted by more than half the people on board the ship it is impossible but that in relating incidents many particulars with respect to the customs opinions and works of these people should be anticipated to avoid repetition therefore i shall only supply deficiencies of the manner of disposing of their dead much has been said already i must more explicitly observe that there are two places in which the dead are deposited one a kind of shed where the flesh is suffered to putrefy the other an enclosure with erections of stone where the bones are afterwards buried the sheds are called tubapau and the enclosures morai the morais are also places of worship as soon as a native of otaheite is known to be dead the house is filled with relations who deplore their loss some by loud lamentations and some by less clamorous but more genuine expressions of grief those who are in the nearest degree of kindred and are really affected by the event are silent the rest are one moment uttering passionate exclamations in a chorus and the next laughing and talking without the least appearance of concern in this manner the remainder of the day on which they assemble is spent and all the succeeding night on the next morning the body is shrouded in their cloth and conveyed to the seaside upon a bier which the bearers support upon their shoulders attended by the priest who having prayed over the body repeats his sentences during the procession when it arrives at the water's edge it is set down upon the beach the priest renews his prayers and taking up some of the water in his hands sprinkles it towards the body but not upon it it is then carried back forty or fifty yards and soon after brought again to the beach where the prayers and sprinkling are repeated it is thus removed backwards and forwards several times and while these ceremonies have been performing a house has been built and a small space of ground railed in in the centre of this house or tupapo posts are set up to support the bier which is at length conveyed thither and placed upon it and here the body remains to putrefy till the flesh is wholly wasted from the bones these houses of corruption are of a size proportioned to the rank of the person whose body they are to contain those allotted to the lower class are just sufficient to cover the bier and have no railing round them the largest we ever saw was eleven yards long and such as these are ornamented according to the abilities and inclination of the surviving kindred who never fail to lay a profusion of good cloth about the body and sometimes almost cover the outside of the house garlands of the fruit of the palm nut or pandamus and cocoa leaves twisted by the priests in mysterious knots with the plant called by them ethi no morai which is particularly consecrated to funeral solemnities are deposited about the place provision and water are also left at a little distance of which and of other decorations a more particular description has been given already as soon as the body is deposited in the tupapau the mourning is renewed 
The women assemble and are led to the door by the nearest relation, who strikes a shark's tooth several times into the crown of her head. The blood copiously follows and is carefully received upon pieces of linen, which are thrown under the bier. The rest of the women follow this example, and the ceremony is repeated at the interval of two or three days, as long as the zeal and sorrow of the parties hold out. The tears also which are shed upon these occasions are received upon pieces of cloth and offered as oblations to the dead. Some of the younger people cut off their hair, and that is thrown under the bier with the other offerings. This custom is founded upon a notion that the soul of the deceased, which they believe to exist in a separate state, is hovering about the place where the body is deposited, that it observes the actions of the survivors, and is gratified by such testimonies of their affection and grief. Two or three days after these ceremonies have been commenced by the women, during which the men seem to be wholly insensible of their loss, they also begin to perform their part. The nearest relations take it in turn to assume the dress and perform the office, which have already been particularly described in the account of Tuberu Tamidas having acted as chief mourner to an old woman, his relation, who died while we were in the island. One part of the ceremony, however, which accounts for the running away of the people as soon as this procession is in sight, has not been mentioned. The chief mourner carries in his hand a long flat stick, the edge of which is set with shark's teeth, and in a frenzy, which his grief is supposed to have inspired, he runs at all he sees, and if any of them happen to be overtaken, he strikes them most unmercifully with this indented cudgel, which cannot fail to wound them in a dangerous manner. These processions continue at certain intervals for five moons, but are less and less frequent by a gradual diminution as the end of that time approaches. When it is expired, what remains of the body is taken down from the bier, and the bones having been scraped and washed very clean are buried according to the rank of the person either within or without a morai if the deceased was an eerie or chief his skull is not buried with the rest of the bones but is wrapped up in fine cloth and put in a kind of box made for that purpose which is also placed in the morai this coffer is called Iwari, ne to Orometua, the house of a teacher or master. After this the mourning ceases, except some of the women continue to be really afflicted for the loss, and in that case they will sometimes suddenly wound themselves with the shark's tooth wherever they happen to be. This perhaps will account for the passion of grief in which Terapo wounded herself at the fort. Some accidental circumstance might forcibly revive the remembrance of a friend or relation whom she had lost, with a pungency of regret and tenderness which forced a vent by tears and prompted her to a repetition of the funeral rite. The ceremonies, however, do not cease with the mourning. Prayers are still said by the priest, who is well paid by the surviving relations, and offerings made at the Marai. Some of the things which from time to time are deposited there are emblematical. A young plantain represents the deceased, and the bunch of feathers, the deity who is invoked. The priest places himself over against the symbol of the god, accompanied by some of the relations, who are furnished with a small offering, and repeats his orison in a set form, consisting of separate sentences, at the same time weaving the leaves of the coconut into different forms, which he afterwards deposits upon the ground, where the bones have been interred. The deity is then addressed by a shrill screech, 
which is used only upon that occasion. When the priest retires, the tuft of feathers is removed, and the provisions left to putrefy, or be devoured by the rats. End of section 21section twenty two of the first voyage of james cook volume one by james cook this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter nineteen part two of the division of time in otaheite numeration computation of distance language diseases disposal of the dead religion war weapons and government with some general observations for the use of future navigators continued of the religion of these people we were not able to acquire any clear and consistent knowledge we found it like the religion of most other countries involved in mystery and perplexed with apparent inconsistencies the religious language is also here as it is in china different from that which is used in common so that to peer who took great pains to instruct us having no words to express his meaning which we understood gave us lectures to very little purpose what we learnt however i will relate with as much perspicuity as i can nothing is more obvious to a rational being however ignorant or stupid than that the universe and its various parts as far as they fall under his notice were produced by some agent inconceivably more powerful than himself and nothing is more difficult to be conceived even by the most sagacious and knowing than the production of them from nothing which among us is expressed by the word creation it is natural therefore as no being apparently capable of producing the universe is to be seen that he should be supposed to reside in some distant part of it or to be in his nature invisible and that he should have originally produced all that now exists in a manner similar to that in which nature is renovated by the succession of one generation to another but the idea of procreation includes in it that of two persons and from the conjunction of two persons these people imagine everything in the universe either originally or derivatively to proceed the supreme deity one of these two first beings they call taro ate hetumu and the other whom they suppose to have been a rock tepapa a daughter of these was teto metateo the year or thirteen months collectively which they never name but upon this occasion and she by the common father produced the months and the months by conjunction with each other the days the stars they suppose partly to be the immediate offspring of the first pair and partly to have increased among themselves and they have the same notion with respect to the different species of plants among other progeny of taro ate hetumu and tapapa they suppose an inferior race of deities whom they call Eatuas. Two of these Eatuas, they say, at some remote period of time, inhabited the earth and were the parents of the first man. When this man, their common ancestor, was born, they say that he was round like a ball, but that his mother, with great care, drew out his limbs and having at length moulded him into his present form she called him aothe which signifies finished that being prompted by the universal instinct to propagate his kind 
and being able to find no female but his mother he begot upon her a daughter and upon the daughter other daughters for several generations before there was a son a son however being at length born he by the assistance of his sisters peopled the world besides their daughter teto Mateo, the first progenitors of nature had a son whom they called tane tano ate hetumu the supreme deity they emphatically style the causer of earthquakes but their prayers are more generally addressed to tane whom they suppose to take a greater part in the affairs of mankind their subordinate deities or eatuas which are numerous are of both sexes the male are worshipped by the men and the female by the women and each have morais to which the other sex is not admitted though they have also morais common to both men perform the office of priest to both sexes but each sex has its priests for those who officiate for one sex do not officiate for the other they believe in the immortality of the soul at least its existence in a separate state and that there are two situations of different degrees of happiness somewhat analogous to our heaven and hell the superior situation they call taverua lerai the other tiahobo they do not however consider them as places of reward or punishment but as receptacles for different classes the first for their chiefs and principal people the other for those of inferior rank for they do not suppose that their actions here in the least influence their future state or indeed that they come under the cognizance of their deities at all their religion therefore if it has no influence upon their morals is at least disinterested and their expressions of adoration and reverence whether by words or actions arise only from a humble sense of their own inferiority and the ineffable excellence of divine perfection the character of the priest or tahoa is hereditary the class is numerous and consists of all ranks of people the chief however is generally the younger brother of a good family and is respected in a degree next to their kings of the little knowledge that is possessed in this country the priests have the greatest share but it consists principally in an acquaintance with the names and ranks of the different etuas or subordinate divinities and the opinions concerning the origin of things which have been traditionally preserved among the order in detached sentences of which some will repeat an incredible number though but very few of the words that are used in their common dialect occur in them the priests however are superior to the rest of the people in the knowledge of navigation and astronomy and indeed the name tahoa signifies nothing more than a man of knowledge as there are priests of every class they officiate only among that class to which they belong the priest of the inferior class is never called upon by those of superior rank nor will the priest of the superior rank officiate for any of the inferior class marriage in this island as appeared to us is nothing more than an agreement between the man and woman with which the priest has no concern where it is contracted it appears to be pretty well kept though sometimes the parties separate by mutual consent and in that case a divorce takes place with as little trouble as the marriage but though the priesthood has laid the people under no tax for a nuptial benediction there are two operations which it has appropriated and from which it derives considerable advantages one is tattooing and the other circumcision though neither of them have any connection with religion the tattooing has been described already circumcision has been adopted merely from motives of cleanliness 
It cannot indeed properly be called circumcision, because the prepuce is not mutilated by a circular wound, but only slid through the upper part to prevent its contracting over the glands. As neither of these can be performed by any but a priest, and as to be without either is the greatest disgrace, they may be considered as a claim to surplus fees like our marriages and christenings, which are cheerfully and liberally paid, not according to any settled stipend, but the rank and abilities of the parties or their friends. The Morai, as has already been observed, is at once a burying ground and a place of worship, and in this particular our churches too much resemble it. The Indian, however, approaches his Morai with a reverence and humility that disgraces the Christian, not because he holds anything sacred that is there, but because he there worships an invisible divinity for whom, though he neither hopes for reward, nor fears punishment at his hand, he always expresses the profoundest homage and most humble adoration. I have already given a very particular description, both of the Morais and the altars that are placed near them. When an Indian is about to worship at the Morai, or brings his offering to the altar, he always uncovers his body to the waist, and his looks and attitude are such as sufficiently express a corresponding disposition of mind. It did not appear to us that these people are, in any instance, guilty of idolatry. At least they do not worship anything that is the work of their hands, nor any visible part of the creation. This island, indeed, and the rest that lie near it, have a particular bird, some a heron, and other a kingsfisher, to which they pay a peculiar regard, and concerning which they have some superstitious notions with respect to good and bad fortune, as we have of the swallow and robin redbreast, giving them the name of Etua, and by no means killing or molesting them. Yet they never address a petition to them, or approach them with any act of adoration. Though I dare not assert that these people, to whom the art of writing, and consequently the recording of laws, are utterly unknown, live under a regular form of government, yet a subordination is established among them that greatly resembles the early state of every nation in Europe under the feudal system, which secured liberty in the most licentious excess to a few, and entailed the most abject slavery upon the rest. Their orders are Eri Rahi, which answers to king, Eri, baron, Mahahuni, vassal, and Tutu, villain. The Eri Rahi, of which there are two in this island, one being the sovereign of each of the peninsulas of which it consists, is treated with great respect by all ranks, but did not appear to us to be invested with so much power as was exercised by the Eries in their own districts. Nor indeed did we, as I have before observed, once see the sovereign of Oberionu while we were in the island, the Eries are lords of one or more of the districts into which each of the peninsulas is divided, of which there may be about one hundred in the whole island, and they parcel out their territories to the Matahunis, who cultivate each his part which he holds under the baron. The lowest class, called Tutus, seem to be nearly under the same circumstances as the villains in feudal governments. These do all the laborious work. They cultivate the land under the Manahunis, who are only nominal cultivators for the Lord. They fetch wood and water, and, under the direction of the mistress of the family, dress the victuals. They also catch the fish. Each of the Eries keeps a kind of court, and has a great number of attendants, chiefly the younger brothers of their own tribe. 
and among these some hold particular offices, but of what nature exactly we could not tell. One was called the Eowa no Liri, and another the Wano no Liri, and these were frequently dispatched to us with messages. Of all the courts of these eries, that of Tutaa was the most splendid, as indeed might reasonably be expected, because he administered the government for Otu, his nephew, who was Eri Rahi of Obere Onu, and lived upon his estate. The child of the baron or Eri, as well as of the sovereign or Eri Rahi, succeeds to the title and honours of the father as soon as it is born, so that a baron who was yesterday called Eri, and was approached with the ceremony of lowering the garments, so as to uncover the upper part of the body, is today, if his wife was last night delivered of a child, reduced to the rank of a private man, all marks of respect being transferred to the child, if it is suffered to live, though the father still continues possessor and administrator of his estate. Probably this custom has its share, among other inducements, in forming the societies called Arioi. If a general attack happens to be made upon the island, every district under the command of an Erie is obliged to furnish its proportion of soldiers for the common defence. The number furnished by the principal districts, which Tupia recollected, when added together, amounted, as I have observed before, to 6,680. Upon such occasions, the united force of the whole island is commanded in chief by the Eri Rahi. Private differences between two Eries are decided by their own people, without at all disturbing the general tranquillity. Their weapons are slings, which they use with great dexterity, pikes headed with the stings of stingrays, and clubs of about six or seven feet long made of a very hard, heavy wood. Thus armed, they are said to fight with great obstinacy, which is the more likely to be true, as it is certain that they give no quarter to either man, woman, or child, who is so unfortunate as to fall into their hands during the battle, or for some hours afterwards, till their passion, which is always violent, though not lasting, has subsided. The Eri Rahi of Oberionu, while we were here, was in perfect amity with the Eri Rahi of Tiarabu, the other peninsula, though he took himself the title of king of the whole island. This, however, produced no more jealousy in the other sovereign than the title of king of France, assumed by our sovereign, does in his most Christian majesty. In a government so rude, it cannot be expected that distributive justice should be regularly administered, and indeed, where there is so little opposition of interest, in consequence of the facility with which every appetite and passion is gratified, there can be but few crimes. There is nothing like money the common medium by which every want and every wish is supposed to be gratified by those who do not possess it. There is no apparently permanent good which either fraud or force can unlawfully obtain. And when all the crimes that are committed by the inhabitants of civilized countries to get money are set out of the account, not many will remain. Add to this, that where the commerce with women is restrained by no law, men will seldom be under any temptation to commit adultery, especially as one woman is always less preferred to another, where they are less distinguished by personal decorations, and the adventitious circumstances which are produced by the varieties of art and the refinements of sentiment. That they are thieves is true, but as among these people no man can be much injured or benefited by theft, it is not necessary to restrain it by such punishments 
as in other countries are absolutely necessary to the very existence of civil society. Tupia, however, tells us that adultery is sometimes committed as well as theft. In all cases where an injury has been committed, the punishment of the offender lies with the sufferer. Adultery, if the parties are caught in the fact, is sometimes punished with death in the first ardour of resentment. But without circumstances of immediate provocation, the female sinner seldom suffers more than a beating. As punishment, however, is enforced by no law, nor taken into the hand of any magistrate, it is not often inflicted, except the injured party is the strongest. Though the chiefs do sometimes punish their immediate dependents for faults committed against each other, and even the dependents of others, if they are accused of any offence committed in their district. Having now given the best description that I can of the island in its present state, and of the people, with their customs and manners, language and arts, I shall only add a few general observations, which may be of use to future navigators, if any of the ships of Great Britain should receive orders to visit it. As it produces nothing that appears to be convertible into an article of trade, and can be used only by affording refreshments to shipping in their passage through these seas, it might be made to answer this purpose in a much greater degree by transporting thither sheep, goats, and horned cattle with European garden stuff and other useful vegetables, which there is the greatest reason to suppose will flourish in so fine a climate and so rich a soil. Though this and the neighbouring islands lie within the Tropic of Capricorn, yet the heat is not troublesome, nor did the winds blow constantly from the east. We had frequently a fresh gale from the southwest for two or three days, and sometimes, though very seldom, from the northwest. Tupia reported that southwesterly winds prevail in October, November, and December, and we have no doubt of the fact. When the winds are variable, they are always accompanied by a swell from the southwest or west southwest. There is also a swell from the same points when it is calm, and the atmosphere loaded with clouds, which is a sure indication that the winds are variable or westerly out at sea, for with the settled trade wind the weather is clear. The meeting with westerly winds within the general limits of the eastern trade has induced some navigators to suppose that they were near some large tract of land, of which, however, I think they are no indication. It has been found, both by us and the dolphin, that the trade wind in these parts does not extend farther to the south than twenty degrees, beyond which we generally found a gale from the westward, and it is reasonable to suppose that when these winds blow strong, they will drive back the easterly wind, and consequently encroach upon the limits within which they constantly blow, and thus necessarily produce variable winds, as either happens to prevail, and a southwesterly swell. This supposition is the more probable, as it is well known that the trade winds blow but faintly for some distance within their limits, and therefore may be more easily stopped or repelled by a wind in the contrary direction. It is also well known that the limits of the trade winds vary not only at different seasons of the year, but sometimes at the same season in different years. There is therefore no reason to suppose that southwesterly winds within these limits are caused by the vicinity of large tracts of land, especially as they are always accompanied with a large swell in the same direction in which they blow. And we find a much greater surf beating upon the shores of the southwest side of the islands that are situated just within the limits of the trade wind 
than upon any other part of them. The tides about these islands are perhaps as inconsiderable as in any part of the world. A south or south by west moon makes high water in the bay of Matavai at Otaheite, but the water very seldom rises perpendicularly above 10 or 12 inches. The variation of the compass I found to be 4 degrees 46 minutes easterly, this being the result of a great number of trials made with four of Dr. Knight's needles adapted to azimuth compasses. These compasses I thought the best that could be procured, yet when applied to the meridian line, I found them to differ, not only one from another, sometimes a degree and a half, but the same needle half a degree from itself in different trials made on the same day. And I do not remember that I have ever found two needles which exactly agreed at the same time and place, though I have often found the same needle agree with itself in several trials made one after the other. This imperfection of the needle, however, is of no consequence to navigation, as the variation can always be found to a degree of accuracy more than sufficient for all nautical purposes. End of section 22. Section 23 of the First Voyage of James Cook, Volume 1 by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 1, Chapter 20, Part 1. A description of several other islands in the neighborhood of Otaheite with various incidents a dramatic entertainment, and many particulars relative to the customs and manners of the inhabitants. After parting with our friends, we made an easy sail, with gentle breezes and clear weather, and were informed by Tupia that four of the neighbouring islands, which he distinguished by the names of Huahene, Ulitea, Otaha, and Bola Bola lay at a distance of between one and two days' sail from Otaheite, and that hogs, fowls, and other refreshments, with which we had of late been but sparingly supplied, were there to be procured in great plenty. But having discovered from the hills of Otaheite an island lying to the northward, which he called Tehuroa, I determined first to stand that way, to take a nearer view of it. It lies north a half west, distant eight leagues from the northern extremity of Otaheite, upon which we had observed the transit, and to which we had, for that reason, given the name of Point Venus. We found it to be a small, low island, and were told by Tupia that it had no settled inhabitants but was occasionally visited by the inhabitants of Otaheite, who sometimes went thither for a few days to fish. We therefore determined to spend no more time in a farther examination of it, but to go in search of Wahahene and Ulitea, which he described to be well peopled and as large as Otaheite. At six o'clock in the morning of the 14th, the westernmost part of Imeo, or York Island, bore southeast a half south, and the body of Otaheite east a half south. At noon, the body of York Island bore east by south a half south, and Port Royal Bay at Otaheite south 70 degrees 45 minutes east, distant 61 miles, and an island which we took to be Saunders Island, called by the natives Tapoa. Maneo, or south southwest. We also saw land bearing northwest or half west, which Tupia said was Wahahene. On the 15th it was hazy, with light breezes and calms succeeding each other, so that we could see no land and made but little way. 
our Indian, Tupia, often prayed for a wind to his god Tane, and as often boasted of his success, which indeed he took a very effectual method to secure, for he never began his address to Tane till he saw a breeze so near that he knew it must reach the ship before his orison was well over. On the 16th we had a gentle breeze, and in the morning, about eight o'clock, being close in with the northwest part of the island Wahahene, we sounded, but had no bottom with eighty fathom. Some canoes very soon came off, but the people seemed afraid, and kept at a distance till they discovered Tupia, and then they ventured nearer. In one of the canoes that came up to the ship's side was the king of the island and his wife. Upon assurances of friendship, frequently and earnestly repeated, their majesties and some others came on board. At first they were struck with astonishment, and wondered at everything that was shown them, Yet they made no inquiries, and seeming to be satisfied with what was offered to their notice, they made no search after other objects of curiosity, with which it was natural to suppose a building of such novelty and magnitude as the ship must abound. After some time they became more familiar. I was given to understand that the name of the king was Ori, and he proposed as a mark of amity that we should exchange names. To this I readily consented, and he was Cookie, for so he pronounced my name, and I was Ori, for the rest of the time we were together. We found these people to be very nearly the same with those of Otahiti, in person, dress, language, and every other circumstance, except, if Tupia might be believed, that they would not steal. Soon after dinner, we came to an anchor in a small but excellent harbour on the west side of the island, which the natives call O'Hara, in eighteen fathom water, clear ground and secure from all winds. I went immediately ashore, accompanied by Mr. Banks, Dr. Zollander, Mr. Monkhouse, Tupia, King Cookie, and some other of the natives who had been on board ever since the morning. The moment we landed, Tupia stripped himself as low as the waist, and desired Mr. Monkhouse to do the same. He then sat down before a great number of the natives, who were collected together in a large house or shed, for here, as well as at Otaheite, a house consists only of a roof supported upon poles the rest of us, by his desire, standing behind. He then began a speech or prayer, which lasted about a quarter of an hour. The king, who stood over against him, every now and then answering in what appeared to be set responses. In the course of this harangue, he delivered at different times two handkerchiefs, a black silk neckcloth, some beads, two small bunches of feathers, and some plantains, as presents to their etua or god. In return for these, he received for our etua a hog, some young plantains, and two small bunches of feathers, which he ordered to be carried on board the ship. After these ceremonies, which were supposed to be the ratification of a treaty between us, Every one was dismissed to go whither he pleased, and Tupia immediately repaired to offer his oblations at one of the Morais. The next morning we went on shore again and walked up the hills, where the productions were exactly the same as those of Otaheite, except that the rocks and clay appeared to be more burnt. The houses were neat and the boat houses remarkably large. One that we measured was fifty paces long, ten broad and twenty-four feet high. The whole formed a pointed arch, like those of our old cathedrals, which was supported on one side by twenty-six, and on the other by thirty pillars, or rather posts, about two feet high and one thick, upon most of which 
were rudely carved the heads of men, and several fanciful devices, not altogether unlike those which we sometimes see printed from wooden blocks at the beginning and end of old books. The plains or flat part of the country abounded in breadfruit and coconut trees. In some places, however, there were salt swamps and lagoons which would produce neither. We went again ashore on the 18th and would have taken the advantage of Tupia's company in our perambulation, but he was too much engaged with his friends. We took, however, his boy, whose name was Teato, and Mr. Banks went to take a farther view of what had much engaged his attention before. It was a kind of chest or ark, the lid of which was nicely sewed on and thatched very neatly with palm nut leaves. It was fixed upon two poles and supported on little arches of wood, very neatly carved. The use of the poles seemed to be to remove it from place to place in the manner of our sedan chairs. In one end of it was a square hole, in the middle of which was a ring touching the sides and leaving the angles open so as to form a round hole within a square one. The first time Mr. Banks saw this coffer, the aperture at the end was stopped with a piece of cloth which, lest he should give offence, he left untouched. Probably there was then something within, but now the cloth was taken away, and upon looking into it, it was found empty. The general resemblance between this repository and the Ark of the Lord among the Jews is remarkable, but it is still more remarkable that upon inquiring of the boy what it was called, he said, Ewara no Etua, the house of the God. He could, however, give no account of its signification or use. We had commenced a kind of trade with the natives, but it went on slowly, for when anything was offered, not one of them would take it upon his own judgment, but collected the opinions of twenty or thirty people, which could not be done without great loss of time. We got, however, eleven pigs, and determined to try for more the next day. The next day, therefore, we brought out some hatchets, for which we hoped we should have had no occasion upon an island which no European had ever visited before. These procured us three very large hogs, and as we proposed to sail in the afternoon, King Ori and several others came on board to take their leave. To the king I gave a small plate of pewter, on which was stamped this inscription, His Britannic Majesty's ship Endeavour, Lieutenant Cook Commander, 16th July, 1769, Wa'ahene. I gave him also some medals or counters, resembling the coin of England, struck in the year 1761, with some other presents. And he promised that with none of these, particularly the plate, he would ever part. I thought it as lasting a testimony of our having first discovered this island as any we could leave behind, and having dismissed our visitors well satisfied, and in great good humour, we set sail about half an hour after two in the afternoon. The island of Wa'ahene, or Hua'ahene, is situated in the latitude of 16 degrees 43 minutes south, and longitude 152 degrees 52 minutes west from Greenwich. It is distant from Otaheite about 31 leagues in the direction of north 58 degrees west and is about 7 leagues in compass. Its surface is hilly and uneven and it has a safe and commodious harbour. The harbour, which is called by the natives Owala or Ohara, lies on the west side under the northernmost high land and within the north end of the reef, which lies along that side of the island. 
there are two inlets or openings by which it may be entered through the reef about a mile and a half distant from each other the southernmost is the widest and on the south side of it lies a very small sandy island Wahahene seems to be a month forwarder in its productions than Otaheite, as we found the coconuts full of kernel and some of the new breadfruit fit to eat. Of the coconuts, the inhabitants make a food which they call poe by mixing them with yams. They scrape both fine, and having incorporated the powder, they put it into a wooden trough with a number of hot stones by which an oily kind of hasty pudding is made that our people relished very well especially when it was fried mr banks found not more than eleven or twelve new plants but he observed some insects and a species of scorpion which he had not seen before the inhabitants seemed to be larger made and more stout than those of otaheite mr banks measured one of the men and found him to be six feet three inches and a half high yet they are so lazy that he could not persuade any of them to go up the hills with him they said if they were to attempt it the fatigue would kill them the women were very fair more so than those of otaheite and in general we thought them more handsome though none that were equal to some individuals both sexes seem to be less timid and less curious it has been observed that they made no inquiries on board the ship and when we fired a gun they were frightened indeed but they did not fall down as our friends at otaheite constantly did when we first came among them for this difference however we can easily account upon other principles the people at wahene had not seen the dolphin those at otaheite had in one the report of a gun was connected with the idea of instant destruction to the other there was nothing dreadful in it but the appearance and the sound as they had never experienced its power of dispensing death while we were on shore we found that dupier had commended them beyond their merit when he said that they would not steal for one of them was detected in the fact but when he was seized by the hair the rest instead of running away as the people at otaheite would have done gathered round and inquired what provocation had been given but this also may be accounted for without giving them credit for superior courage they had no experience of the consequence of european resentment which the people at otaheite had in many instances purchased with life it must however be acknowledged to their honour that when they understood what had happened they showed strong signs of disapprobation and prescribed a good beating for the thief which was immediately administered we now made sail for the island of ulitea which lies southwest by west distant seven or eight leagues from wahahene and at half an hour after six in the evening we were within three leagues of the shore on the eastern side we stood off and on all night and when the day broke the next morning we stood in for the shore we soon after discovered an opening in the reef which lies before the island within which tupia told us there was a good harbour i did not however implicitly take his word but sent the master out in the pinnace to examine it he soon made the signal for the ship to follow we accordingly stood in and anchored in two and twenty fathom with soft ground the natives soon came off to us in two canoes each of which brought a woman and a pig the woman we supposed was a mark of confidence and the pig was a present we received both with proper acknowledgments and complimented each of the ladies with a spike nail and some beads 
much to their satisfaction. We were told by Tupia, who had always expressed much fear of the men of Bola Bola, that they had made a conquest of this island, and that, if we remained here, they would certainly come down tomorrow and fight us. We determined, therefore, to go on shore without delay, while the day was our own. I landed in company with Mr. Banks, Dr. Zollander, and the other gentlemen, Tupia being also of the party. He introduced us by repeating the ceremonies which he had performed at Wahahene, after which I hoisted an English jack and took possession of this and the three neighboring islands, Wahahene, Otaha, and Bola Bola, which were all in sight in the name of His Britannic Majesty. After this, we took a walk to a great morai called Tapodekbo Atea. We found it very different from those of Otaheite, for it consisted only of four walls about eight feet high of coral stones, some of which were of an immense size, enclosing an area of about five and twenty yards square, which was filled up with smaller stones. Upon the top of it, many planks were set up on end, which were carved in their whole length. At a little distance we found an altar, or ewata, upon which lay the last oblation or sacrifice, a hog of about eighty pounds weight, which had been offered whole and very nicely roasted. Here were also four or five eware no eatua, or houses of God, to which carriage poles were fitted, like that which we had seen at Waahene. One of these Mr. Banks examined by putting his hand into it, and found a parcel about five feet long and one thick, wrapped up in mats. He broke away through several of these mats with his fingers, but at length came to one which was made of the fibres of the coconut, so firmly plaited together that he found it impossible to tear it, and therefore was forced to desist especially as he perceived that what he had done already gave great offence to our new friends. From hence we went to a long house not far distant, where, among rolls of cloth and several other things, we saw the model of a canoe about three feet long, to which were tied eight human jawbones. We had already learnt that these, like scalps among the Indians of North America, were trophies of war. Tupia affirmed that they were the jawbones of the natives of this island. If so, they might have been hung up with the model of a canoe as a symbol of invasion by the warriors of Bola Bola as a memorial of their conquest. Night now came on apace but Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander continued their walk along the shore, and at a little distance saw another aware no iatua, and a tree of the fig kind, the same as that which Mr. Green had seen at Otaheite, in great perfection, the trunk, or rather congeries, of the roots of which was forty-two paces in circumference. On the 21st, having dispatched the master in the longboat to examine the coast of the south part of the island, and one of the mates in the yawl to sound the harbour where the ship lay, I went myself in the pinnace to survey that part of the island which lies to the north. Mr. Banks and the gentlemen were again on shore, trading with the natives, and examining the products and curiosities of the country. They saw nothing, however, worthy of notice, but some more jawbones, of which they made no doubt, but that the account they had heard was true. On the 22nd and 23rd, having strong gales and hazy weather, I did not think it safe to put to sea, but on the 24th, though the wind was still variable, I got under sail and plied to the northward within the reef, 
with a view to go out at a wider opening than that by which I had entered. In doing this, however, I was unexpectedly in the most imminent danger of striking on the rock. The master, whom I had ordered to keep continually sounding in the chains, suddenly called out two fathom. This alarmed me, for though I knew the ship drew at least fourteen feet, and that therefore it was impossible such a shoal should be under her keel, yet the master was either mistaken, or she went along the edge of a coral rock, many of which, in the neighbourhood of these islands, are as steep as a wall. This harbour or bay is called by the natives Hupoa, and taken in its greatest extent, it is capable of holding any number of shipping. It extends almost the whole length of the east side of the island, and is defended from the sea by a reef of coral rocks. The southernmost opening in this reef, or channel into the harbour, by which we entered, is little more than a cable's length wide. It lies off the easternmost part of the island, and may be known by another small woody island, which lies a little to the southeast of it, called by the people here Oatara. Between three and four miles northwest from this island lie two other islets, in the same direction as the reef, of which they are a part, called Opururu and Tamu. Between these lies the other channel into the harbour, through which I went out, and which is a full quarter of a mile wide. Still farther to the northwest are some other small islands, near which I am told there is another small channel into the harbour, but this I know only by report. The principal refreshments that are to be procured at this part of the island are plantains, coconuts, yams, hogs, and fowls. The hogs and fowls, however, are scarce, and the country where we saw it is neither so populous nor so rich in produce as Otaheite or even Wahahene. Wood and water may also be procured here, but the water cannot conveniently be got at. We were now again at sea, without having received any interruption from the hostile inhabitants of Bola Bola, whom, notwithstanding the fears of Tupia, we intended to visit. At four o'clock in the afternoon of the 25th, we were within a league of Otaha, which bore north 77 degrees west. To the northward of the south end of that island, on the east side of it, and something more than a mile from the shore, lie two small islands, called Toahutu and Wenuaya, between which, Tupia says, there is a channel into a very good harbour, which lies within the reef, and appearances confirmed his report. As I discovered a broad channel between Otaha and Bola Bola, I determined rather to go through it than run to the northward of all, but the wind being right ahead, I got no ground. Between five and six in the evening of the 26th, as I was standing to the northward, I discovered a small low island lying north by west or north-northwest, distant four or five leagues from Bola Bola. We were told by Tupia that the name of this island is Tubai, that it produces nothing but coconuts and is inhabited only by three families, though it is visited by the inhabitants of the neighbouring islands who resort thither to catch fish with which the coast abounds. On the 27th, about noon, the peak of Bola Bola bore north 25 degrees west, and the north end of Otaha, north 80 degrees west, distant three leagues. The wind continued contrary all this day and the night following. On the 28th at six in the morning, we were near the entrance of the harbour on the east side of Otaha, 
which has been just mentioned, and finding that it might be examined without losing time, I sent away the master in the longboat with orders to sound it, and, if the wind did not shift in our favour, to land upon the island and traffic with the natives for such refreshments as were to be had. In this boat went Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander, who landed upon the island and before night purchased three hogs, twenty-one fowls, and as many yams and plantains as the boat would hold. Plantains we thought a more useful refreshment even than pork, for they were boiled and served to the ship's company as bread, and were now the more acceptable as our bread was so full of vermin that notwithstanding all possible care, we had sometimes twenty of them in our mouths at a time, every one of which tasted as hot as mustard. The island seemed to be more barren than Ulitea, but the produce was of the same kind. The people also exactly resembled those that we had seen at the other islands. They were not numerous, but they flocked about the boat wherever she went from all quarters, bringing with them whatever they had to sell. They paid the strangers, of whom they had received an account from Tupia, the same compliment which they used towards their own kings, uncovering their shoulders and wrapping their garments round their breasts, and were so solicitous to prevent its being neglected by any of their people that a man was sent with them, who called out to every one they met, telling him what they were and what he was to do. In the meantime, I kept plying off and on, waiting for the boat's return. At half an hour after five, not seeing anything of her, I fired a gun, and after it was dark, hoisted a light. At half an hour after eight, we heard the report of a musket, which we answered with a gun, and soon after the boat came on board. The master reported that the harbour was safe and commodious, with good anchorage from twenty-five to sixteen fathom water, clear ground. As soon as the boat was hoisted in, I made sail to the northward, and at eight o'clock in the morning of the twenty-ninth, we were close under the peak of Bola Bola, which was high, rude, and craggy. As the island was altogether inaccessible in this part, and we found it impossible to weather it, we tacked and stood off, then tacked again, and after many trips did not weather the south end of it till twelve o'clock at night. At eight o'clock the next morning we discovered an island which bore from us north sixty-three degrees west, distant about eight leagues. At the same time the peak of Bola Bola bore north one quarter east, distant three or four leagues. This island Tupia called Maurua, and said that it was small, wholly surrounded by a reef, and without any harbour for shipping, but inhabited and bearing the same produce as the neighbouring islands. The middle of it rises in a high round hill that may be seen at the distance of ten leagues. When we were off Bola Bola, we saw but few people on the shore and were told by Tupia that many of the inhabitants were gone to Ulitea. In the afternoon we found ourselves nearly the length of the south end of Ulitea, and to windward of some harbours that lay on the west side of this island. Into one of these harbours, though we had before been ashore on the other side of the island, I intended to put in order to stop a leak which we had sprung in the powder room, and to take in more ballast, as I found the ship too light to carry sail upon a wind. As the wind was right against us, we plied off one of the harbours, and about three o'clock in the afternoon, on the 1st of August, we came to an anchor in the entrance of the channel leading into it, in fourteen fathom water, being prevented from working in by a tide which set very strong out. We then carried out the kedge anchor 
in order to warp into the harbour but when this was done we could not trip the bower anchor with all the purchase we could make we were therefore obliged to lie still all night and in the morning when the tide turned the ship going over the anchor it tripped of itself and we warped the ship into a proper berth with ease and moored in twenty-eight fathom with a sandy bottom while this was doing many of the natives came off to us with hogs fowls and plantains which they parted with at an easy rate when the ship was secured i went on shore to look for a proper place to get ballast and water both of which i found in a very convenient situation this day mr banks and dr zollander spent on shore very much to their satisfaction everybody seemed to fear and respect them placing in them at the same time the utmost confidence behaving as if conscious that they possessed the power of doing them mischief without any propensity to make use of it men women and children crowded round them and followed them wherever they went but none of them were guilty of the least incivility on the contrary whenever there happened to be dirt or water in the way the men vied with each other to carry them over on their backs they were conducted to the houses of the principal people and were received in a manner altogether new the people who followed them while they were in their way rushed forward as soon as they came to a house and went hastily in before them leaving however a lane sufficiently wide for them to pass when they entered they found those who had preceded them ranged on either side of a long mat which was spread upon the ground and at the farther end of which sat the family in the first house they entered they found some very young women or children dressed with the utmost neatness who kept their station expecting the strangers to come up to them and make them presents which they did with the greatest pleasure for prettier children or better dressed they had never seen one of them was a girl about six years old her gown or upper garment was red a large quantity of plaited hair was wound round her head the ornament to which they give the name of tamu and which they value more than anything they possess she sat at the upper end of a mat thirty feet long upon which none of the spectators presumed to set a foot notwithstanding the crowd and she leaned upon the arm of a well-looking woman about thirty who was probably her nurse our gentleman walked up to her and as soon as they approached she stretched out her hand to receive the beads which they offered her and no princess in europe could have done it with a better grace the people were so much gratified by the presents which were made to these girls that when mr banks and dr zollander returned they seemed attentive to nothing but how to oblige them and in one of the houses they were by order of the master entertained with a dance different from any that they had seen it was performed by one man who put up on his head a large cylindrical piece of wickerwork or basket about four feet long and eight inches in diameter which was faced with feathers placed perpendicularly with the tops bending forwards and edged round with shark's teeth and the tail feathers of tropic birds when he had put on this headdress, which is called a wow, he began to dance, moving slowly and often turning his head so that the top of his high wicker cap described the circle, and sometimes throwing it so near the faces of the spectators as to make them start back. This was held among them as a very good joke and never failed to produce a peal of laughter especially when it was played off upon one of the strangers end of section 23
Section 24 of The First Voyage of James Cook, Volume 1, by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 1, Chapter 20, Part 2. A description of several other islands in the neighborhood of Otaheite, with various incidents, a dramatic entertainment, and many particulars relative to the customs and manners of the inhabitants, continued. On the third, we went along the shore to the northward, which was in a direction opposite to that of the route Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander had taken the day before, with a design to purchase stock, which we always found the people more ready to part with, and at a more easy price at their houses than at the market. In the course of our walk we met with a company of dancers who detained us two hours, and during all that time afforded us great entertainment. The company consisted of two women dancers and six men with three drums. We were informed by Tupia that they were some of the most considerable people of the island, and that, though they were continually going from place to place, they did not, like the little strolling companies of Otaheite, take any gratuity from the spectators. The women had upon their heads a considerable quantity of tamu, or plaited hair, which was brought several times round the head, and adorned in many parts with the flowers of the cave jessamine which was stuck in with much taste and made a headdress truly elegant. Their necks, shoulders, and arms were naked. So were the breasts also, as low as the parting of the arm. Below that they were covered with black cloth, which set close to the body. At the side of each breast near the arm was placed a small plume of black feathers, much in the same manner as Our Ladies now wear their nosegays or bouquets. Upon their hips rested a quantity of cloth plaited very full, which reached up to the breast and fell down below into long petticoats, which quite concealed their feet, and which they managed with as much dexterity as our opera dancers could have done. The plaits above the waist were brown and white alternately, the petticoats below were all white. In this dress they advanced sideways in a measured step, keeping excellent time to the drums, which beat briskly and loud. Soon after they began to shake their hips, giving the folds of cloth that lay upon them a very quick motion, which was in some degree continued through the whole dance, though the body was thrown into various postures, sometimes standing, sometimes sitting, and sometimes resting on their knees and elbows the fingers also being moved at the same time, with a quickness scarcely to be imagined. Much of the dexterity of the dancers, however, and the entertainment of the spectators, consisted in the wantonness of their attitudes and gestures, which was, indeed, such as exceeds all description. One of these girls had in her ear three pearls. One of them was very large, but so foul that it was of little value. The other two were as big as a middling pea. These were clear and of a good colour and shape, though spoiled by the drilling. Mr. Banks would fain have purchased them, and offered the owner anything she would ask for them, but she could not be persuaded to part with them at any price. He tempted her with the value of four hogs, and whatever else she should choose, but without success. And indeed they set a value upon their pearls very nearly equal to what they would fetch among us, except they could be procured before they are drilled. Between the dances of the women, the men performed a kind of dramatic interlude, in which there was dialogue as well as dancing, but we were not sufficiently acquainted with their language to understand the subject. On the fourth, some of our gentlemen saw a much more regular entertainment of the dramatic kind, which was divided into four acts. 
Tupia had often told us that he had large possessions in this island, which had been taken away from him by the inhabitants of Bola Bola, and he now pointed them out in the very bay where the ship was at anchor. Upon our going on shore, this was confirmed by the inhabitants, who showed us several districts or Wenuas, which they acknowledged to be his right. On the fifth, I received a present of three hogs, some fowls, several pieces of cloth, the largest we had seen, being fifty yards long, which they unfolded and displayed so as to make the greatest show possible, and a considerable quantity of plantains, coconuts, and other refreshments from Opuni, the formidable king, or, in the language of the country, Iri Rahi of Bola Bola, with a message that he was at this time upon the island, and that the next day he intended to pay me a visit. In the meantime, Mr. Banks and Dr. Zolander went upon the hills, accompanied by several of the Indians, who conducted them by excellent paths to such a height that they plainly saw the other side of the island, and the passage through which the ship had passed the reef between the little islands of Opururu and Tamu, when we landed upon it the first time. As they were returning, they saw the Indians exercising themselves at what they call Erowa, which is nothing more than pitching a kind of light lance, headed with hardwood at a mark. In this amusement, though they seem very fond of it, they do not excel, for not above one in twelve struck the mark, which was the bole of a plantain tree at about twenty yards distance. On the sixth we all stayed at home, expecting the visit of the great king, but we were disappointed. We had, however, much more agreeable company, for he sent three very pretty girls to demand something in return for his present. Perhaps he was unwilling to trust himself on board the ship, or perhaps he thought his messengers would procure a more valuable return for his hogs and poultry than he could himself. Be that as it may, we did not regret his absence, nor his messengers their visit. In the afternoon, as the great king would not come to us, we determined to go to the great king. As he was lord of the Bola Bola men, the conquerors of this and the terror of all the other islands, we expected to see a chief young and vigorous with an intelligent countenance and an enterprising spirit. We found, however, a poor feeble wretch, withered and decrepit, half blind with age, and so sluggish and stupid that he appeared scarcely to have understanding enough left to know that it was probable we should be gratified either by hogs or women. He did not receive us sitting or with any state or formality as the other chiefs had done. We made him our present, which he accepted, and gave a hog in return. We had learnt that his principal residence was at Otaha, and upon our telling him that we intended to go thither in our boats the next morning, and that we should be glad to have him along with us, he promised to be of the party. Early in the morning, therefore, I set out both with the pinnace and longboat for Otaha, having some of the gentlemen with me, and in our way we called upon Opuni, who was in his canoe, ready to join us. As soon as we landed at Otaha, I made him a present of an axe, which I thought might induce him to encourage his subjects to bring us such provision as we wanted. But in this we found ourselves sadly disappointed, for after staying with him till noon, we left him without being able to procure a single article. I then proceeded to the north point of the island in the pinnace, having sent the longboat another way. As I went along, I picked up half a dozen hogs, as many fowls, and some plantains and yams. Having viewed and sketched the harbour on this side of the island, I made the best of my way back with the longboat, which joined me soon after it was dark, 
and about ten o'clock at night we got on board the ship. In this excursion Mr. Banks was not with us. He spent the morning on board the ship, trading with the natives who came off in their canoes for provisions and curiosities, and in the afternoon he went on shore with his draughtsmen to sketch the dresses of the dancers which he had seen a day or two before. He found the company exactly the same, except that another woman had been added to it. The dancing also of the women was the same, but the interludes of the men were somewhat varied. He saw five or six performed, which were different from each other, and very much resembled the drama of our stage dances. The next day he went ashore again with Dr. Zollander, and they directed their course towards the dancing company, which, from the time of our second landing, had gradually moved about two leagues in their course round the island. They saw more dancing and more interludes, the interludes still varying from each other. In one of them, the performers, who were all men, were divided into two parties, which were distinguished from each other by the colour of their clothes, one being brown and the other white. The brown party represented a master and servants, and the white party a company of thieves. The master gave a basket of meat to the rest of his party, with a charge to take care of it. The dance of the white party consisted of several expedients to steal it, and that of the brown party in preventing their success. After some time, those who had charge of the basket placed themselves round it upon the ground, and leaning upon it, appeared to go to sleep. The others, improving this opportunity, came gently upon them, and lifting them up from the basket, carried off their prize. The sleepers, soon after awaking, missed their basket, but presently fell a-dancing, without any farther regarding their loss so that the dramatic action of this dance was, according to the severest lords of criticism, one, and our lovers of simplicity would here have been gratified with an entertainment perfectly suited to the chastity of their taste. On the ninth, having spent the morning in trading with the canoes, we took the opportunity of a breeze, which sprung up at east, and having stopped our leak, and got the fresh stock which we had purchased on board, we sailed out of the harbour. When we were sailing away, Tupia strongly urged me to fire a shot towards Bola Bola, possibly as a mark of his resentment, and to show the power of his new allies. In this I thought proper to gratify him, though we were seven leagues distant. While we were about these islands, we expended very little of the ship's provisions, and were very plentifully supplied with hogs, fowls, plantains, and yams, which we hoped would have been of great use to us in our course to the southward. But the hogs would not eat European grain of any kind, pulse or bread dust, so that we could not preserve them alive and the fowls were all very soon seized with a disease that affected the head so that they continued to hold it down between their legs till they died. Much dependence, therefore, must not be placed in livestock taken on board at these places, at least not until a discovery is made of some food that the hogs will eat and some remedy for the disease of the poultry. Having been necessarily detained at Ulitea so long, by the carpenters in stopping our leak, we determined to give up our design of going on shore at Bola Bola, especially as it appeared to be difficult of access. To these six islands, Ulitea, Otaha, Bola Bola, Wahahene, Tubai, and Morua, as they lie contiguous to each other, I gave the names of society islands, but did not think it proper to distinguish them separately by any other names than those by which they were known to the natives. They are situated between the latitude of 16 degrees 10 minutes 
and 16 degrees 55 minutes south, and between the longitude of 150 degrees 57 minutes and 152 degrees west from the meridian of Greenwich. Ulitea and Otaha lie within about two miles of each other, and are both enclosed within one reef of coral rocks, so that there is no passage for shipping between them. This reef forms several excellent harbours. The entrances into them, indeed, are but narrow, yet when a ship is once in, nothing can hurt her. The harbours on the east side have been described already, and on the west side of Ulitea, which is the largest of the two, there are three. The northernmost, in which we lay, is called Ohamaneno. The channel leading into it is about a quarter of a mile wide, and lies between two low sandy islands, which are the northernmost on this side. Between, or just within the two islands, there is good anchorage in twenty-eight fathom, soft ground. This harbour, though small, is preferable to the others, because it is situated in the most fertile part of the island, and where fresh water is easily to be got. The other two harbours lie to the southward of this, and not far from the south end of the island. In both of them there is good anchorage, with ten, twelve, and fourteen fathom. They are easily known by three small woody islands at their entrance. The southernmost of these two harbours lies within, and to the southward of, the southernmost of these islands, and the other lies between the two northernmost. I was told that there were more harbours at the south end of this island, but I did not examine whether the report was true. Otaha affords two very good harbours, one on the east side and the other on the west. That on the east side is called Ohamene and has been mentioned already. The other is called Oharura and lies about the middle of the southwest side of the island. It is pretty large and affords good anchorage in twenty and twenty-five fathom nor is there any want of fresh water. The breach in the reef that forms a channel into this harbour is about a quarter of a mile broad and, like all the rest, is very steep on both sides. In general, there is no danger here but what is visible. The island of Bola Bola lies northwest and by west from Otaha, distant about four leagues, it is surrounded by a reef of rocks and several small islands, encompassed together about eight leagues. I was told that, on the southwest side of the island, there is a channel through the reef into a very good harbour, but I did not think it worth while to examine it, for the reasons that have been just assigned. This island is rendered very remarkable by a high craggy hill, which appears to be almost perpendicular and terminates at the top in two peaks, one higher than the other. The land of Ulitea and Otaha is hilly, broken and irregular except on the sea coast, yet the hills look green and pleasant and are, in many places, clothed with wood. The several particulars in which these islands and their inhabitants differ from what we had observed at Otaheite, have been mentioned in the course of this narrative. We pursued our course without any event worthy of note till the 13th, about noon, when we saw land bearing south-east, which Tupia told us was an island called Oheteroa. About six in the evening we were within two or three leagues of it, upon which I shortened sail, and stood off and on all night. The next morning stood in for the land. We ran to leeward of the island, keeping close in shore, and saw several of the natives, though in no great numbers, upon the beach. At nine o'clock I sent Mr. Gore, one of my lieutenants, in the pinnace, to endeavour to land upon the island, and learn from the natives whether there was anchorage in a bay then in sight.
and what land lay farther to the southward. Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander accompanied Mr. Gore in this expedition, and as they thought Tupia might be useful, they took him with them. As the boat approached the shore, those on board perceived the natives to be armed with long lances, as they did not intend to land till they got round a point which runs out at a little distance. They stood along the coast, and the natives, therefore, very probably thought that they were afraid of them. They had now got together to the number of about sixty, and all of them sat down upon the shore except two, who were dispatched forward to observe the motions of those in the boat. These men, after walking abreast of her some time, at length leaped into the water and swam towards her, but were soon left behind. Two more then appeared, and attempted to board her in the same manner, but they also were soon left behind. A fifth man then ran forward alone, and having got a good way ahead of the boat before he took to the water, easily reached her. Mr. Banks urged the officer to take him in, thinking it a good opportunity to get the confidence and goodwill of a people, who then certainly looked upon them as enemies but he obstinately refused. This man, therefore, was left behind like the others, and so was the sixth who followed him. When the boat had got round the point, she perceived that all her followers had desisted from the pursuit. She now opened a large bay, at the bottom of which appeared another body of men, armed with long lances like the first. Here our people prepared to land, and pushed towards the shore, a canoe at the same time putting off to meet them. As soon as it came near them, they lay upon their oars, and calling out to them, told them that they were friends, and that if they would come up, they would give them nails, which were held up for them to see. After some hesitation, they came up to the boat's stern, and took some nails that were offered them with great seeming satisfaction. But in less than a minute they appeared to have formed a design of boarding the boat and making her their prize. Three of them suddenly leaped into it, and the others brought up the canoe, which the motion in quitting her had thrown off a little, manifestly with a design to follow their associates and support them in their attempt. The first that boarded the boat entered close to Mr. Banks, and instantly snatched his powder horn out of his pocket. Mr. Banks seized it, and with some difficulty wrenched it out of his hand, at the same time pressing against his breast, in order to force him overboard, but he was too strong for him, and kept his place. The officer then snapped his piece, but it missed fire upon which he ordered some of the people to fire over their heads. Two pieces were accordingly discharged, upon which they all instantly leaped into the water. One of the people, either from cowardice or cruelty or both, levelled a third piece at one of them as he was swimming away, and the ball grazed his forehead. Happily, however, the wound was very slight, for he recovered the canoe, and stood up in her as active and vigorous as the rest. The canoe immediately stood in for the shore, where a great number of people, not less than two hundred, were now assembled. The boat also pushed in, but found the land guarded all round with a shoal, upon which the sea broke with a considerable surf. It was therefore thought advisable by the officer to proceed along shore in search of a more convenient landing place. In the meantime, the people on board saw the canoe go on shore, and the natives gather eagerly round her to inquire the particulars of what had happened. Soon after, a single man ran along the shore, armed with his lance, and when he came abreast of the boat, he began to dance, brandish his weapon, and call out in a very shrill tone, which Tupia said was a defiance from the people. The boat continued to row along the shore, and the champion followed it, repeating his defiance by his voice and his gestures. 
but no better landing place being found than that where the canoe had put the natives on shore the officer turned back with a view to attempt it there hoping that if it should not be practicable the people would come to a conference either on the shoals or in their canoes and that a treaty of peace might be concluded with them as the boat rowed slowly along the shore back again another champion came down shouting defiance and brandishing his lance his appearance was more formidable than that of the other for he wore a large cap made of the tail feathers of the tropic bird and his body was covered with stripes of different coloured cloth yellow red and brown this gentleman also danced but with much more nimbleness and dexterity than the first our people therefore considering his agility and his dress distinguished him by the name of harlequin soon after a more grave and elderly man came down to the beach and hailing the people in the boat inquired who they were and from whence they came tupia answered in their own language from otaheite the three natives then walked peaceably along the shore till they came to a shoal upon which a few people were collected here they stopped and after a short conference they all began to pray very loud tupia made his responses but continued to tell us that they were not our friends when their prayer or as they call it their poor are was over our people entered into a parley with them telling them that if they would lay by their lances and clubs for some had one and some the other they would come on shore and trade with them for whatever they would bring they agreed but it was only upon condition that we would leave behind us our muskets this was a condition which however equitable it might appear could not be complied with nor indeed would it have put the two parties upon an equality except their numbers had been equal here then the negotiation seemed to be at an end but in a little time they ventured to come nearer to the boat and at last came near enough to trade which they did very fairly for a small quantity of their cloth and some of their weapons but as they gave our people no hope of provisions nor indeed anything else except they would venture through a narrow channel to the shore which all circumstances considered they did not think it prudent to do they put off the boat and left them with the ship and the boat we had now made the circuit of the island and finding that there was neither harbour nor anchorage about it and that the hostile disposition of the people would render landing impracticable without bloodshed i determined not to attempt it having no motive that could justify the risk of life the bay which the boat entered lies on the west side of the island the bottom was foul and rocky but the water so clear that it could plainly be seen at the depth of five and twenty fathom which is one hundred and fifty feet the island is situated in the latitude of twenty two degrees twenty seven minutes south and in the longitude of one fifty degrees forty seven minutes west from the meridian of greenwich it is thirteen miles in circuit and rather high than low but neither populous nor fertile in proportion to the other islands that we had seen in these seas the chief produce seems to be the tree of which they make their weapons called in their language etoa many plantations of it were seen along the shore which is not surrounded like the neighbouring islands by a reef the people seemed to be lusty and well made rather browner than those we had left under their armpits they had black marks about as broad as the hand the edges of which formed not a straight but an indented line they had also circles of the same colour but not so broad round their arms and legs but were not marked on any other part of the body their dress was very different from any that we had seen before as well as the cloth of which it was made the cloth was of the same materials as that which is worn in the other islands 
and most of that which was seen by our people was dyed of a bright but deep yellow and covered on the outside with a composition like varnish which was either red or of a dark lead colour over this ground it was again painted in stripes of many different patterns with wonderful regularity in the manner of our striped silks in england the cloth that was painted red was striped with black and that which was painted lead colour with white their habit was a short jacket of this cloth which reached about as low as their knees it was of one piece and had no other making than a hole in the middle of it stitched round with long stitches in which it differed from all that we had seen before through this hole the head was put and what hung down was confined to their bodies by a piece of yellow cloth or sash which passing round the neck behind was crossed upon the breast and then collected round the waist like a belt which passed over another belt of red cloth so that they made a very gay and warlike appearance some had caps of the feathers of the tropic bird which have been before described and some had a piece of white or lead-coloured cloth wound about the head like a small turban which our people thought more becoming their arms were long lances made of the atoa the wood of which is very hard they were well polished and sharpened at one end some were near twenty feet long though not more than three fingers thick they had also a weapon which was both club and pike made of the same wood about seven feet long this also was well polished and sharpened at one end into a broad point as a guard against these weapons when they attack each other they have mats folded up many times which they place under their clothes from the neck to the waist the weapons themselves indeed are capable of much less mischief than those of the same kind which we saw at the other islands for the lances were there pointed with the sharp bone of the stingray that is called the sting and the pikes were of much greater weight the other things that we saw here were all superior in their kind to any we had seen before the cloth was of a better colour in the dye and painted with greater neatness and taste the clubs were better cut and polished and the canoe though a small one was very rich in ornament and the carving was executed in a better manner among other decorations peculiar to this canoe was a line of small white feathers which hung from the head and stern on the outside and which when we saw them were thoroughly wetted by the spray tupia told us that there were several islands lying at different distances and in different directions from this between the south and the northwest and that at the distance of three days sail to the northeast there was an island called manua bird island he seemed however most desirous that we should sail to the westward and described several islands in that direction which he said he had visited he told us that he had been ten or twelve days in going thither and thirty in coming back and that the pahi in which he had made the voyage sailed much faster than the ship reckoning his pahi therefore to go at the rate of forty leagues a day which from my own observation i have great reason to think these boats will do it would make four hundred leagues in ten days which i compute to be the distance of boscoen and keppel's islands discovered by captain wallace westward of ulitia and therefore think it very probable that they were the islands he had visited the farthest island that he knew anything of to the southward he said lay at the distance of about two days sail from otoroa and was called mutu but he said that his father had told him there were islands to the southward of that upon the whole i was determined to stand southward in search of a continent but to spend no time in searching for islands 
if we did not happen to fall in with them during our course. End of section 24. Section 25 of The First Voyage of James Cook, Volume 1, by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 2, Chapter 1 The Passage from Otaroa to New Zealand Incidents which happened on going ashore there, and while the ship lay in Poverty Bay we sail from otaroa on the fifteenth of august and on friday the twenty fifth we celebrated the anniversary of our leaving england by taking a cheshire cheese from a locker where it had been carefully treasured up for this occasion and tapping a cask of porter which proved to be very good and in excellent order on the twenty ninth one of the sailors got so drunk that the next morning he died we thought at first that he could not have come honestly by the liquor, but we afterwards learnt that the boatswain, whose mate he was, had, in mere good nature, given him part of a bottle of rum. On the 30th we saw the comet. At one o'clock in the morning, it was a little above the horizon in the eastern part of the heavens. At about half an hour after four, it passed the meridian, and its tail subtended an angle of 42 degrees. Our latitude was 38 degrees 20 minutes south, our longitude by log 147 degrees 6 minutes west, and the variation of the needle by the azimuth 7 degrees 9 minutes east. Among others that observed the comet was Tupia, who instantly cried out, that as soon as it should be seen by the people of Bola Bola, they would kill the inhabitants of Ulitia, who would, with the utmost precipitation, fly to the mountains. On the 1st of September, being in the latitude of 40 degrees 22 minutes south, and longitude 147 degrees 29 minutes west, and there not being any signs of land, with a heavy sea from the westward and strong gales, I wore and stood back to the northward, fearing that we might receive such damage in our sails and rigging as would hinder the prosecution of the voyage. On the next day, there being strong gales to the westward, I brought to, with the ship's head to the northward. But in the morning of the third, the wind being more moderate, we loosened the reef of the mainsail, set the topsails, and plied to the westward. We continued our course till the 19th, when our latitude being 29 degrees and our longitude 159 degrees 29 minutes, we observed the variation to be 8 degrees 32 minutes east. On the 24th, being in latitude 33 degrees 18 minutes, longitude 162 degrees 51 minutes, we observed a small piece of seaweed and a piece of wood covered with barnacles. The variation here was 10 degrees 48 minutes east. On the 27th, being in latitude 28 degrees 59 minutes, longitude 169 degrees 5 minutes, we saw a seal asleep upon the water and several bunches of seaweed. The next day we saw more seaweed in bunches and, on the 29th, a bird, which we thought a land bird, it somewhat resembled a snipe, but it had a short bill. On the 1st of October, we saw birds innumerable and another seal asleep upon the water. It is a general opinion that seals never go out of soundings or far from land, but those that we saw in these seas prove the contrary. Rockweed is, however, a certain indication that land is not far distant. The next day, it being calm, we hoisted out the boat to try whether there was a current, but found none. Our latitude was 37 degrees 10 minutes, longitude 172 degrees 54 minutes west. 
On the 3rd, being in latitude 36 degrees 56 minutes, longitude 173 degrees 27 minutes, we took up more seaweed and another piece of wood covered with barnacles. The next day we saw two more seals and a brown bird about as big as a raven with some white feathers under the wing. Mr. Gore told us that birds of this kind were seen in great numbers about Falklands Islands and our people gave them the name of Port Egmont Hens. On the 5th we thought the water changed colour but upon casting the lead had no ground with 180 fathom. In the evening of this day, the variation was 12 degrees 50 minutes east, and while we were going nine leagues, it increased to 14 degrees two minutes. On the next day, Friday, October the 6th, we saw land from the masthead bearing west by north and stood directly for it. In the evening, it could just be discerned from the deck and appeared large. The variation this day was, by azimuth and amplitude, 15 degrees 4.5 minutes east, and by observation made of the sun and moon, the longitude of the ship appeared to be 180 degrees 55 minutes west, and by the medium of this and subsequent observations, there appeared to be an error in the ship's account of longitude during her run from Otaheite of 3 degrees 16 minutes she being so much to the westward of the longitude resulting from the log. At midnight I brought to and sounded, but had no ground with 170 fathom. On the 7th it fell calm. We therefore approached the land slowly, and in the afternoon, when a breeze sprung up, we were still distant seven or eight leagues. It appeared still larger as it was more distinctly seen, with four or five ranges of hills rising one over the other, and a chain of mountains above all, which appeared to be of an enormous height. This land became the subject of much eager conversation, but the general opinion seemed to be that we had found the terra australis incognita, about five o'clock we saw the opening of a bay, which seemed to run pretty far inland, upon which we hauled our wind and stood in for it. We also saw smoke ascending from different places on shore. When night came on, however, we kept playing off and on till daylight, when we found ourselves to the leeward of the bay, the wind being at north. We could now perceive that the hills were clothed with wood and that some of the trees in the valleys were very large. By noon we fetched in with a southwest point, but not being able to weather it, tacked and stood off. At this time we saw several canoes standing across the bay, which in a little time made to shore, without seeming to take the least notice of the ship. We also saw some houses, which appeared to be small but neat, and near one of them a considerable number of the people collected together, who were sitting upon the beach, and who, we thought, were the same that we had seen in the canoes. Upon a small peninsula at the northeast head, we could plainly perceive a pretty high and regular paling, which enclosed the whole top of a hill. This was also the subject of much speculation, some supposing it to be a park of deer, others an enclosure for oxen and sheep. About four o'clock in the afternoon, we anchored on the northwest side of the bay, before the entrance of a small river, in ten fathom water, with a fine sandy bottom, and at about half a league from the shore. The sides of the bay are white cliffs of a great height. The middle is low land, with hills gradually rising behind, one towering above another, and terminating in the chain of mountains, which appeared to be far inland. In the evening I went on shore, accompanied by Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander, with the pinnace and yawl and a party of men. We landed abreast of the ship, 
on the east side of the river, which was here about 40 yards broad. But seeing some natives on the west side whom I wished to speak with, and finding the river not fordable, I ordered the yawl in to carry us over, and left the pinnace at the entrance. When we came near the place where the people were assembled, they all ran away. However, we landed, and leaving four boys to take care of the yawl, we walked up to some huts, which were about two or three hundred yards from the waterside. When we had got some distance from the boat, four men, armed with long lances, rushed out of the woods, and running up to attack the boat, would certainly have cut her off, if the people in the pinnace had not discovered them, and called to the boys to drop down the stream. The boys instantly obeyed, but being closely pursued by the Indians, the coxswain of the pinnace, who had the charge of the boats, fired a musket over their heads. At this they stopped and looked round them, but in a few minutes renewed the pursuit, brandishing their lances in a threatening manner. The coxswain then fired a second musket over their heads, but of this they took no notice. And one of them lifting up his spear to dart it at the boat, another piece was fired, which shot him dead. When he fell, the other three stood motionless for some minutes, as if petrified with astonishment. As soon as they recovered, they went back, dragging after them the dead body, which, however, they soon left, that it might not encumber their flight. At the report of the first musket, we drew together, having straggled to a little distance from each other, and made the best of our way back to the boat, and crossing the river, we soon saw the Indian lying dead upon the ground. Upon examining the body, we found that he had been shot through the heart. He was a man of the middle size and stature. His complexion was brown, but not very dark, and one side of his face was tattooed in spiral lines of a very regular figure. He was covered with a fine cloth of a manufacture altogether new to us, and it was tied on exactly according to the representation in Valentin's account of Abel Tasman's voyage, volume 3, part 2, page 50. His hair also was tied in a knot on the top of his head, but had no feather in it. We returned immediately to the ship, where we could hear the people on shore talking with great earnestness, and in a very loud tone, probably about what had happened, and what should be done. In the morning we saw several of the natives where they had been seen the night before, and some walking with a quick pace towards the place where we had landed, most of them unarmed, but three or four with long pikes in their hands. As I was desirous to establish an intercourse with them, I ordered three boats to be manned with seamen and marines, and proceeded towards the shore, accompanied by Mr. Banks, Dr. Zollander, the other gentlemen, and to Pier. About fifty of them seemed to wait for our landing on the opposite side of the river, which we thought a sign of fear, and seated themselves upon the ground. At first, therefore, myself, with only Mr. Banks, Dr. Zollander, and to Pier, landed from the little boat and advanced towards them. But we had not proceeded many paces before they all started up, and every man produced either a long pike or a small weapon of green talc, extremely well polished, about a foot long, and thick enough to weigh four or five pounds. Tupia called to them in the language of Otaheite, but they answered only by flourishing their weapons and making signs to us to depart. A musket was then fired wide of them, and the ball struck the water, the river being still between us. They saw the effect and desisted from their threats, but we thought it prudent to retreat till the marines could be landed. This was soon done, and they marched, with a jack carried before them, to a little bank about fifty yards from the waterside. Here they were drawn up, and I again advanced, 
with Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander, to Pierre, Mr. Green and Mr. Monkhouse being with us. To Pierre was again directed to speak to them, and it was with great pleasure that we perceived that he was perfectly understood, he and the natives speaking only different dialects of the same language. He told them that we wanted provision and water, and would give them iron in exchange, the properties of which he explained as well as he was able. They were willing to trade and desired that we would come over to them for that purpose. To this we consented, provided they would lay by their arms, which, however, they could by no means be persuaded to do. During this conversation, Tupia warned us to be upon our guard, for that they were not our friends. We then pressed them in our turn to come over to us and at last one of them stripped himself and swam over without his arms. He was almost immediately followed by two more, and soon after by most of the rest, to the number of twenty or thirty, but these brought their arms with them. We made them all presents of iron and beads, but they seemed to set little value upon either, particularly the iron, not having the least idea of its use, so that we got nothing in return but a few feathers. They offered indeed to exchange their arms for ours, and when we refused, made many attempts to snatch them out of our hands. As soon as they came over, Tupia repeated his declaration that they were not our friends, and again warned us to be upon our guard. Their attempts to snatch our weapons, therefore, did not succeed, and we gave them to understand by Tupia that we should be obliged to kill them if they offered any farther violence. In a few minutes, however, Mr. Green happening to turn about, one of them snatched away his hanger, and retiring to a little distance, waved it round his head with a shout of exultation. The rest now began to be extremely insolent, and we saw more coming to join them from the opposite side of the river. It was therefore become necessary to repress them, and Mr. Banks fired at the man who had taken the hanger with small shot at the distance of about fifteen yards. When the shot struck him, he ceased his cry, but instead of returning the hanger, continued to flourish it over his head, at the same time slowly retreating to a greater distance. Mr. Monkhouse, seeing this, fired at him with ball, and he instantly dropped. Upon this, the main body, who had retired to a rock in the middle of the river upon the first discharge, began to return. Two that were near to the man who had been killed ran up to the body, one seized his weapon of green talc, and the other endeavoured to secure the hanger, which Mr. Monkhouse had but just time to prevent. As all that had retired to the rock were now advancing, three of us discharged our pieces, loaded only with small shot, upon which they swam back for the shore, and we perceived upon their landing that two or three of them were wounded, they retired slowly up the country, and we re-embarked in our boats. As we had unhappily experienced that nothing was to be done with these people at this place, and finding the water in the river to be salt, I proceeded in the boats round the head of the bay in search of fresh water, and with the design, if possible, to surprise some of the natives and take them on board, where, by kind treatment and presence, I might obtain their friendship, and by their means establish an amicable correspondence with their countrymen. To my great regret, I found no place where I could land, a dangerous surf everywhere beating upon the shore, but I saw two canoes coming in from the sea, one under sail and the other worked with paddles. I thought this a favourable opportunity to get some of the people into my possession without mischief, as those in the canoe were probably fishermen, and without arms, 
and I had three boats full of men. I therefore disposed the boats so as most effectually to intercept them in their way to the shore. The people in the canoe that was paddled perceived us so soon that, by making to the nearest land with their utmost strength, they escaped us. The other sailed on till she was in the midst of us without discerning what we were. But the moment she discovered us, the people on board struck their sail and took to their paddles, which they plied so briskly that she outran the boat. They were, however, within hearing, and Tupia called out to them to come alongside and promised for us that they should come to no harm. They chose, however, rather to trust to their paddles than our promises, and continued to make from us with all their power. I then ordered a musket to be fired over their heads, as the least exceptionable expedient to accomplish my design, hoping it would either make them surrender or leap into the water. Upon the discharge of the piece, they ceased paddling, and all of them, being seven in number, began to strip, as we imagined, to jump overboard. But it happened otherwise. They immediately formed a resolution not to fly but to fight, and when the boat came up, they began the attack with their paddles and with stones and other offensive weapons that were in the boat so vigorously that we were obliged to fire upon them in our own defence. Four were unhappily killed, and the other three, who were boys, the eldest about nineteen and the youngest about eleven, instantly leaped into the water. The eldest swam with great vigour and resisted the attempts of our people to take him into the boat by every effort that he could make. He was, however, at last overpowered, and the other two were taken up with less difficulty. I am conscious that the feeling of every reader of humanity will censor me for having fired upon these unhappy people, and it is impossible that, upon a calm review, I should approve it myself. They certainly did not deserve death for not choosing to confide in my promises or not consenting to come on board my boat, even if they had apprehended no danger. But the nature of my service required me to obtain a knowledge of their country, which I could not otherwise effect than by forcing my way into it in a hostile manner or gaining admission through the confidence and goodwill of the people. I had already tried the power of presence without effect, and I was now prompted by my desire to avoid further hostilities to get some of them on board as the only method left of convincing them that we intended them no harm and had it in our power to contribute to their gratification and convenience. Thus far my intentions certainly were not criminal, and though in the contest which I had not the least reason to expect, our victory might have been complete without so great an expense of life. Yet in such situations, when the command to fire has been given, no man can restrain its excess or prescribe its effect. As soon as the poor wretches whom we had taken out of the water were in the boat, they squatted down expecting, no doubt, instantly to be put to death. We made haste to convince them of the contrary by every method in our power. We furnished them with clothes and gave them every other testimony of kindness that could remove their fears and engage their good will. Those who are acquainted with human nature will not wonder that the sudden joy of these young savages at being unexpectedly delivered from the fear of death and kindly treated by those whom they supposed would have been their instant executioners surmounted their concern for the friends they had lost and was strongly expressed in their countenances and behaviour. Before we reached the ship, their suspicions and fears being wholly removed, they appeared to be not only reconciled to their situation, but in high spirits, and upon being offered some bread when they came on board, they devoured it with a voracious appetite. 
they answered and asked many questions with great appearance of pleasure and curiosity and when our dinner came they expressed an inclination to taste everything that they saw they seemed best pleased with the salt pork though we had other provisions upon the table at sunset they ate another meal with great eagerness each devouring a large quantity of bread and drinking above a quart of water we then made them beds upon the lockers and they went to sleep with great seeming content in the night however the tumult of their minds having subsided and given way to reflection they sighed often and loud to peer who was always upon the watch to comfort them got up and by soothing and encouragement made them not only easy but cheerful their cheerfulness was encouraged so that they sung a song with a degree of taste that surprised us the tune was solemn and slow like those of our psalms containing many notes and semitones their countenances were intelligent and expressive and the middlemost who seemed to be about fifteen had an openness in his aspect and an ease in his deportment which were very striking we found that the two eldest were brothers and that their names were taahuranga and koikaranga the name of the youngest was maragovete as we were returning to the ship after having taken these boys into the boat we picked up a large piece of pumice stone floating upon the water a sure sign that there either is or has been a volcano in this neighbourhood in the morning they all seemed to be cheerful and ate another enormous meal after this we dressed them and adorned them with bracelets anklets and necklaces after their own fashion and the boat being hoisted out they were told that we were going to set them ashore this produced a transport of joy but upon perceiving that we made towards our first landing place near the river their countenances changed and they entreated with great earnestness that they might not be set ashore at that place because they said it was inhabited by their enemies who would kill them and eat them this was a great disappointment to me because i hoped the report and appearance of the boys would procure a favourable reception for ourselves i had already sent an officer on shore with the marines and a party of men to cut wood and i was determined to land near the place not however to abandon the boys if when we got ashore they should be unwilling to leave us but to send a boat with them in the evening to that part of the bay to which they pointed and which they call their home mr banks dr zolander and tupia were with me and upon our landing with the boys and crossing the river they seemed at first to be unwilling to leave us but at length they suddenly changed their mind and though not without a manifest struggle and some tears they took their leave when they were gone we proceeded along a swamp with a design to shoot some ducks of which we saw great plenty and four of the marines attended us walking abreast of us upon a bank that overlooked the country after we had advanced about a mile these men called out to us and told us that a large body of the indians was in sight and advancing at a great rate upon receiving this intelligence we drew together and resolved to make the best of our way to the boats we had scarcely begun to put this into execution when the three indian boys started suddenly from some bushes where they had concealed themselves and again claimed our protection we readily received them and repairing to the beach as the clearest place we walked briskly towards the boats the indians were in two bodies one ran along the bank which had been quitted by the marines the other fetched a compass by the swamp so that we could not see them when they perceived that we had formed into one body they slackened their pace 
but still followed us in a gentle walk. That they slackened their pace was for us, as well as for them, a fortunate circumstance. For when we came to the side of the river, where we expected to find the boats that were to carry us over to the wooders, we found the pinnace at least a mile from her station, having been sent to pick up a bird which had been shot by the officer on shore, and the little boat was obliged to make three trips before we could all get over to the rest of the party. As soon as we were drawn up on the other side, the Indians came down, not in a body as we expected, but by two or three at a time, all armed and in a short time their number increased to about two hundred. As we now despaired of making peace with them, seeing that the dread of our small arms did not keep them at a distance, and that the ship was too far off to reach the place with a shot, we resolved to re-embark, lest our stay should embroil us in another quarrel, and cost more of the Indians their lives. We therefore advanced towards the pinnace, which was now returning, when one of the boys suddenly cried out that his uncle was among the people who had marched down to us, and desired us to stay and talk with them. We complied, and a parley immediately commenced between them and Tupia, during which the boys held up everything we had given them as tokens of our kindness and liberality but neither would either of the boys swim over to them, or any of them to the boys. The body of the man who had been killed the day before still lay exposed upon the beach. The boys, seeing it lie very near us, went up to it, and covered it with some of the clothes that we had given them, and soon after a single man, unarmed, who proved to be the uncle of Maragoveta, the youngest of the boys, swam over to us bringing in his hand a green branch which we supposed as well here as at otaheite to be an emblem of peace we received his branch by the hands of tupia to whom he gave it and made him many presents we also invited him to go on board the ship but he declined it we therefore left him and expected that his nephew and the two other young Indians would have stayed with him, but to our great surprise, they chose rather to go with us. As soon as we had retired, he went and gathered another green branch, and with this in his hand, he approached the dead body which the youth had covered with part of his clothes, walking sideways with many ceremonies, and then throwing it towards him. When this was done, he returned to his companions, who had sat down upon the sand to observe the issue of his negotiation. They immediately gathered round him, and continued in a body above an hour, without seeming to take any farther notice of us. We were more curious than they, and observing them with our glasses from on board the ship, we saw some of them cross the river upon a kind of raft or catamaran, and four of them carry off the dead body which had been covered by the boy, and over which his uncle had performed the ceremony of the branch, upon a kind of bier between four men. The other body was still suffered to remain where it had been first left. After dinner I directed to Pierre to ask the boys if they had now any objection to going ashore where we had left their uncle, the body having been carried off, which we understood was a ratification of peace. They said they had not, and the boat being ordered, they went into it with great alacrity. When the boat, in which I had sent two midshipmen, came to land, they went willingly ashore, but soon after she put off, they returned to the rocks, and wading into the water, earnestly entreated to be taken on board again but the people in the boat having positive orders to leave them could not comply we were very attentive to what happened on shore and keeping a constant watch with our glasses we saw a man pass the river upon another raft 
and fetched them to a place where forty or fifty of the natives were assembled, who closed round them, and continued in the same place till sunset. Upon looking again, when we saw them in motion, we could plainly distinguish our three prisoners, who separated themselves from the rest, came down to the beach, and having waved their hands three times towards the ship, ran nimbly back, and joined their companions, who walked leisurely away towards that part which the boys had pointed to as their dwelling place. We had therefore the greatest reason to believe that no mischief would happen to them, especially as we perceived that they went off in the clothes we had given them. After it was dark, loud voices were heard on shore in the bottom of the bay as usual, of which we could never learn the meaning. End of section 25section twenty six of the first voyage of james cook volume one by james cook this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter two part one a description of poverty bay and the face of the adjacent country the range from thence to cape turn again and back to Talaga, with some account of the people and the country, and several incidents that happened on that part of the coast. The next morning at six o'clock we weighed and stood away from this unfortunate and inhospitable place, to which I gave the name of Poverty Bay, and which by the natives is called Teoneroa, or Long Sand, as it did not afford us a single article that we wanted except a little wood. It lies in latitude 38 degrees 42 minutes south, and longitude 181 degrees 36 minutes west. It is in the form of a horseshoe, and is known by an island lying close under the northeast point. The two points which form the entrance are high, with steep white cliffs, and lie a league and a half or two leagues from each other northeast by east and southwest by west the depth of water in the bay is from twelve to five fathom with a sandy bottom and good anchorage but the situation is open to the wind between the south and east boats can go in and out of the river at any time of the tide in fine weather but as there is a bar at the entrance no boat can go either in or out when the sea runs high. The best place to attempt it is on the northeast side, and it is there practicable when it is not so in any other part. The shore of the bay, a little within its entrance, is a low flat sand, behind which, at a little distance, the face of the country is finely diversified by hills and valleys all clothed with wood and covered with verdure the country also appears to be well inhabited especially in the valleys leading up from the bay where we daily saw smoke rising in clouds one behind another to a great distance till the view terminated in mountains of a stupendous height the southwest point of the bay i named young nick's head after nicholas young the boy who first saw the land. At noon it bore northwest by west, distant about three or four leagues, and we were then about three miles from the shore. The mainland extended from northeast by north to south, and I proposed to follow the direction of the coast to the southward as far as the latitude of forty or forty one, and then, if I met with no encouragement to proceed farther, to return to the northward. In the afternoon we lay becalmed, which the people on shore perceiving, several canoes put off, and came within less than a quarter of a mile of the vessel, but could not be persuaded to come nearer, though Tupia exerted all the powers of his lungs and his eloquence upon the occasion, shouting and promising that they should not be hurt. 
Another canoe was now seen coming from Poverty Bay with only four people on board, one of whom we well remembered to have seen in our first interview upon the rock. This canoe, without stopping or taking the least notice of the others, came directly alongside of the ship, and with very little persuasion we got the Indians on board. Their example was soon followed by the rest, and we had about us seven canoes and about fifty men. We made them all presents with a liberal hand, notwithstanding which they were so desirous to have more of our commodities that they sold us everything they had, even the clothes from their backs and the paddles from their boats. There were but two weapons among them. These were the instruments of green talc, which were shaped somewhat like a pointed battle door with a short handle and sharp edges. They were called Patu Patu, and were well contrived for close fighting, as they would certainly split the thickest skull at a single blow. When these people had recovered from the first impressions of fear, which, notwithstanding their resolution in coming on board, had manifestly thrown them into some confusion, we inquired after our poor boys, the man who first came on board immediately answered that they were unhurt and at home, adding that he had been induced to venture on board by the account which they had given him of the kindness with which they had been treated and the wonders which were contained in the ship. While they were on board they showed every sign of friendship and invited us very cordially to go back to our old bay or to a small cove which they pointed out, that was not quite so far off. But I chose rather to prosecute my discoveries than go back, having reason to hope that I should find a better harbour than any I had yet seen. About an hour before sunset, the canoes put off from the ship with a few paddles they had reserved, which were scarcely sufficient to set them on shore but by some means or other three of their people were left behind. As soon as we discovered it, we hailed them, but not one of them would return to take them on board. This greatly surprised us, but we were surprised still more to observe that the deserted Indians did not seem at all uneasy at their situation, but entertained us with dancing and singing after their manner, ate their suppers, and went quietly to bed. A light breeze springing up soon after it was dark, we steered along the shore under an easy sail till midnight, and then brought to, soon after which it fell calm. We were now some leagues distant from the place where the canoes had left us, and at daybreak, when the Indians perceived it, they were seized with consternation and terror, and lamented their situation in loud complaints with gestures of despair and many tears. Tupia, with great difficulty, pacified them, and about seven o'clock in the morning, a light breeze springing up, we continued to stand southwest along the shore. Fortunately for our poor Indians, two canoes came off about this time and made towards the ship. They stopped, however, at a little distance, and seemed unwilling to trust themselves nearer. Our Indians were greatly agitated in this state of uncertainty, and urged their fellows to come alongside of the ship, both by their voice and gestures, with the utmost eagerness and impatience. Tupia interpreted what they said, and we were much surprised to find that, among other arguments, they assured the people in the canoes we did not eat men. We now began seriously to believe that this horrid custom prevailed among them, for what the boys had said we considered as a mere hyperbolical expression of their fear. One of the canoes at length ventured to come under the ship's side, and an old man came on board, who seemed to be a chief from the finery of his garment and the superiority of his weapon, which was a patu-patu, 
made of bone that, as he said, had belonged to a whale. He stayed on board but a short time, and when he went away he took with him our guests, very much to the satisfaction both of them and us. At the time when we sailed we were abreast of a point, from which the land trends south-southwest, and which on account of its figure I called Cape Table. This point lies seven leagues to the southward of Poverty Bay, in latitude 39 degrees 7 minutes south, and longitude 181 degrees 36 minutes west. It is of a considerable height, makes a sharp angle, and appears to be quite flat at the top. In steering along the shore to the southward of the Cape, at the distance of two or three miles, our soundings were from twenty to thirty fathom, having a chain of rocks between us and the shore, which appeared at different heights above the water. At noon, Cape Table bore north twenty degrees east, distant about four leagues, and a small island, which was the southernmost land in sight, or south 70 degrees west, at the distance of about three miles. This island, which the natives call Tia Haure, I named the island of Portland, from its very great resemblance to Portland in the English Channel. It lies about a mile from a point on the main, but there appears to be a ridge of rocks, extending nearly, if not quite, from one to the other. North 57 degrees east, two miles from the south point of Portland, lies a sunken rock, upon which the sea breaks with great violence. We passed between this rock and the land, having from 17 to 20 fathom. In sailing along the shore, we saw the natives assembled in great numbers, as well upon Portland Island as the main. We could also distinguish several spots of ground that were cultivated. Some seemed to be fresh turned up and lay in furrows like ploughed land, and some had plants upon them in different stages of their growth. We saw also in two places high rails upon the ridges of hills, like what we had seen upon the peninsula at the northeast head of Poverty Bay. As they were ranged in lines only, and not so as to enclose an area, we could not guess at their use, and therefore suppose they might be the work of superstition. About noon another canoe appeared, in which were four men. She came within about a quarter of a mile of us, where the people on board seemed to perform divers ceremonies. One of them who was in the bow, sometimes seemed to ask and to offer peace and sometimes to threaten war, by brandishing a weapon that he held in his hand. Sometimes also he danced, and sometimes he sung. Tapir talked much to him, but could not persuade him to come to the ship. Between one and two o'clock we discovered land to the westward of Portland, extending to the southward as far as we could see and as the ship was hauling round the south end of the island, she suddenly fell into shoal water and broken ground. We had indeed always seven fathom or more, but the soundings were never twice the same, jumping at once from seven fathom to eleven. In a short time, however, we got clear of all danger, and had again deep water under us. At this time the island lay within a mile of us, making in white cliffs, and the long spit of low land running from it towards the main. On the sides of these cliffs sat vast numbers of people, looking at us with a fixed attention, and it is probable that they perceived some appearance of hurry and confusion on board, and some irregularity in the working of the ship, while we were getting clear of the shallow water and broken ground, from which they might infer that we were alarmed or in distress. We thought that they wished to take advantage of our situation, for five canoes were put off with the utmost expedition, full of men and well armed. 
they came so near and showed so hostile a disposition by shouting brandishing their lances and using threatening gestures that we were in some pain for our small boat which was still employed in sounding a musket was therefore fired over them but finding it did them no harm they seemed rather to be provoked than intimidated and i therefore fired a four-pounder charged with grape-shot wide of them this had a better effect upon the report of the piece they all rose up and shouted but instead of continuing the chase drew all together and after a short consultation went quietly away having got round portland we hauled in for the land northwest having a gentle breeze at northeast which about five o'clock died away and obliged us to anchor we had one and twenty fathom with a fine sandy bottom the south point of portland bore southeast a half south distant about two leagues and a low point on the main bore north a half east in the same direction with this low point there runs a deep bay behind the land of which cape table is the extremity so as to make this land a peninsula leaving only a low narrow neck between that and the main of this peninsula which the natives call terracaco cape table is the north point and portland the south while we lay at anchor two more canoes came off to us one armed and the other a small fishing boat with only four men in her they came so near that they entered into conversation with tupia they answered all the questions that he asked them with great civility but could not be persuaded to come on board they came near enough however to receive several presents that were thrown to them from the ship with which they seemed much pleased and went away during the night many fires were kept upon shore probably to show us that the inhabitants were too much upon their guard to be surprised about five o'clock in the morning of the thirteenth a breeze springing up northerly we weighed and steered in for the land the shore here forms a large bay of which portland is the northeast point and the bay that runs behind cape table an arm this arm i had a great inclination to examine because there appeared to be safe anchorage in it but not being sure of that and the wind being right on end i was unwilling to spare the time four and twenty fathom was the greatest depth within portland but the ground was everywhere clear the land near the shore is of a moderate height with white cliffs and sandy beaches within it rises into mountains and upon the whole the surface is hilly for the most part covered with wood and to appearance pleasant and fertile in the morning nine canoes came after the ship but whether with peaceable or hostile intentions we could not tell for we soon left them behind us in the evening we stood in for a place that had the appearance of an opening but found no harbour we therefore stood out again and were soon followed by a large canoe with eighteen or twenty men all armed who though they could not reach us shouted defiance and brandished their weapons with many gestures of menace and insult in the morning we had a view of the mountains inland upon which the snow was still lying the country near the shore was low and unfit for culture but in one place we perceived a patch of something yellow which had greatly the appearance of a cornfield yet was probably nothing more than some dead flags which are not uncommon in swampy places at some distance we saw groves of trees which appeared high and tapering and being not above two leagues from the southwest end of the great bay in which we had been coasting for the last two days i hoisted out the pinnace and longboat to search for fresh water but just as they were about to put off 
we saw several boats full of people coming from the shore, and therefore I did not think it safe for them to leave the ship. About ten o'clock, five of these boats having drawn together as if to hold a consultation, made towards the ship, having on board between eighty and ninety men, and four more followed at some distance, as if to sustain the attack. When the first five came within about a hundred yards of the ship, they began to sing their war song, and brandishing their pikes, prepared for an engagement. We had now no time to lose, for if we could not prevent the attack, we should come under the unhappy necessity of using our firearms against them, which we were very desirous to avoid. Tupia was therefore ordered to acquaint them that we had weapons which, like thunder, would destroy them in a moment, that we would immediately convince them of their power by directing their effect so that they should not be hurt, but that if they persisted in any hostile attempt, we should be obliged to use them for our defence. A four-pounder loaded with grape-shot was then discharged wide of them, which produced the desired effect. The report, the flash, and above all the shot, which spread very far in the water, so intimidated them that they began to paddle away with all their might. Tupia, however, calling after them and assuring them that if they would come unarmed, they should be kindly received. The people in one of the boats put their arms on board of another, and came under the ship's stern. We made them several presents, and should certainly have prevailed upon them to come on board, if the other canoes had not come up, and again threatened us, by shouting and brandishing their weapons. At this, the people who had come to the ship unarmed, expressed great displeasure, and soon after they all went away. In the afternoon we stood over to the south point of the bay, but not reaching it before it was dark, we stood off and on all night. At eight the next morning, being abreast of the point, several fishing boats came off to us, and sold us some stinking fish. It was the best they had, and we were willing to trade with them upon any terms. These people behaved very well, and we should have parted good friends, if it had not been for a large canoe, with two and twenty armed men on board, which came boldly up alongside of the ship. We soon saw that this boat had nothing for traffic, yet we gave them two or three pieces of cloth, an article which they seemed very fond of. I observed that one man had a black skin thrown over him, somewhat resembling that of a bear, and being desirous to know what animal was its first owner, I offered him for it a piece of red baize, and he seemed greatly pleased with the bargain, immediately pulling off the skin and holding it up in the boat. He would not, however, part with it till he had the cloth in his possession, and as there could be no transfer of property, if with equal caution I had insisted upon the same condition, I ordered the cloth to be handed down to him, upon which, with amazing coolness, instead of sending up the skin, he began to pack up both that and the bays, which he had received as the purchase of it, in a basket, without paying the least regard to my demand or remonstrances, and soon after, with the fishing boats, put off from the ship. When they were at some distance, they drew together, and after a short consultation returned. The fishermen offered more fish, which, though good for nothing, was purchased, and trade was again renewed. Among others who were placed over the ship's side to hand up what we bought was little Tayeto, to Pierre's boy, and one of the Indians, watching his opportunity, suddenly seized him and dragged him down into the canoe. Two of them held him down in the forepart of it, and the others with great activity paddled her off, the rest of the canoes following as fast as they could. 
Upon this, the Marines, who were under arms upon deck, were ordered to fire. The shot was directed to that part of the canoe, which was farthest from the buoy, and rather wide of her, being willing rather to miss the rowers than to hurt him. It happened, however, that one man dropped, upon which the others quitted their hold of the boy, who instantly leaped into the water and swam towards the ship. The large canoe immediately pulled round and followed him, but some muskets and a great gun being fired at her, she desisted from the pursuit. The ship being brought to, a boat was lowered, and the poor boy taken up unhurt, though so terrified that for a time he seemed to be deprived of his senses. Some of the gentlemen who traced the canoes to shore with their glasses said that they saw three men carried up the beach, who appeared to be either dead or wholly disabled by their wounds. To the cape off which this unhappy transaction happened, I gave the name of Cape Kidnappers. It lies in latitude 39 degrees 43 minutes and longitude 182 degrees 24 minutes west and is rendered remarkable by two white rocks like haystacks and the high white cliffs on each side. It lies southwest by west distant 13 leagues from the Isle of Portland and between them is the bay of which it is the south point and which in honour of Sir Edward Hawke, then First Lord of the Admiralty, I called Hawke's Bay. We found in it from 24 to 7 fathom and good anchorage. From Cape Kidnappers, the land trends south-southwest, and in this direction we made our run along the shore, keeping at about a league distance, with the steady breeze and clear weather. As soon as Teto recovered from his fright, he brought a fish to Tapir and told him that he intended it as an offering to his Iatua, or God, in gratitude for his escape. Tupia commended his piety and ordered him to throw the fish into the sea, which was accordingly done. About two o'clock in the afternoon, we passed a small but high white island lying close to the shore, upon which we saw many houses, boats, and people. The people we concluded to be fishers, because the island was totally barren. We saw several people also on shore, in a small bay upon the main within the island. At eleven we brought to till daylight, and then made sail to the southward along the shore. About seven o'clock we passed a high point of land which lies south-southwest twelve leagues from Cape Kidnappers. From this point the land trends three-fourths of a point more to the westward. At ten we saw more land open to the southward, and at noon the southernmost land that was in sight bore south thirty-nine degrees west, distant eight or ten leagues and a high bluff head with yellowish cliffs bore west distant about two miles. The depth of water was thirty-two fathom. In the afternoon we had a fresh breeze at west, and during the night variable light airs and calms. In the morning a gentle breeze sprung up between the northwest and northeast, and having till now stood to the southward, without seeing any probability of meeting with the harbour, and the country manifestly altering for the worse, I thought that standing farther in that direction would be attended with no advantage, but on the contrary would be a loss of time that might be employed with a better prospect of success in examining the coast to the northward. About one, therefore, in the afternoon, I tacked and stood north with a fresh breeze at west. The high bluff head with yellowish cliffs, which we were abreast of at noon, I called Cape Turnagain, because here we turned back. It lies in latitude 40 degrees 34 minutes south 
longitude 182 degrees 55 minutes west, distant 18 leagues south-southwest and south-southwest to half-west from Cape Kidnappers. The land between them is of a very unequal height. In some places it is lofty next the sea with white cliffs, in others low with sandy beaches. The face of the country is not so well clothed with wood as it is about Hawke's Bay, but looks more like our high downs in England. It is, however, to all appearances well inhabited, for as we stood along the shore, we saw several villages, not only in the valleys, but on the tops and sides of the hills, and smoke in many other places. The ridge of mountains which has been mentioned before extends to the southward farther than we could see, and was then everywhere checkered with snow. At night we saw two fires inland, so very large that we concluded they must have been made to clear the land for tillage, but however that may be, they are a demonstration that the part of the country where they appeared is inhabited. On the 18th at 4 o'clock in the morning, Cape Kidnappers bore north 32 degrees west, distant 2 leagues. In this situation we had 62 fathom, and when the Cape bore west by north, distant 3 or 4 leagues, we had 45 fathom. In the midway between the Isle of Portland and the Cape, we had 65 fathom. In the evening, being abreast of the peninsula within Portland Island, called Terracaco, a canoe came off from that shore and with much difficulty overtook the ship. There were on board five people, two of whom appeared to be chiefs and the other three servants. The chiefs, with very little invitation, came on board and ordered the rest to remain in their canoe. We treated them with great kindness, and they were not backward in expressing their satisfaction. They went down into the cabin, and after a short while told us that they had determined not to go on shore till the next morning. As the sleeping on board was an honour which we neither expected nor desired, I remonstrated strongly against it, and told them that on their account it would not be proper as the ship would probably be at a great distance from where she was then the next morning. They persisted, however, in their resolution, and as I found it impossible to get rid of them without turning them by force out of the ship, I complied. As a proper precaution, however, I proposed to take their servants also on board and hoist their canoe into the ship. They made no objection, and this was accordingly done. The countenance of one of these chiefs was the most open and ingenuous of all I have ever seen, and I very soon gave up every suspicion of his having any sinister design. They both examined everything they saw with great curiosity and attention, and received very thankfully such little presents as we made them. Neither of them, however, could be persuaded either to eat or drink, but their servants devoured everything they could get with great veracity. We found that these men had heard of our kindness and liberality to the natives who had been on board before, yet we thought the confidence they placed in us an extraordinary instance of their fortitude. At night I brought two till daylight, and then made sail. At seven in the morning I brought to again under Cape Table, and sent away our guests with their canoe, who expressed some surprise at seeing themselves so far from home, but landed abreast of the ship. At this time I saw other canoes putting off from the shore, but I stood away to the northward without waiting for their coming up. End of section 26section twenty seven of the first voyage of james cook volume one by james cook 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter Two, Part Two A Description of Poverty Bay and the Face of the Adjacent Country. The range from thence to Cape Turnagain and back to Talaga, with some account of the people and the country, and several incidents that happened on that part of the coast, continued. About three I passed a remarkable headland, which I called Gable End Foreland, from the very great lightness of the white cliff at the point to the gable end of a house it is not more remarkable for its figure than for a rock which rises like a spire at a little distance it lies from cape table north twenty four degrees east distant about twelve leagues the shore between them forms a bay within which lies poverty bay at the distance of four leagues from the headland and eight from the cape at this place three canoes came off to us and one man came on board we gave him some trifles and he soon returned to his boat which with all the rest dropped astern in the morning i made sail inshore in order to look into two bays which appeared about two leagues to the northward of the foreland the southernmost i could not fetch but i anchored in the other about eleven o'clock into this bay we were invited by the people on board many canoes who pointed to a place where they said there was plenty of fresh water i did not find so good a shelter from the sea as i expected but the natives who came about us appearing to be of a friendly disposition I was determined to try whether I could not get some knowledge of the country here before I proceeded farther to the northward. In one of the canoes that came about us as soon as we anchored, we saw two men, who by their habits appeared to be chiefs. One of them was dressed in a jacket, which was ornamented after their manner with dog skin. The jacket of the other was almost covered with small tufts of red feathers. These men I invited on board, and they entered the ship with very little hesitation. I gave each of them about four yards of linen and a spike nail. With the linen they were much pleased, but seemed to set no value upon the nail. We perceived that they knew what had happened in Poverty Bay and we had therefore no reason to doubt but that they would behave peaceably. However, for further security, Tupia was ordered to tell them for what purpose we came thither, and to assure them that we would offer them no injury, if they offered none to us. In the meantime, those who remained in the canoes traded with our people very fairly for what they happened to have with them, the chiefs who were old men stayed with us till we had dined and about two o'clock i put off with the boats manned and armed in order to go on shore in search of water and the two chiefs went into the boat with me the afternoon was tempestuous with much rain and the surf everywhere ran so high that although we rode almost round the bay we found no place where we could land I determined, therefore, to return to the ship, which, being intimated to the chiefs, they called to the people on shore, and ordered a canoe to be sent off for themselves. This was accordingly done, and they left us, promising to come on board again in the morning, and bring us some fish and sweet potatoes. In the evening, the weather having become fair and moderate, the boats were again ordered out, and I landed, accompanied by Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander. We were received with great expressions of friendship by the natives, who behaved with a scrupulous attention not to give offence. In particular, 
they took care not to appear in great bodies. One family, or the inhabitants of two or three houses only, were generally placed together, to the number of fifteen or twenty, consisting of men, women, and children. These little companies sat upon the ground, not advancing towards us, but inviting us to them by a kind of beckon, moving one hand towards the breast. We made them several little presents, and in our walk round the bay found two small streams of fresh water. This convenience, and the friendly behaviour of the people, determined me to stay at least a day, that I might fill some of my empty casks, and give Mr. Banks an opportunity of examining the natural produce of the country. In the morning of the 21st, I sent Lieutenant Gore on shore to superintend the watering with a strong party of men, and they were soon followed by Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander with Tupia, Tayeto, and four others. The natives sat by our people and seemed pleased to observe them, but did not intermix with them. They traded, however, chiefly for cloth, and after a short time applied to their ordinary occupations, as if no stranger had been among them. In the forenoon several of their boats went out a-fishing, and at dinner-time every one repaired to his respective dwelling, from which, after a certain time, he returned. These fair appearances encouraged Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander to range the bay with very little precaution, where they found many plants and shot some birds of exquisite beauty. In their walk they visited several houses of the natives and saw something of their manner of life, for they showed, without any reserve, everything which the gentlemen desired to see. They were sometimes found at their meals, which the approach of the strangers never interrupted. Their food at this season consisted of fish, with which, instead of bread, they eat the root of a kind of fern, very like that which grows upon our commons in England. These roots they scorch over the fire, and then beat with a stick, till the bark and dry outside fall off. What remains is a soft substance, somewhat clammy and sweet, not unpleasing to the taste, but mixed with three or four times its quantity of strings and fibres, which are very disagreeable. These were swallowed by some, but spit out by the far greater number, who had baskets under them to receive the rejected part of what had been chewed, which had an appearance very like that of tobacco in the same state. In other seasons they have certainly plenty of excellent vegetables, but no tame animals were seen among them except dogs, which were very small and ugly. Mr. Banks saw some of their plantations, where the ground was as well broken down and tilled as even in the gardens of the most curious people among us. In these spots were sweet potatoes, cocos or edders, which are well known and much esteemed, both in the East and West Indies, and some gourds. The sweet potatoes were planted in small hills, some ranged in rows and others in quincunx, all laid by a line with the greatest regularity. The cocos were planted upon flat land, but none of them yet appeared above ground, and the gourds were set in small hollows or dishes, much as in England. These plantations were of different extent, from one or two acres to ten, taken together there appeared to be from 150 to 200 acres in cultivation in the whole bay, though we never saw a hundred people. Each district was fenced in, generally with reeds, which were placed so close together that there was scarcely room for a mouse to creep between. The women were plain and made themselves more so by painting their faces with red ochre and oil, 
which, being generally fresh and wet upon their cheeks and foreheads, was easily transferred to the noses of those who thought fit to salute them, and that they were not wholly averse to such familiarity, the noses of several of our people strongly testified. They were, however, as great coquettes as any of the most fashionable ladies in Europe, and the young ones as skittish as an unbroken filly. Each of them wore a petticoat, under which there was a girdle, made of the blades of grass highly perfumed, and to the girdle was fastened a small bunch of the leaves of some fragrant plant, which served their modesty as its innermost veil. The faces of the men were not so generally painted, yet we saw one whose whole body, and even his garments, were rubbed over with dry ochre, of which he kept a piece constantly in his hand, and was every minute renewing the decoration in one part or another, where he supposed it was become deficient. In personal delicacy, they were not equal to our friends at Otaheite, for the coldness of the climate did not invite them so often to bathe. But we saw among them one instance of cleanliness in which they exceeded them, and of which perhaps there is no example in any other Indian nation. Every house or every little cluster of three or four houses was furnished with a privy, so that the ground was everywhere clean. The offals of their food and other litter were also piled up in regular dunghills, which probably they made use of at a proper time for manure. In this decent article of civil economy, they were beforehand with one of the most considerable nations of Europe, for I am credibly informed that, till the year 1760, there was no such thing as a privy in Madrid, the metropolis of Spain, though it is plentifully supplied with water. Before that time, it was the universal practice to throw the orger out of the windows, during the night, into the street, where numbers of men were employed to remove it, with shovels, from the upper parts of the city to the lower, where it lay till it was dry, and was then carried away in carts, and deposited without the gates. His present Catholic Majesty, having determined to free his capital from so gross a nuisance, ordered by proclamation that the proprietor of every house should build a privy, and that sinks, drains, and common sewers should be made at the public expense. The Spaniards, though long accustomed to an arbitrary government, resented this proclamation with great spirit as an infringement of the common rights of mankind, and made a vigorous struggle against its being carried into execution. Every class devised some objection against it, but the physicians bid the fairest to interest the king in the preservation of the ancient privileges of his people, for they remonstrated that if the filth was not, as usual, thrown into the streets, a fatal sickness would probably ensue, because the putrescent particles of the air, which such filth attracted, would then be imbibed by the human body. But this expedient, with every other that could be thought of, proved unsuccessful and the popular discontent then ran so high that it was very near producing an insurrection. His Majesty, however, at length prevailed, and Madrid is now as clear as most of the considerable cities in Europe. But many of the citizens, probably upon the principles advanced by their physicians, that heaps of filth prevent deleterious particles of air from fixing upon neighbouring substances, have, to keep their food wholesome, constructed their privies by the kitchen fire. In the evening, all of our boats being employed in carrying the water on board, and Mr. Banks and his company finding it probable that they should be left on shore after it was dark, 
by which much time would be lost, which they were impatient to employ in putting the plants they had gathered in order, they applied to the Indians for a passage in one of their canoes. They immediately consented, and a canoe was launched for their use. They all went on board, being eight in number, but not being used to a vessel that required so even a balance. They unfortunately overset her in the surf. No life, however, was lost, but it was thought advisable that half of them should wait for another turn. Mr. Banks, Dr. Zolander, Tupia, and Tayeto embarked again, and without any further accident arrived safely at the ship, well pleased with the good nature of their Indian friends, who cheerfully undertook to carry them a second time, after having experienced how unfit a freight they were for such a vessel. While these gentlemen were on shore, several of the natives went off to the ship, and trafficked by exchanging their cloth for that of Otaheite. Of this barter, they were for some time very fond, preferring the Indian cloth to that of Europe, but before night it decreased in its value 500%. Many of these Indians I took on board and showed them the ship and her apparatus, at which they expressed equal satisfaction and astonishment. As I found it exceedingly difficult to get water on board on account of the surf, I determined to stay no longer at this place. On the next morning, therefore, about five o'clock, I weighed anchor and put to sea. This bay, which is called by the natives Tegadu, lies in the latitude of 38 degrees 10 minutes south, but as it has nothing to recommend it, a description of it is unnecessary. From this bay I intended to stand on to the northward, but the wind being right against me I could make no way. While I was beating about to windward, some of the natives came on board and told me that in a bay which lay a little to the southward, being the same that I could not fetch the day I put into Tegadu, there was excellent water where the boats might land without a surf. I thought it better, therefore, to put into this bay, where I might complete my water and form farther connections with the Indians than to keep the sea. With this view I bore up for it and sent in two boats, manned and armed, to examine the watering place, who, confirming the report of the Indians at their return, I came to an anchor about one o'clock in eleven fathom water with a fine sandy bottom, the north point of the bay north by east and the south point south east. The watering place, which was in a small cove a little within the south point of the bay, bore south by east, distant about a mile. Many canoes came immediately off from the shore and all traded very honestly for Otaheite cloth and glass bottles, of which they were immoderately fond. In the afternoon of the 23rd, as soon as the ship was moored, I went on shore to examine the watering place, accompanied by Mr. Banks and Dr. Zolander. The boat landed in the cove without the least surf, the water was excellent and conveniently situated. There was plenty of wood close to high water mark, and the disposition of the people was in every respect such as we could wish. Having, with Mr. Green, taken several observations of the sun and moon, the mean result of them gave 180 degrees 47 minutes west longitude, but as all the observations made before exceeded these, I have laid down the coast from the mean of the whole. At noon, I took the sun's meridian altitude with an astronomical quadrant, which was set up at the watering place, and found the latitude to be 38 degrees, 22 minutes, 24 seconds. On the 24th, early in the morning, I sent Lieutenant Gore on shore, 
to superintend the cutting of wood and filling of water with a sufficient number of men for both purposes and all the marines as a guard after breakfast i went on shore myself and continued there the whole day mr banks and dr zollander also went on shore to gather plants and in their walks saw several things worthy of notice they met with many houses in the valleys that seemed to be wholly deserted the people living on the ridges of the hills in a kind of sheds very slightly built as they were advancing in one of these valleys the hills on each side of which were very steep they were suddenly struck with the sight of a very extraordinary natural curiosity it was a rock perforated through its whole substance so as to form a rude but stupendous arch or cavern opening directly to the sea this aperture was seventy-five feet long twenty-seven broad and five and forty high commanding a view of the bay and the hills on the other side which was seen through it and opening at once upon the view produced an effect far superior to any of the contrivances of art as they were returning to the watering place in the evening they met an old man who detained them some time by showing them the military exercises of the country with the lance and patu patu which are all the weapons in use the lance is from ten to fourteen feet long made of a very hard wood and sharp at both ends the patu patu has been described already it is about a foot long made of talc or bone with sharp edges and used as a battle-axe a post or stake was set up as his enemy to which he advanced with a most furious aspect brandishing his lance which he grasped with great firmness when it was supposed to have been pierced by his lance he ran at it with his patu patu and falling upon the upper end of it which was to represent his adversary's head he laid on with great vehemence striking many blows any one of which would probably have split the skull of an ox from our champions falling upon his mock enemy with the patu patu after he was supposed to have been pierced with the lance our gentlemen inferred that in the battles of this country there is no quarter this afternoon we set up the armourer's forge to repair the braces of the tiller which had been broken and went on getting our wood and water without suffering the least molestation from the natives who came down with different sorts of fish which we purchased with cloth beads and glass bottles as usual on the twenty fifth mr banks and dr zollander went again on shore and while they were searching for plants tupia stayed with the waters among other indians who came down to them was a priest with whom tupia entered into a very learned conversation in their notions of religion they seem to agree very well which is not often the case between learned divines on our side of the ocean tupia however seemed to have the most knowledge and he was listened to with great deference and attention by the other in the course of this conversation after the important points of divinity had been settled tupia inquired if it was their practice to eat men to which they answered in the affirmative but said that they ate only their enemies who were slain in battle on the twenty sixth it rained all day so that none of us could go ashore and very few of the indians came either to the watering place or the ship on the twenty seventh i went with dr zollander to examine the bottom of the bay but though we went ashore at two places we met with little worth notice the people behaved very civilly showing us everything that we expressed a desire to see among other trifling curiosities which dr zollander purchased of them 
was a boy's top shaped exactly like those which children play with in england and they made signs that to make it spin it was to be whipped mr banks in the meantime went ashore at the watering place and climbed a hill which stood at a little distance to see a fence of poles which we had observed from the ship and which had been much the subject of speculation the hill was extremely steep and rendered almost inaccessible by wood yet he reached the place near which he found many houses that for some reason had been deserted by their inhabitants the poles appeared to be about sixteen feet high they were placed in two rows with a space of about six feet between them and the poles in each row were about ten feet distant from each other the lane between them was covered by sticks that were set up sloping towards each other from the top of the poles on each side like the roof of a house this rail work with a ditch that was parallel to it was carried about a hundred yards down the hill in a kind of curve but for what purpose we could not guess the indians at the watering place at our request entertained us with their war song in which the women joined with the most horrid distortions of countenance rolling their eyes thrusting out their tongues and often heaving loud and deep sighs though all was done in very good time on the twenty eighth we went ashore upon an island that lies to the left hand of the entrance of the bay where we saw the largest canoe that we had yet met with she was sixty-eight feet and a half long five broad and three feet six high she had a sharp bottom consisting of three trunks of trees hollowed of which that in the middle was the longest the side planks were sixty-two feet long in one piece and were not despicably carved in bas-relief the head also was adorned with carving still more richly upon this island there was a larger house than any we had yet seen but it seemed unfinished and was full of chips the woodwork was squared so even and smooth that we made no doubt of their having among them very sharp tools the sides of the posts were carved in a masterly style though after their whimsical taste which seems to prefer spiral lines and distorted faces as these carved posts appear to have been brought from some other place such work is probably of great value among them at four o'clock in the morning of the twenty ninth having got on board our wooden water and a large supply of excellent celery with which the country abounds and which proved a powerful antiscorbutic i unmoored and put to sea this bay is called by the natives talaga it is moderately large and has from seven to thirteen fathom with a clean sandy bottom and good anchorage and is sheltered from all winds except the northeast it lies in latitude thirty eight degrees twenty two minutes south and four leagues and a half to the north of gable end fallen on the south point lies a small but high island so near the main as not to be distinguished from it close to the north end of the island at the entrance into the bay are two high rocks one is round like a corn stack but the other is lung and perforated in several places so that the openings appear like the arches of a bridge within these rocks is the cove where we cut wood and filled our water casks off the north point of the bay is a pretty high rocky island and about a mile without it are some rocks and breakers the variation of the compass here is fourteen degrees thirty one minutes east and the tide flows at the full and change of the moon about six o'clock and rises and falls perpendicularly from five to six feet whether the flood comes from the southward or the northward i have not been able to determine 
We got nothing here by traffic but a few fish and some sweet potatoes, except a few trifles, which we considered merely as curiosities. We saw no four-footed animals, nor the appearance of any, either tame or wild, except dogs and rats, and these were very scarce. The people eat the dogs like our friends at Otaheite, and adorn their garments with the skins, as we do ours with fur and ermine. I climbed many of the hills, hoping to get a view of the country, but I could see nothing from the top except higher hills in a boundless succession. The ridges of these hills produce little besides fern, but the sides are most luxuriantly clothed with wood and verdure of various kinds, with little plantations intermixed. In the woods we found trees of above twenty different sorts and carried specimens of each on board, but there was nobody among us to whom they were not altogether unknown. The tree which we cut for firing was somewhat like our maple and yielded a whitish gum. We found another sort of it of a deep yellow, which we thought might be useful in dyeing. We found also one cabbage tree, which we cut down for the cabbages. The country abounds with plants and the woods with birds in an endless variety, exquisitely beautiful and of which none of us had the least knowledge. The soil both of the hills and valleys is light and sandy, and very fit for the production of all kinds of roots, though we saw none except sweet potatoes and yams. End of section 27《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》
having at this time a fresh gale at south south east and squally but it soon became moderate and at two in the morning we made sail again to the south-west as the land now trended and at eight o'clock in the morning saw land which made like an island bearing west the south-westernmost part of the main bearing south-west and about nine no less than five canoes came off in which were more than forty men all armed with their country pikes and battle-axes shouting and threatening an attack this gave us great uneasiness and was indeed what we did not expect for we hoped that the report both of our power and clemency had spread to a greater extent when one of these canoes had almost reached the ship another of an immense size the largest we had yet seen crowded with people who were also armed put off from the shore and came up at a great rate as it approached it received signals from the canoe that was nearest to the ship and we could see that it had sixteen paddles on a side beside people that sat and others that stood in a row from stem to stern being in all about sixty men as they made directly to the ship we were desirous of preventing an attack by showing what we could do and therefore fired a gun loaded with grape shot ahead of them this made them stop but not retreat a round shot was then fired over them and upon seeing it fall they seized their paddles and made towards the shore with such precipitation that they seemed scarcely to allow themselves time to breathe in the evening three or four more canoes came off unarmed but they would not venture within a musket shot of the vessel the cape off which we had been threatened with hostilities i called from the hasty retreat of the enemy cape runaway it lies in latitude thirty seven degrees thirty two minutes longitude one eighty one degrees forty eight minutes in this day's run we found that the land which made like an island in the morning bearing west was so and we gave it the name of white island at daybreak on the first of november we counted no less than five and forty canoes that were coming from the shore towards the ship seven of them came up with us and after some conversation with tupia sold us some lobsters and mussels and two conga eels these people traded pretty fairly but when they were gone some others came off from another place who began also to trade fairly but after some time they took what was handed down to them without making any return one of them who had done so upon being threatened began to laugh and with many marks of derision set us at defiance at the same time putting off the canoe from the ship a musket was then fired over his head which brought him back in a more serious mood and trade went on with great regularity at length when the cabin and gun-room had got as much as they wanted the men were allowed to come to the gangway and trade for themselves unhappily the same care was not taken to prevent frauds as had been taken before so that the indians finding that they could cheat with impunity grew insolent again and proceeded to take greater liberties one of the canoes having sold everything on board pulled forward and the people that were in her seeing some linen hang over the ship's side to dry one of them without any ceremony untied it and put it up in his bundle he was immediately called to and required to return it instead of which he let his canoe drop astern and laughed at us a musket was fired over his head which did not put a stop to his mirth another was then fired at him with small shot which struck him upon the back he shrunk a little when the shot hit him 
but did not regard it more than one of our men would have done the stroke of a rattan. He continued with great composure to pack up the linen that he had stolen. All the canoes now dropped astern about a hundred yards, and all set up their song of defiance, which they continued till the ship was distant from them, about four hundred yards. As they seemed to have no design to attack us, I was not willing to do them any hurt. Yet I thought their going off in a bravado might have a bad effect when it should be reported ashore. To show them, therefore, that they were still in our power, though very much beyond the reach of any missile weapon with which they were acquainted, I gave the ship a yaw and fired a four-pounder so as to pass near them. The shot happened to strike the water and rise several times at a great distance beyond the canoes. This struck them with terror, and they paddled away without once looking behind them. About two in the afternoon, we saw a pretty high island bearing west from us, and at five saw more islands and rocks to the westward of that. We hauled our wind in order to go without them, but could not weather them before it was dark. I therefore bore up and ran between them and the main. At seven I was close under the first, from which a large double canoe, or rather two canoes lashed together at the distance of about a foot, and covered with boards so as to make a deck, put off, and made sail for the ship. This was the first vessel of the kind that we had seen since we left the South Sea Islands. When she came near, the people on board entered very freely into conversation with Tupia, and we thought showed a friendly disposition. But when it was just dark, they ran their canoe close to the ship's side, and threw in a volley of stones, after which they paddled away. We learnt from Tupia that the people in the canoe call the island which we were under Motahora. It is but of a small circuit, though high, and lies six miles from the main. On the south side is anchorage in fourteen fathom water. Upon the mainland southwest by west of this island, and apparently at no great distance from the sea, is a high round mountain, which I called Mount Edgecombe. It stands in the middle of a large plain, and is, therefore, the more conspicuous. Latitude 37 degrees 59 minutes, longitude 183 degrees 7 minutes. In standing westward, we suddenly shoaled our water from 17 to 10 fathom and knowing that we were not far from the small islands and rocks which we had seen before dark, and which I intended to have passed before I brought to for the night, I thought it more prudent to tack and spend the night under Motahora, where I knew there was no danger. It was, indeed, happy for us that we did so, for in the morning, after we had made sail to the westward, we discovered ahead of us several rocks, some of which were level with the surface of the water, and some below it. They lay north-north-east from Mount Edgecombe, one league and a half distant from the island Motahora, and about nine miles from the main. We passed between these rocks and the main, having from ten to seven fathom water, this morning, many canoes and much people were seen along the shore. Several of the canoes followed us, but none of them could reach us, except one with a sail, which proved to be the same that had pelted us the night before. The people on board again entered into conversation with Tupia, but we expected another volley of their ammunition, which was not indeed dangerous to anything but the cabin windows. They continued abreast of the ship about an hour, and behaved very peaceably, but at last the salute which we expected was given, 
we returned it by firing a musket over them, and they immediately dropped astern and left us, perhaps rather satisfied with having given a test of their courage by twice insulting a vessel so much superior to their own than intimidated by the shot. At half an hour after ten, we passed between a low flat island and the main. The distance from one to the other was about four miles, and the depth of water from ten to twelve fathom. The mainland between this flat island and Motahora is of a moderate height, but level, pretty clear of wood, and full of plantations and villages. The villages, which were larger than any we had yet seen, were built upon eminences near the sea, and fortified on the land side by a bank and ditch, with a high paling within it, which was carried all round. Beside a bank, ditch, and palisados, some of them appeared to have outworks. Tupia had a notion that the small enclosure of palisados and a ditch that we had seen before were mores or places of worship, but we were of opinion that they were forts, and concluded that these people had neighbouring enemies and were always exposed to hostile attacks. At two o'clock we passed a small high island, lying four miles from a high round head upon the main. From this head the land trends northwest as far as can be seen, and has a rugged and hilly appearance. As the weather was hazy, and the wind blew fresh on the shore, we hauled off for the weathermost island in sight, which bore from us north-north-east, distant about six or seven leagues. Under this island, which I have called the Mare, we spent the night. At seven in the morning it bore south forty-seven degrees east, distant six leagues, and a cluster of small islands and rocks bore north a half east, distant one league to which I gave the name of the Court of Aldermen. They lie in the compass of about half a league every way, and five leagues from the main, between which and them lie other islands, most of them barren rocks, of which there is great variety. Some of them are as small in compass as the Monument of London, but rise to a much greater height and some of them are inhabited. They lie in latitude 36 degrees 57 minutes, and at noon bore south 60 degrees east, distant three or four leagues, and a rock like a castle, lying not far from the main, bore north 40 degrees west, at a distance of one league. The country that we passed the night before appeared to be well inhabited, Many towns were in sight, and some hundreds of large canoes lay under them upon the beach. But this day, after having sailed about fifteen leagues, it appeared to be barren and desolate. As far as we had yet coasted this country from Cape Turnagain, the people acknowledged one chief, whom they called Teratu, and to whose residence they pointed in a direction that we thought to be very far inland, but afterwards found to be otherwise. About one o'clock, three canoes came off to us from the main, with one and twenty men on board. The construction of these vessels appeared to be more simple than that of any we had seen, they being nothing more than trunks of a single tree hollowed by fire, without any convenience or ornament. The people on board were almost naked, and appeared to be of a browner complexion. Yet naked and despicable as they were, they sung their song of defiance, and seemed to denounce against us inevitable destruction. They remained, however, some time out of stone's throw, and then venturing nearer, with less appearance of hostility, one of our men went to the ship's side and was about to hand them a rope, 
This courtesy, however, they thought fit to return by throwing a lance at him, which having missed him, they immediately threw another into the ship. Upon this a musket was fired over them, which at once sent them away. About two we saw a large opening or inlet, for which we bore up. We had now forty-one fathom water, which gradually decreased to nine, at which time we were one mile and a half distant from a high-towered rock which lay near the south point of the inlet. This rock, and the northernmost of the court of aldermen, being in one, bearing south sixty-one degrees east. About seven in the evening we anchored in seven fathom, a little within the south entrance of the bay. To this place we were accompanied by several canoes and people like those we had seen last, and for some time they behaved very civilly. While they were hovering about us, a bird was shot from the ship as it was swimming upon the water. At this they showed less surprise than we expected, and taking up the bird, they tied it to a fishing line that was towing astern. As an acknowledgment for this favour, we gave them a piece of cloth. But notwithstanding this effect of our firearms, and this interchange of civilities, as soon as it grew dark, they sung their war song, and attempted to tow away the boy of the anchor. Two or three muskets were then fired over them, but this seemed rather to make them angry than afraid, and they went away, threatening that tomorrow they would return with more force, and be the death of us all, at the same time sending off a boat, which they told us was going to another part of the bay for assistance. There was some appearance of generosity as well as courage, in acquainting us with the time when they intended to make their attack, but they forfeited all credit which this procured them by coming secretly upon us in the night, when they certainly hoped to find us asleep. Upon approaching the ship, they found themselves mistaken, and therefore retired without speaking a word, supposing that they were too early. After some time, they came a second time, and being again disappointed, they retired as silently as before. In the morning at daybreak, they prepared to effect by force what they had in vain attempted by stealth and artifice. No less than twelve canoes came against us with about a hundred and fifty men, all armed with pikes, lances, and stones. As they could do nothing till they came very near the ship, Tupia was ordered to expostulate with them, and if possible divert them from their purpose. During the conversation, they appeared to be sometimes friendly and sometimes otherwise. At length, however, they began to trade, and we offered to purchase their weapons, which some of them consented to sell. They sold two very fairly but having received what had been agreed upon for the purchase of a third, they refused to send it up, but offered it for a second price. A second was sent down, but the weapon was still detained, and a demand made of a third. This being refused, with some expressions of displeasure and resentment, the offender, with many ludicrous tokens of contempt and defiance, paddled his canoe off a few yards from the ship. As I intended to continue in this place five or six days, in order to make an observation of the transit of Mercury, it was absolutely necessary, in order to prevent future mischief, to show these people that we were not to be treated ill with impunity. Some small shot were therefore fired at the thief, and a musket ball through the bottom of his boat. Upon this it was paddled to about a hundred yards distance, 
and to our great surprise the people in the other canoes took not the least notice of their wounded companion though he bled very much but returned to the ship and continued to trade with the most perfect indifference and unconcern they sold us many more of their weapons without making any other attempt to defraud us for a considerable time at last however one of them thought fit to paddle away with two different pieces of cloth which had been given for the same weapon when he had got about a hundred yards distance and thought himself secure of his prize a musket was fired after him which fortunately struck the boat just at the water's edge and made two holes in her side this only incited them to ply their paddles with greater activity and the rest of the canoes also made off with the utmost expedition as the last proof of our superiority therefore we fired a round shot over them and not a boat stopped till they got on shore about ten o'clock i went with two boats to sound the bay and look out for a more convenient anchoring place the master being in one boat and myself in the other we pulled first over to the north shore from which some canoes came out to meet us as we advanced however they retired inviting us to follow them but seeing them all armed i did not think it proper to comply but went towards the head of the bay where i observed a village upon a very high point fortified in the manner that has been already described and having fixed upon an anchoring place not far from where the ship lay i returned on board at three o'clock in the afternoon i weighed run in nearer to the shore and anchored in four fathom and a half water with a soft sandy bottom the south point of the bay bearing east distant one mile and a river which the boats can enter at low water south south east distant a mile and a half in the morning the natives came off again to the ship and we had the satisfaction to observe that their behaviour was very different from what it had been yesterday among them was an old man whom we had before remarked for his prudence and honesty his name was toyava and he seemed to be a person of a superior rank in the transactions of yesterday morning he had behaved with great propriety and good sense lying in a small canoe always near the ship and treating those on board as if he neither intended a fraud nor suspected an injury with some persuasion this man and another came on board and ventured into the cabin where i presented each of them with a piece of english cloth and some spike nails they told us that the indians were now very much afraid of us and on our part we promised friendship if they would behave peaceably desiring only to purchase what they had to sell upon their own terms after the natives had left us i went with the pinnace and longboat into the river with a design to haul the same and sent the master in the yawl to sound the bay and dredge for fish the indians who were on one side of the river expressed their friendship by all the signs they could devise beckoning us to land among them but we chose to go ashore on the other side as the situation was more convenient for hauling the seine and shooting birds of which we saw great numbers of various kinds the indians with much persuasion about noon ventured over to us with the seine we had very little success catching only a few mullets neither did we get anything by the trawl or the dredge except a few shells but we shot several birds most of them resembling sea pies except that they had black plumage and red bills and feet while we were absent with our guns the people who stayed by the boats saw two of the indians quarrel and fight 
they began the battle with their lances but some old men interposed and took them away leaving them to decide the difference like englishmen with their fists they boxed with great vigour and obstinacy for some time but by degrees all retired behind a little hill so that our people could not see the event of the combat in the morning the longboat was sent again to trawl in the bay and an officer with the marines and a party of men to cut wood and haul the seine the indians on shore appeared very peaceable and submissive and we had reason to believe that their habitations were at a considerable distance for we saw no houses and found that they slept under the bushes the bay is probably a place to which they frequently resort in parties to gather shellfish of which it affords incredible plenty for wherever we went whether upon the hills or in the valleys the woods or the plains we saw vast heaps of shells often many wagon loads together some appearing to be very old and others recent we saw no cultivation in this place which had a desolate and barren appearance the tops of the hills were green but nothing grew there except a large kind of fern the roots of which the natives had got together in large quantities in order to carry away with them in the evening mr banks walked up the river which at the mouth looked fine and broad but at the distance of about two miles was not deep enough to cover the foot and the country inland was still more barren than at the seaside the seine and dredge were not more successful today than yesterday but the indians in some measure compensated for the disappointment by bringing us several baskets of fish some dry and some fresh dressed it was not indeed of the best but i ordered it all to be bought for the encouragement of trade on the seventh the weather was so bad that none of us left the ship nor did any of the indians come on board on the eighth i sent a party of men on shore to wood and water and in the meantime many canoes came off in one of which was our friend toyava soon after he was alongside of the ship he saw two canoes coming from the opposite side of the bay upon which he hasted back again to the shore with all his canoes telling us that he was afraid of the people who were coming this was a farther proof that the people of this country were perpetually committing hostilities against each other in a short time however he returned having discovered that the people who had alarmed him were not the same that he had supposed the natives that came to the ship this morning sold us for a few pieces of cloth as much fish of the mackerel kind as served the whole ship's company and they were as good as ever were eaten at noon this day i observed the sun's meridional zenith distance by an astronomical quadrant which gave the latitude thirty six degrees forty seven minutes forty three seconds within the south entrance of the bay mr banks and dr zolander went on shore and collected a great variety of plants altogether unknown and not returning till the evening had an opportunity of observing in what manner the indians disposed themselves to pass the night they had no shelter but a few shrubs the women and the children were ranged innermost or farthest from the sea the men lay in a kind of half circle round them and their arms were set up against the trees close by them in a manner which showed that they were afraid of an attack by some enemy not far distant it was also discovered that they acknowledged neither teratu nor any other person as their king as in this particular they differed from all the people that we had seen upon other parts of the coast we thought it possible that they might be a set of outlaws in a state of rebellion against teratu 
and in that case they might have no settled habitations or cultivated land in any part of the country. End of section 28section twenty nine of the first voyage of james cook volume one by james cook this librivox recording is in the public domain book three chapter two part two the range from Tilaga to mercury bay with an account of many incidents that happened both on board and ashore a description of several views exhibited by the country, and of the hepas, or fortified villages, of the inhabitants, continued. On the ninth at daybreak, a great number of canoes came on board, loaded with mackerel of two sorts, one exactly the same with those caught in England, and the other somewhat different. We imagined the people had taken a large shoal and brought us an overplus which they could not consume, for they sold them at a very low rate. They were, however, very welcome to us. At eight o'clock, the ship had more fish on board than all her people could eat in three days, and before night, the quantity was so much increased that every man who could get salt cured as many as would last him a month after an early breakfast i went ashore with mr green and proper instruments to observe the transit of mercury mr banks and dr zolander being of the party the weather had for some time been very thick with much rain but this day was so favourable that not a cloud intervened during the whole transit the observation of the ingress was made by mr green alone while i was employed in taking the sun's altitude to ascertain the time it came on at seven hours twenty minutes fifty eight seconds apparent time according to mr green's observation the internal contact was at twelve hours eight minutes fifty eight seconds the external at 12 hours 9 minutes 55 seconds p.m. And according to mine, the internal contact was at 12 hours 8 minutes 54 seconds and the external 12 hours 9 minutes 48 seconds. The latitude of the place of observation was 30 degrees 48 minutes 5 and a half seconds. The latitude observed at noon was 36 degrees, 48 minutes, 28 seconds. The mean of this and yesterday's observation gives 36 degrees, 48 minutes, 5 and a half seconds south, the latitude of the place of observation. The variation of the compass was 11 degrees, 9 minutes east. About noon, we were alarmed by the firing of a great gun from the ship. Mr. Gore, my second lieutenant, was at this time commanding officer on board, and the account that he gave was this. While some small canoes were trading with the people, two very large ones came up full of men, one of them having on board forty-seven, all armed with pikes, darts, and stones and apparently with a hostile intention. They appeared to be strangers, and to be rather conscious of superiority over us by their numbers, than afraid of any weapons which could give us the superiority over them. No attack, however, was made, probably because they learned from the people in the other canoes, with whom they immediately entered into conference, what kind of an enemy they had to deal with after a little time they began to trade some of them offering their arms and one of them a square piece of cloth which makes a part of their dress called a ha how several of the weapons were purchased and mr gore having agreed for a ha how 
sent down the price, which was a piece of British cloth, and expected his purchase. But the Indian, as soon as he had got Mr. Gore's cloth in his possession, refused to part with his own, and put off the canoe. Upon being threatened for this fraud, he and his companions began to sing their war song in defiance, and shook their paddles. Still, however, they began no attack, only defying Mr. Gore to take any remedy in his power, which so provoked him that he levelled a musket loaded with ball at the offender, while he was holding the cloth in his hand, and shot him dead. It would have been happy if the effect of a few small shot had been tried upon this occasion, which, upon some others, had been successful. When the Indian dropped, all the canoes put off to some distance, but as they did not go away, it was thought that they might still meditate an attack. To secure, therefore, a safe passage for the boat, which it was necessary to send on shore, a round shot was fired over their heads, which effectually answered the purpose, and put them all to flight. When an account of what had happened was brought ashore, our Indians were alarmed, and drawing all together, retreated in a body. After a short time, however, they returned, having heard a more particular account of the affair, and intimated that they thought the man who had been killed deserved his fate. A little before sunset, the Indians retired to eat their supper, and we went with them to be spectators of the repast. It consisted of fish of different kinds, among which were lobsters and some birds of a species unknown to us. These were either roasted or baked. To roast them, they fastened them upon a small stick, which was stuck up in the ground, inclining towards their fire, and to bake them, they put them into a hole in the ground, with hot stones, in the same manner as the people of Otaheite. Among the natives that were assembled upon this occasion, we saw a woman who, after their manner, was mourning for the death of her relation. She sat upon the ground near the rest, who, one only excepted, seemed not at all to regard her. The tears constantly trickled down her cheeks, and she repeated in a low but very mournful voice words which even to Pier did not at all understand. At the end of every sentence she cut her arms, her face, or her breast, with a shell that she held in her hand so that she was almost covered with blood, and was indeed one of the most affecting spectacles that can be conceived. The cuts, however, did not appear to be so deep as are sometimes made upon similar occasions, if we may judge by the scars which we saw upon the arms, thighs, breasts, and cheeks of many of them which we were told were the remains of wounds which they had inflicted upon themselves as testimonies of their affection and sorrow. The next day I went with two boats, accompanied by Mr. Banks and the other gentlemen, to examine a large river that empties itself into the head of the bay. We rowed about four or five miles up, and could have gone much farther if the weather had been favourable. It was here wider than at the mouth, and divided into many streams by small flat islands, which are covered with mangroves and overflowed at high water. From these trees exudes a viscous substance which very much resembles resin. We found it first in small lumps upon the sea beach, and now saw it sticking to the trees, by which we knew whence it came. We landed on the east side of the river, where we saw a tree upon which several shags had built their nests, and here therefore we determined to dine. Twenty of the shags were soon killed, and being broiled upon the spot, afforded us an excellent meal. We then went upon the hills from whence I thought I saw the head of the river. 
the shore on each side, as well as the islands in the middle, were covered with mangroves, and the sandbanks abounded in cockles and clams. In many places there were rock oysters, and everywhere plenty of wild fowl, principally shags, ducks, curlews, and the sea pie that has been described before. We also saw fish in the river, but of what kind we could not discover. The country on the east side of this river is for the most part barren and destitute of wood, but on the west it has a better aspect, and in some places is adorned with trees, but has in no part the appearance of cultivation. In the entrance of the river, and for two or three miles up, there is good anchoring in four and five fathom water, and places very convenient for laying a vessel on shore, where the tide rises and falls seven feet at the full and change of the moon. We could not determine whether any considerable stream of fresh water came into this river out of the country, but we saw a number of small rivulets issue from the adjacent hills. Near the mouth of this river on the east side, we found a little Indian village, consisting of small temporary sheds, where we landed, and were received by the people with the utmost kindness and hospitality. They treated us with a flat shellfish of a most delicious taste, somewhat like a cockle, which we eat hot from the coals. Near this place is a high point or peninsula, projecting into the river, and upon it are the remains of a fort, which they call Epar or Hepa. The best engineer in Europe could not have chosen a situation better adapted to enable a small number to defend themselves against a greater. The steepness of the cliffs renders it wholly inaccessible from the water, which encloses it on three sides, and to the land, it is fortified by a ditch and a bank raised on the inside. From the top of the bank to the bottom of the ditch is two and twenty feet. The ditch on the outside is fourteen feet deep, and its breadth is in proportion. The whole seemed to have been executed with great judgment, and there had been a row of pickets or palisados both on the top of the bank and along the brink of the ditch on the outside. Those on the outside had been driven very deep into the ground and were inclined towards the ditch so as to project over it. But of these the thickest posts only were left, and upon them there were evident marks of fire, so that the place had probably been taken and destroyed by an enemy. If any occasion should make it necessary for a ship to winter here, or stay any time, tents might be built in this place, which is sufficiently spacious, with great convenience, and might easily be made impregnable to the whole country. On the 11th there was so much wind and rain that no canoe came off but the longboat was sent to fetch oysters from one of the beds which had been discovered the day before. The boat soon returned, deeply laden, and the oysters, which were as good as ever came from Colchester, and about the same size, were laid down under the booms, and the ship's company did nothing but eat them from the time they came on board till night, when, as may reasonably be supposed, great part of them were expended. This, however, gave us no concern, as we knew that not the boat only, but the ship might have been loaded almost in one tide, as the beds are dry at half ebb. In the morning of Sunday the 12th, two canoes came off full of people whom we had never seen before, but who appeared to have heard of us by the caution which they used in approaching us. As we invited them to come alongside with all the tokens of friendship that we could show, they ventured up, and two of them came on board. The rest traded very fairly for what they had. 
A small canoe also came from the other side of the bay and sold us some very large fish which they gave us to understand they would have brought yesterday having caught them the day before but that the wind was so high they could not venture to see after breakfast i went with the pinnace and yawl accompanied by mr banks and dr zollander over to the north side of the bay to take a view of the country and two fortified villages which we had discovered at a distance we landed near the smallest of them the situation of which was the most beautifully romantic that can be imagined it was built upon a small rock detached from the main and surrounded at high water the whole body of this rock was perforated by an hollow or arch which possessed much the largest part of it the top of the arch was above sixty feet perpendicular above the sea which at high water flowed through the bottom of it the whole summit of the rock above the arch was fenced round after their manner but the area was not large enough to contain more than five or six houses it was accessible only by one very narrow and steep path by which the inhabitants at our approach came down and invited us into the place but we refused intending to visit a much more considerable fort of the same kind at about a mile's distance we made some presents however to the women and in the meantime we saw the inhabitants of the town which we were going to coming towards us in a body men women and children to the number of about one hundred when they came near enough to be heard they waved their hands and called out horamai after which they sat down among the bushes near the beach these ceremonies we were told were certain signs of their friendly disposition we advanced to the place where they were sitting and when we came up made them a few presents and asked leave to visit their hepa they consented with joy in their countenances and immediately led the way it is called waratua and is situated upon a high promontory or point which projects into the sea on the north side and near the head of the bay two sides of it are washed by the sea and these are altogether inaccessible two other sides are to the land up one of them which is very steep lies the avenue from the beach the other is flat and open to the country upon the hill which is a narrow ridge the whole is enclosed by a palisade about ten feet high consisting of strong pales bound together with withers the weak side next the land is also defended by a double ditch the innermost of which has a bank and an additional palisade the inner palisades are upon the bank next the town but at such a distance from the top of the bank as to leave room for men to walk and use their arms between them and the inner ditch the outermost palisades are between the two ditches and driven obliquely into the ground so that their upper ends incline over the inner ditch the depth of this ditch from the bottom to the top or crown of the bank is four and twenty feet close within the innermost palisade is a stage twenty feet high forty feet long and six broad it is supported by strong posts and is intended as a station for those who defend the place from which they may annoy the assailants by darts and stones heaps of which lay ready for use another stage of the same kind commands the steep avenue from the beach and stands also within the palisade on this side of the hill there are some little outworks and huts not intended as advanced posts but as the habitations of people who for want of room could not be accommodated within the works but who were notwithstanding desirous of placing themselves under their protection the palisades as has been observed already run round the whole brow of the hill as well towards the sea as towards the land 
but the ground within having originally been a mount, they have reduced it not to one level, but to several, rising in stages one above the other, like an amphitheatre, each of which is enclosed within its separate palisade. They communicate with each other by narrow lanes, which might easily be stopped up, so that if an enemy should force the outward palisade, he would have others to carry before the place could be wholly reduced, supposing these places to be obstinately defended one after the other. The only entrance is by a narrow passage, about twelve feet long, communicating with the steep ascent from the beach. It passes under one of the fighting stages, and though we saw nothing like a door or gateway, it may be easily barricaded in a manner that will make the forcing it a very dangerous and difficult undertaking. Upon the whole, this must be considered as a place of great strength, in which a small number of resolute men may defend themselves against all the force which a people with no other arms than those that are in use here could bring against it. It seemed to be well furnished for a siege with everything but water. We saw great quantities of fern root, which they eat as bread, and dried fish piled up in heaps, but we could not perceive that they had any fresh water nearer than a brook, which runs close under the foot of the hill. Whether they have any means of getting it from this place during a siege, or whether they have any method of storing it within the works in goods or other vessels, we could not learn. Some resource they certainly have with respect to this article, an indispensable necessary of life, for otherwise the laying up dry provisions could answer no purpose. Upon our expressing a desire to see their method of attack and defence, one of the young men mounted a fighting stage, which they call Parava, and another went into the ditch. Both he that was to defend the place, and he that was to assault it, sung the war song, and danced with the same frightful gesticulations that we had seen used in more serious circumstances, to work themselves up into a degree of that mechanical fury which, among all uncivilized nations, is the necessary prelude to a battle. For dispassionate courage, a strength of mind that can surmount the sense of danger, without a flow of animal spirits by which it is extinguished, seems to be the prerogative of those who have projects of more lasting importance and a keener sense of honour and disgrace than can be formed or felt by men who have few pains or pleasures besides those of mere animal life and scarcely any purpose but to provide for the day that is passing over them to obtain plunder or revenge an insult they will march against each other indeed in cool blood, though they find it necessary to work themselves into passion before they engage. As among us there have been many instances of people who have deliberately made themselves drunk, that they might execute a project which they formed when they were sober, but which, while they continued so, they did not dare to undertake. On the side of the hill, near this enclosure, we saw about half an acre planted with gourds and sweet potatoes, which was the only cultivation in the bay. Under the foot of the point upon which this fortification stands are two rocks, one just broken off from the main, and the other not perfectly detached from it. They are both small and seem more proper for the habitations of birds than men. Yet there are houses and places of defence upon each of them. And we saw many other works of the same kind upon small islands, rocks and ridges of hills on different parts of the coast, besides many fortified towns which appeared to be much superior to this. The perpetual hostility in which these poor savages, who have made every village a fort, must necessarily live, 
will account for there being so little of their land in a state of cultivation and as mischiefs very often reciprocally produce each other it may perhaps appear that there being so little land in a state of cultivation will account for their living in perpetual hostility but it is very strange that the same invention and diligence which have been used in the construction of places so admirably adapted to defence almost without tools should not when urged by the same necessity have furnished them with a single missile weapon except the lance which is thrown by hand they have no contrivance like a bow to discharge a dart nor anything like a sling to assist them in throwing a stone which is the more surprising as the invention of slings and bows and arrows is much more obvious than of the works which these people construct and both these weapons are found among much ruder nations and in almost every other part of the world besides the long lance and patu patu which have been mentioned already they have a staff about five feet long sometimes pointed like a sergeant's halberd sometimes only tapering to a point at one end and having the other end broad and shaped somewhat like the blade of an oar they have also another weapon about a foot shorter than these pointed at one end and at the other shaped like an axe the points of their long lances are barbed and they handle them with such strength and agility that we can match them with no weapon but a loaded musket after taking a slight view of the country and loading both the boats with celery which we found in great plenty near the beach we returned from our excursion and about five o'clock in the evening got on board the ship on the fifteenth i sailed out of the bay and at the same time had several canoes on board in one of which was our friend toyava who said that as soon as we were gone he must repair to his hepa or fort because the friends of the man who had been shot by mr gore on the ninth had threatened to revenge his death upon him whom they had reproached as being our friend off the north point of the bay i saw a great number of islands of various extent which lay scattered to the northwest in a direction parallel with the main as far as i could see i steered northeast for the northeasternmost of these islands but the wind coming to the northwest i was obliged to stand out to sea to the bay which we had now left i gave the name of mercury bay on account of the observation which we had made there of the transit of that planet over the sun it lies in latitude thirty six degrees forty seven minutes south and in the longitude of one eighty four degrees four minutes west there are several islands lying both to the southward and northward of it and a small island or rock in the middle of the entrance within this island the depth of water nowhere exceeds nine fathom the best anchoring is in a sandy bay which lies just within the south head in five and four fathom bringing a high tower or rock which lies without the head in one with the head or just shut in behind it this place is very convenient both for wooding and watering and in the river there is an immense quantity of oysters and other shellfish i have for this reason given it the name of oyster river but for a ship that wants to stay here any time the best and safest place is in the river at the head of the bay which from the number of mangrove trees about it i have called mangrove river to sail into this river the south shore must be kept all the way on board the country on the east side of the river and bay is very barren its only produce being fern and a few other plants that will grow in a poor soil the land on the northwest side is covered with wood 
and the soil being much more fertile would doubtless produce all the necessaries of life with proper cultivation it is not however so fertile as the lands that we have seen to the southward nor do the inhabitants though numerous make so good an appearance they have no plantations their canoes are mean and without ornament they sleep in the open air and say that teratu whose sovereignty they do not acknowledge if he was to come among them would kill them this favoured our opinion of their being outlaws yet they told us that they had heppers or strongholds to which they retired in time of imminent danger we found thrown upon the shore in several parts of this bay great quantities of iron sand which is brought down by every little rivulet of fresh water that finds its way from the country which is a demonstration that there is ore of that metal not far inland yet neither the inhabitants of this place or any other part of the coast that we have seen know the use of iron or set the least value upon it all of them preferring the most worthless and useless trifle not only to a nail but to any tool of that metal before we left the bay we cut up on one of the trees near the watering place the ship's name and that of the commander with the date of the year and month when we were there and after displaying the english colours i took a formal possession of it in the name of his britannic majesty king george the third end of section twenty nine Section 30 of The First Voyage of James Cook, Volume 1 by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 2, Chapter 4, Part 1. The range from Mercury Bay to the Bay of Islands, an expedition up the River Thames, some account of the indians who inhabit its banks and the fine timber that grows there several interviews with the natives on different parts of the coast and a skirmish with them upon an island i continued plying to windward two days to get under the land and on the eighteenth about seven in the morning we were abreast of a very conspicuous promontory being then in latitude thirty six degrees twenty six minutes and in the direction of north forty eight degrees west from the north head of mercury bay or point mercury which was distant nine leagues upon this point stood many people who seemed to take little notice of us but talked together with great earnestness in about half an hour several canoes put off from different places and came towards the ship upon which the people on the point also launched a canoe and about twenty of them came in her up with the others when two of these canoes in which there might be about sixty men came near enough to make themselves heard they sung their war song but seeing that we took little notice of it they threw a few stones at us and then rowed off towards the shore we hoped that we had now done with them but in a short time they returned as if with a fixed resolution to provoke us into a battle animating themselves by their song as they had done before tupia without any directions from us went to the poop and began to expostulate he told them that we had weapons which would destroy them in a moment and that if they ventured to attack us we should be obliged to use them upon this they flourished their weapons and cried out in their language come on shore and we will kill you all well said to Pierre, but why should you molest us while we are at sea as we do not wish to fight we shall not accept your challenge to come on shore and here there is no pretence for quarrel 
the sea being no more your property than the ship. This eloquence of Tupia, though it greatly surprised us, having given him no hints for the arguments he used, had no effect upon our enemies, who very soon renewed their battery. A musket was then fired through one of their boats, and this was an argument of sufficient weight, for they immediately fell astern and left us. From the point of which we were now abreast, the land trends west a half south near a league, and then south south east as far as we could see, and besides the islands that lay without us, we could see land round by the southwest as far as northwest, but whether this was the main or islands we could not then determine. The fear of losing the main, however, made me resolve to follow its direction. With this view, I hauled round the point and steered to the southward, but there being light airs all round the compass, we made but little progress. About one o'clock a breeze sprung up at the east, which afterwards came to northeast, and we steered along the shore south by east and south southeast, having from twenty five to eighteen fathom. At about half an hour after seven in the evening, having run seven or eight leagues since noon, I anchored in twenty-three fathom, not choosing to run any farther in the dark, as I had now land on both sides, forming the entrance of a strait, bay or river, lying south by east, for on that point we could see no land. At daybreak on the 19th, the wind being still favourable, we weighed and stood with an easy sail up the inlet, keeping nearest to the east side. In a short time, two large canoes came off to us from the shore. The people on board said that they knew Toyava very well, and called to Pierre by his name. I invited some of them on board, and as they knew they had nothing to fear from us, while they behaved honestly and peaceably, they immediately complied. I made each of them some presents, and dismissed them much gratified. Other canoes afterwards came up to us from a different side of the bay, and the people on board of these also mentioned the name of Toyava, and sent a young man into the ship, who told us he was his grandson, and he also was dismissed with a present. After having run about five leagues from the place where we had anchored the night before, our depth of water gradually decreased to six fathom, and not choosing to go into less, as it was tide of flood, and the wind blew right up the inlet, I came to an anchor about the middle of the channel, which is near eleven miles over, after which I sent two boats out to sound, one on one side and the other on the other. The boats not having found above three feet more water than we were now in, I determined to go no farther with the ship, but to examine the head of the bay in the boats, for, as it appeared to run a good way inland, I thought this a favourable opportunity to examine the interior part of the country and its produce. At daybreak, therefore, I set out in the pinnace and longboat, accompanied by Mr. Banks, Dr. Zollander and Tupia, and we found the inlet end in a river, about nine miles above the ship. Into this river we entered with the first of the flood, and within three miles found the water perfectly fresh. Before we had proceeded more than one-third of that distance, we found an Indian town, which was built upon a small bank of dry sand, but entirely surrounded by a deep mud, which possibly the inhabitants might consider as a defence. These people, as soon as they saw us, thronged to the banks and invited us on shore. We accepted the invitation and made them a visit, notwithstanding the mud. They received us with open arms, having heard of us from our good old friend Toyava. 
but our stay could not be long, as we had other objects of curiosity in view. We proceeded up the river till near noon, when we were fourteen miles within its entrance, and then, finding the face of the country to continue nearly the same, without any alteration in the course of the stream, which we had no hope of tracing to its source, we landed on the west side to take a view of the lofty trees which everywhere adorned its banks. They were of a kind that we had seen before, though only at a distance, both in Poverty Bay and Hawke's Bay. Before we had walked an hundred yards into the wood, we met with one of them, which was nineteen feet eight inches in the girth, at the height of six feet above the ground. Having a quadrant with me, I measured its height from the root to the first branch, and found it to be eighty-nine feet. It was as straight as an arrow, and tapered but very little in proportion to its height, so that I judged there were three hundred and fifty-six feet of solid timber in it, exclusive of the branches. As we advanced, we saw many others that were still larger. We cut down a young one, and the wood proved heavy and solid, not fit for masts, but such as would make the finest plank in the world. Our carpenter, who was with us, said that the timber resembled that of the pitch pine, which is lightened by tapping, and possibly some such method might be found to lighten these, and they would then be such masts as no country in Europe can produce. As the wood was swampy, we could not range far, but we found many stout trees of other kinds, all of them utterly unknown to us, specimens of which we brought away. The river at this height is as broad as the Thames at Greenwich, and the tide of flood as strong. It is not indeed quite so deep, but has water enough for vessels of more than a middle size, and a bottom of mud so soft that nothing could take damage by running ashore. About three o'clock we re-embarked, in order to return with the first of the ebb, and named the river the Thames, it having some resemblance to our own river of that name. In our return, the inhabitants of the village where we had been at shore, seeing us take another channel, came off to us in their canoes, and trafficked with us in the most friendly manner, till they had disposed of the few trifles they had. The tide of ebb just carried us out of the narrow part of the river, into the channel that ran up from the sea before it was dark, and we pulled hard to reach the ship, but meeting the flood, and a strong breeze at north-northwest with showers of rain, we were obliged to desist, and about midnight we run under the land, and came to a grappling, where we took such rest as our situation would admit. At break of day we set forward again, and it was past seven o'clock before we reached the ship. We were all extremely tired, but thought ourselves happy to be on board, for before nine it blew so hard that the boat could not have rowed ahead, and must therefore either have gone ashore or taken shelter under it. About three o'clock, having the tide of ebb, we took up our anchor, made sail, and plied down the river till eight in the evening, when we came to an anchor again. Early in the morning we made sail with the first ebb, and kept plying till the flood obliged us once more to come to an anchor. As we had now only a light breeze, I went in the pinnace, accompanied by Dr. Zollander, to the western shore, but I saw nothing worthy of notice. When I left the ship, many canoes were about it. Mr. Banks therefore chose to stay on board and traffic with the natives. They bartered their clothes and arms, chiefly for paper, and behaved with great friendship and honesty. 
but while some of them were below with Mr. Banks, a young man who was upon the deck stole a half-minute glass which was in the binnacle, and was detected just as he was carrying it off. Mr. Hicks, who was commanding officer on board, took it into his head to punish him by giving him twelve lashes with a cat o' nine tails, and accordingly ordered him to be taken to the gangway and tied up to the shrouds. When the other Indians who were on board saw him seized, they attempted to rescue him, and being resisted called for their arms, which were handed up from the canoes, and the people of one of them attempted to come up the ship's side. The tumult was heard by Mr. Banks, who, with Tupia, came hastily upon the deck to see what had happened. The Indians immediately ran to Tupia, who, finding Mr. Hicks inexorable, could only assure them that nothing was intended against the life of their companion, but that it was necessary he should suffer some punishment for his offence, which being explained to them, they seemed to be satisfied. The punishment was then inflicted, and as soon as the criminal was unbound, an old man among the spectators, who was supposed to be his father, gave him a hearty beating and sent him down into his canoe. All the canoes then dropped astern, and the people said that they were afraid to come any more near the ship. After much persuasion, however, they ventured back again, but their cheerful confidence was at an end, and their stay was short. They promised indeed at their departure to return with some fish, but we saw no more of them. On the 23rd, the wind being contrary, we kept plying down the river, and at seven in the evening got without the northwest point of the islands lying on the west side of it. The weather being bad, night coming on, and having land on every side of us, I thought it most advisable to tack and stretch in under the point where we anchored in nineteen fathom. At five in the morning of the twenty-fourth, we weighed and made sail to the northwest under our courses and double reefed topsails. The wind being at southwest by west and west southwest, a strong gale and squally. As the gale would not permit us to come near the land, we had but a slight and distant view of it from the time when we got under sail till noon, during a run of twelve leagues, but we never once lost sight of it. At this time our latitude by observation was thirty-six degrees fifteen minutes twenty seconds. We were not above two miles from a point of land on the main, and three leagues and a half from a very high island, which bore north-east by east. In this situation we had twenty-six fathom water. The farthest point on the main that we could see bore north-west, but we could perceive several small islands lying to the north of that direction. The point of land of which we were now abreast, and which I called Point Rodney, is the northwest extremity of the river Thames, for under that name I comprehend the deep bay which terminates in the freshwater stream, and the northeast extremity is the promontory which we passed when we entered it, and which I called Cape Colville in honour of the right honourable Lord Colville. Cape Colville lies in latitude 36 degrees 26 minutes, longitude 184 degrees 27 minutes. It rises directly from the sea to a considerable height and is remarkable for a lofty rock which stands to the pitch of the point and may be distinguished at a very great distance. From the south point of this cape, the river runs in a direct line south by east, and is nowhere less than three leagues broad for the distance of fourteen leagues above the cape, and there it is contracted to a narrow stream, 
but continues the same course through a low flat country or broad valley which lies parallel with the sea coast and at the end of which we could not see on the east side of the broad part of this river the land is tolerably high and hilly on the west side it is rather low but the whole is covered with verdure and wood and has the appearance of great fertility though there were but a few small spots which had been cultivated at the entrance of the narrow part of the river the land is covered with mangroves and other shrubs but farther there are immense woods of perhaps the finest timber in the world of which some account has already been given in several places the wood extends to the very edge of the water and where it is at a little distance the intermediate space is marshy like some parts of the banks of the thames in england it is probable that the river contains plenty of fish for we saw poles stuck up in many places to set nets for catching them but of what kinds i do not know the greatest depth of water that we found in this river was six and twenty fathom which gradually decreased to one fathom and a half in the mouth of the freshwater stream it is from four to three fathom but there are large flats and sandbanks lying before it a ship of moderate draught may notwithstanding go a long way up this river with a flowing tide for it rises perpendicularly near ten feet and at the full and change of the moon it is high water about nine o'clock six leagues within cape colville under the eastern shore are several small islands which together with the main seem to form good harbours and opposite to these islands under the western shore lie other islands by which it is also probable that good harbours may be formed but if there are no harbours about this river there is good anchoring in every part of it where the depth of water is sufficient for it is defended from the sea by a chain of islands of different extent which lie across the mouth of it and which i have for that reason called barrier islands they stretch northwest and southeast ten leagues the south end of the chain lies northeast between two and three leagues from cape colville and the north end lies northeast four leagues and a half from point rodney point rodney lies west northwest nine leagues from cape colville in latitude thirty six degrees fifteen minutes south longitude one eighty four degrees fifty three minutes west the natives residing about this river do not appear to be numerous considering the great extent of the country but they are strong well-made and active people and all of them paint their bodies with red ochre and oil from head to foot which we had not seen before their canoes were large and well built and adorned with carving in as good a taste as any that we had seen upon the coast we continued to stand along the shore till night with the mainland on one side and islands on the other and then anchored in a bay with fourteen fathom and a sandy bottom we had no sooner come to an anchor than we tried our lines and in a short time caught near one hundred fish which the people called sea bream they weighed from six to eight pounds apiece and consequently would supply the whole ship's company with food for two days from the success of our lines here we called the place bream bay the two points that form it lie north and south five leagues from each other it is everywhere of a good breadth and between three and four leagues deep at the bottom of it there appears to be a river of fresh water the north head of the bay called bream head is highland and remarkable for several pointed rocks which stand in a range upon the top of it 
it may also be known by some small islands which lie before it called the hen and chickens one of which is high and terminates in two peaks it lies in latitude thirty five degrees forty six minutes south and at the distance of seventeen leagues and a half from cape colville in the direction of north forty one degrees west the land between point rodney and bream head an extent of ten leagues is low and wooded in tufts with white sand banks between the sea and the firm lands we saw no inhabitants but many fires in the night and where there are fires there are always people at daybreak on the twenty fifth we left the bay and steered along shore to the northward we found the variation of the compass to be twelve degrees forty two minutes east at noon our latitude was thirty five degrees thirty six minutes south bream head bore south distant ten miles and we saw some small islands to which i gave the name of the poor knights at northeast by north distant three leagues the northernmost land in sight bore north northwest we were in this place at the distance of two miles from the shore and had twenty six fathom water the country appeared low but well covered with wood we saw some straggling houses three or four fortified towns and near them a large quantity of cultivated land in the evening seven large canoes came off to us with about two hundred men some of them came on board and said that they had heard of us to two of them who appeared to be chiefs i gave presents but when these were gone out of the ship the others became exceedingly troublesome some of those in the canoes began to trade and according to their custom to cheat by refusing to deliver what had been bought after they had received the price among these was one who had received an old pair of black breeches which upon a few small shot being fired at him he threw into the sea all the boats soon after paddled off to some distance and when they thought they were out of reach they began to defy us by singing their song and brandishing their weapons we thought it advisable to intimidate them as well for their sakes as our own and therefore fired first some small arms and then round shot over their heads the last put them in a terrible fright though they received no damage except by overheating themselves in paddling away which they did with astonishing expedition in the night we had variable light airs but towards the morning a breeze sprung up at south and afterwards at south-east with which we proceeded slowly to the northward along the shore between six and seven o'clock two canoes came off and told us that they had heard of yesterday's adventure notwithstanding which the people came on board and traded very quietly and honestly for whatever they had soon after two canoes came off from a more distant part of the shore these were of a much larger size and full of people when they came near they called off the other canoes which were alongside of the ship and after a short conference they all came up together the strangers appeared to be persons of a superior rank their canoes were well carved with many ornaments and they had with them a great variety of weapons they had patu patus both of stone and whalebone upon which they appeared to set a great value they also had ribs of whale of which we had before seen imitations in wood carved and adorned with tufts of dog's hair their complexions were browner than those of the people we had seen to the southward and their bodies and faces were more marked with the black stains which they call amoco they had a broad spiral on each buttock and the thighs of many of them 
were almost entirely black, some narrow lines only being left untouched, so that at first sight they appeared to wear striped breeches. With respect to the Amaco, every different tribe seemed to have a different custom, for all the men in some canoes seemed to be almost covered with it, and those in others had scarcely a stain except on the lips, which were black in all of them, without a single exception. These gentlemen for a long time refused to part with any of their weapons, whatever was offered for them. At last, however, one of them produced a piece of talc, wrought into the shape of an axe, and agreed to sell it for a piece of cloth. The cloth was handed over the ship's side, but his honour immediately put off his canoe with the axe. We had recourse to our usual expedient, and fired a musket ball over the canoe, upon which it put back to the ship, and the piece of cloth was returned. All the boats then went ashore, without offering any further intercourse. End of section 30